Hello, Internet, and welcome to day four of Sal Sincata's Wedding Photography Boot Camp. We are so excited about today. We are in a very special location, a place called Soto Park here in Seattle. And gosh, wait till you guys see the full extent of this beautiful, beautiful space. My name is Kenan Klosterman, and my co-host is Susan Roderick. How are you doing this morning, Susan? I'm doing excellent. Thank excellent. you for asking. How's everybody out there doing? Hope you guys are well. So good morning, you twos. Morning. Sal and Taylor Sincata, how are you two today? I'm doing well. Uh, we, I, I crashed like a uh, baby last night. I'm 9 exhausted. p.m. Yeah, 9 oh. p.m. <laughs> out. Um, good, you needed yeah, it. I've got about 1,500 plus emails sitting in my inbox. So, uh, wow. If I owe you a response, it's going to be a couple of days. <laughs> yeah, give the, give the man some time. Yes, yes. Exactly. He's got some things he's got to do for the next couple of days. Yeah. Right. Knock busy. it out of the park. That's what you have to do, right, mm -hmm. Sal? Today, today's going to be killer, man. I'm, uh, I'm super stoked about today. Good. So we're going to do the uh, ceremony right now and uh, not just shoot it, but really understand all the various lighting conditions, uh, posing family portraits, dealing with maybe divorced parents. Uh, we want to we really talk about all the worst case scenarios because I think if we can prepare people for worst case scenarios, I think then you can handle the, uh, the easy stuff. Good. I, I couldn't agree more. But why don't we introduce our in-studio audience. We have five lovely ladies. I'm not sure if we decided on a name, if we're going with uh, Sal's wedding bells. Did we decide we're confirmed? Sal's gals. Sal's yes. gals. Okay, we have a confirmation. <laughs> Sal's gals, everyone. Why don't Go, we introduce you guys? You guys, you, you got to set up the Facebook page for that. <laughs> we are. Yes. Private group, Sal's gals. Yes. No, do, no dudes allowed. No dudes allowed. <laughs> Except for Sal. Except for Sal. Yes. Uh, he's got to be there. It's heaven for you. It's heaven for you. <laughs> I like well, how well let's works. introduce Sal's gals. <laughs> and we'll start with you ladies. Why don't you just uh, introduce yourselves? Just say your name and your website or your Twitter handle, and then maybe something that you're excited about for the next couple days to, to learn. Okay, uh, my name is Brandy Morris with Brandy Image Photography. On Twitter, I am at Brandy Image. I'm sorry, at Brandy Image with two eyes. Uh, BrandyImageStudio.com is the website. I am excited for today to see how you run through a ceremony in this place. It is amazing. I know it's going to be completely different than what I've seen before, because in Florida we do this totally vintage, and I know that's probably not the direction you're going to go today. So I'm really excited to see it. I'm Lisa of Lisa Pellucci Photography. You can see me uh, on my website, lisapellucci.com, Twitter, at Lisa Pellucci, or Instagram, Lisa underscore Pellucci. Um, I'm an Atlanta-based wedding photographer, and so excited to be here with these gals <laughs> and Sal, and uh, learn what we're going to do today and tomorrow, and I can't believe we're already on day four. Uh, it's almost it's almost over, man. It's been a crazy oh, ride. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to have like a reunion maybe once a year. <laughs> yeah. We still have fun. two days. Come on. Two days, man. <laughs> two days. I'm Darlene Hall. I am from Ohio. My website is harvestofmemories.com. H R V S T of memories on Twitter. Um, I'm excited today. We've had. We're just so in shock that this is day four, and I said something last night to somebody. I said, I promise I'm not, I told myself I'm not going to cry by tomorrow, because I feel like this is such a family, and I'm like, I'm not going to cry. So I am excited just to see everything today, and I can't wait for my airplane ride home to condense all of my notes down. I have something to do, so it's just been great. Awesome. awesome. I'm Sarah Peterson uh, with Dutch Girl Photography uh, in, from Morris, Illinois, um, just outside of Chicago. Uh, website is DutchGirlPhoto.com and Twitter handle is DutchGirlPhoto3. Um, I'm excited to learn about the um, lighting with flash and the video lights. Uh, video lights is, is something I haven't dabbled in yet, so I'm excited to learn about that. So. Cool. My name is Rochelle Erickson and I'm here from Kirkland. My website is PhotosByRochelle.com. And Twitter handle is at Rochelle Erickson. I'm super pumped for today. How can we not? We get day four of Sal and Taylor, <laughs> and just super, super. Rochelle, super that's like excited. your signature look right now. You got your hat going. You're like, you're like the hat girl. I am a hat girl. That is your signature look. You need a different hat, and that needs to be like part of your logo or something. She's the Pacific hat. Northwest. It's the Northwest, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Susan's a hat girl too. <laughs> she's, she's rocking it for sure. <laughs> All right, great. Well, uh, we are going to get started, everyone. Thank you again, and. Welcome everyone to Wedding Photography Boot Camp with Sal and Taylor Sincata. I'm just going to take you through a quick intro on how to watch today's class, how to ask questions in chat, and how to purchase the course videos. There's one place to watch Creative Live, and that is creativelive.com live. You can take us on the go on your iPhone, iPad, or Android-friendly device. So wherever you are mobile today, 
take us with you. Let's take a look at the live page. If you are in an area of the country or the world that has a slower internet speed, you can manually control the resolution of your video quality. So you're going to go down to the bottom right hand corner where it says Ustream. You're going to click on that and then you can self select the speed that's best for you and then you will see the resolution change. We ask you and invite you to join the conversation here at Creative Live today. This is the best way to get to know your fellow Creative Livers all over the world, but also to ask your questions of Sal and Taylor. So the first tab across the top of the chat room is the Creative Live tab. And this is where we invite you to have your on-topic conversations, share ideas with each other, share resources when we're talking about on-topic things that we're talking about. <laughs> on-topic things. Yeah. <laughs> Secondly is the Creative Cues tab, and that is for your questions for Sal and Taylor. So drop them in there and let us know where you're joining us from. No need to answer anyone's questions in there. Please keep that just for questions only. That helps us pick them out and be able to pass them along quickly. And thirdly is the Creative Lounge. And this is the chat room for you all to just have fun, get to know each other, and have your off-topic conversations. And I want to give a shout out and thank you to all of our chat moderators and hosts who are back at the ranch, back at our, our studio, manning these chat rooms. Let's try to forward. In addition to the chat rooms, we're also taking your questions on Facebook and Twitter. So facebook.com slash creative live. Give us a like if you haven't already and ask your questions there. In addition to Twitter, use the hashtag ask Sal, one word. What we do here at Creative Live is we try to reach as many people as possible all over the world, so many countries, um, for free during our live events. And there's a lot that goes on here to put these, these workshops on. It's really an incredible, incredible thing. Five days with Sal and Taylor Sincata. And you can own these videos. If you know that you need to watch this again, you can own these videos. There's also an additional, um, additional bonus items, and I'll show you those in a minute. The workshop videos are $249. However, you can buy them for $149 today and tomorrow. So the deal ends tomorrow. Save yourself $100. Go and purchase it right now and get that over with because um, this is just an incredible workshop. Okay, let's take a look at the course page and where you're going to purchase the videos. First is the enroll button. You can do that if you haven't already to get reminder emails, better rewatches and such. We rewatch our events overnight after they end uh, during the live day for those of you who are in other parts of the world. Again, $149 you buy directly here from the course page or actually there's a buy now button that's right beneath the live page as well and it's quick and easy. Scroll down the course page and you'll see a couple of different items for you to download. The first one is the contest entry blueprint. We'll talk about the amazing contest that Sal is running uh, as kind of a separate contest from the normal ones that we do here. And if you're going to enter that, this is where you're going to download the workshop, the worksheet, sh the blueprint that you need. And all of the information about all of these contests is on the Creative Live blog, which is creativelive.com slash blog. Right beneath that are all of the documents that are included with the purchase. You can see them listed out there. It's an incredible amount of information that truly is the pieces that Sal and Taylor use to run their business and they're handing them to you when you purchase. Here are all the videos. We break them down into segments so that you can go back and find what you're looking for and we put those up as quickly as possible. So we're giving away more fabulous prizes today and tomorrow and the way that you enter our contest, our quote contest, the first place is on Facebook. You're going to click on that quote contest icon on our Facebook page and then you can enter once per hour. You're going to pick out your favorite quote or tip from Sal or Taylor anything that's fun and quirky or just a very good uh, tip for your photography, you're going to put that in there and enter. Secondly, we have the Twitter giveaway, same giveaways, but you can enter via Twitter and you can do that as many times as you want. All you need to do is include the website for this class and here's a short URL. Include that in your tweet and you that's how we search to find your tweets. And trying to forward this. Okay, there we go. Finally, a, a little note. Uh, we are, Creative Live has grown tremendously this year and we are asking just for a small favor for your help. 
There is something called TechCrunch, and if you haven't heard of TechCrunch, it is a blog. It's one of the leading technology and entrepreneurial blogs out there. And we would love your help. If there's anything that you can do for, for Creative Live this year, which a lot of people ask, what can we do to support you? This is it. We would love to have your help being nominated as the best education startup in 2012. There is a short URL there on the screen. Jot that down, if you will. You can enter once, or you can nominate Creative Live once every day through December 6. So we appreciate your support. It's really easy. You just go and click once per day, and you don't even need to enter any information. So thank you for your help on that. And uh, it's you who power Creative Live, and it's you who can help us win this award, which would just mean a ton to us and to you. All right. Taylor and Sal, over to you. All right. Well, welcome to uh, day four. And we've got another action-packed day. I think today we're going to cover, uh, you know, the ceremony, the reception, some of the creatives, and then even building a, a slideshow. So we're, we're looking at that out there. We've been going back every night and, and fine-tuning this uh, educational plan, if you will, uh, to meet your needs. And what we're hearing from you loud and clear is that you don't really need to see us shooting per se, right? You're looking for to be in our head why we're doing what we're doing, where we're putting people, why we're putting them there. Uh, and I think that's the educational value. So in the spirit of that, that's what we're going to continue to do. So today, uh, the first thing I want to cover, we're going to talk about the ceremony. We're in this uh, great venue, and everybody out there knows we're doing a little bit of this for uh, TV, per you know, web broadcast purposes. So we're not in an ideal situation. We don't have, you know, 200 guests here, but uh, the principles are still the same. So let's talk through this. We're at the church. What is the mindset? Well, we would get here at least 30 minutes early before we start shooting. So we get there a half hour early to really assess the lighting situation, where we're going to be shooting. We'll get details of all the church decor. But then we'll uh, set each other up in the position of the bride and groom and take test shots of each other. Before we go there, though, because I know it's going to happen out on the Internet, okay. they're going to be like, how do you get there early? Okay. Uh, That's part of the timeline. Part of the timeline, right? We keep, we keep going back to the timeline. The timeline. You have you're, to do it. You're starting to see how this is part of our framework. We own the timeline. <laughs> That's what gives us enough time to get here half hour, hour early just to photograph the church. So I, I just want to throw that out there because yeah. I already know the question's going to no, come up. No, it's true. Uh, it's all part of the timeline. Okay, so we, we come in. We want to photograph every detail. What kind right. of details are you looking for when you work, walk inside like the church? The ribbons on the chairs, the greenery around the pergola at the altar. Anything they spent money on. Anything they spent money on, time on, their programs, even just details of the church itself. So... In the Midwest, we shoot a lot of Catholic weddings, and the churches and altars are very ornate. We don't just shoot a picture of the altar or wide shot. We also get close-ups on all the interesting details of the altar because they obviously pick the church because it's beautiful and they love it. So why not capture each of those little things that uh, they might not have even noticed, but they really appreciate? Yeah, of course. So this comes back to, once again, if you are looking to add pages to the album, You've got to get the details, right? They, no one wants an album designed where it's just pictures of them. And I can tell you what's out. What is out is the processional or recessional pictures of the, the bridesmaid and groomsmen coming down the aisle. Let's do it, right? Click. Yeah, nobody wants that. that we is actually don't include those in the book unless yeah. the client requests it. Yeah, there's a word. It's called cheese. We don't want <laughs> cheesy pictures in the album. Sorry, uh, but we've got to evolve our business. We've got to innovate. Do we take the pictures of them walking down? Of course we do. We're not going to not photograph them. However, they will not end up in the album. That is typically not what our bride and groom are looking for in there. They want details, details, details. Uh, of, of what they spent money on. Well, and because of all the pictures that we take, because of our system, they have so many pictures that whatever room they do have in their album, they don't want to fill it with traditional church pictures. That's how we're able to get them to add pages because we overwhelm them with the variety of shots. You can't just get a lot of the same thing. Right. Right. Yeah, so again, let's come back to it. We are going to photograph every single detail that they have spent money on, and then some. Architecturally, photograph the church and of course we're gonna shoot here we're gonna let you see some of the pictures that we see in this location but it really is a mindset it really is a system so what I'm looking for you guys to do out there is take our framework and apply your shooting style right I don't want to tell you what's a good photograph what's a bad photograph I think it's art uh, it's very subjective uh, you're gonna find your own style so I want you to take your style and plug it into our system for the most efficient way possible of shooting and you know, of photographing uh, a wedding 
what, what else? Let's, you know what I want to do, what I think you guys need to really learn about are the worst case scenarios. How do we deal with drama at the church? I don't want to just show you, hey, all my weddings are beautiful, all our weddings go perfectly, because uh, that's not reality, not even for us, even at this stage of the game. So no matter how much pre-planning we do, there's always going to be a freaking nightmare at the church, and that nightmare comes in the form of church lady. <laughs> church lady is a nightmare. You know what I'm talking about out there? We all have those church ladies, right? They're just cranky. I don't know why, but it just seems like... You just don't like people that tell you you can't do something. I definitely don't like to be told I can't do something, yeah. but we can't lie here. They are cranky uh, for some reason. They just don't like Probably photographers. Probably because they have to deal with you. Probably. I'll, I'll give you that. All right. But with that being said, we have to be able to do this dance with the church lady uh, in order to get the, the photographs we want. And again, in the Midwest, we're dealing with uh, a lot of Catholic ceremonies, but uh, with the, we go into churches and we'll meet the church lady, and the church lady will be like, yeah, do whatever you want. And then we'll go to uh, a majority of Catholic churches. Well, they're historic where we live, so they, of course, they're trying to preserve the church and all the architecture and everything. And I think every church lady has a horror story about a photographer that they'll tell us, like, well, this one photographer stood up on the pew, knocked the pew over in the middle of the ceremony. Like, oh, my God, well, we're not going to do that. <laughs> well, and, and there was a story we were told once where the, uh, the photographer went up on the altar uh, and was directing the clients up on the altar. Like telling them, hey, look here, look at me. Like, can you imagine doing that? Like, I can't no. even imagine. Guys, we have to be respectful of, uh, of the church. That would seem like common sense. And, you know, if you don't know what respectful is, learn about the types of ceremonies you're going to cover. If you're covering Catholic ceremonies, understand a little bit about uh, the Catholic religion. Understand, you know, if you're doing Jewish weddings, uh, you know, Asian weddings, I mean, Indian weddings, whatever you're, you're photographing, start understanding the culture. And I know for us, when we started photographing uh, Indian weddings, dude, we were lost. We had no idea what was going on. <laughs> and we were lucky enough that our brides loved our work. Mm -hmm. And you'd be surprised if a bride is hiring you as a photographer, they're going to be willing to explain the process to you. Mm -hmm. And so our first Indian wedding, the bride was so helpful in pulling me to the side constantly and saying, okay, here's what's going to happen next. Here's what's going to happen next. And I did do my research. I went online. I did a little reading to learn about... Uh, that denomination so that I wasn't completely flying blind, but I still didn't understand a lot of the, the subtleties, right. and we need to understand those subtleties. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's come back to this church lady scenario for a second. What do you guys do when you walk into the church? And I'm a real big believer of diffusing the situation. I know a majority of times the church ladies had a bad experience with uh, a photographer of some, some form or fashion. And so all I try to do when I walk into that church is diffuse that situation. So the second I walk into the church, I'm looking for the church lady and I'm looking for the priest. And I will actually go up and introduce myself. So I'll walk right up to him. I'll be like, hi, are you, are you in charge of the church? I don't call her church lady, by the way. Um, that would be a bad thing to do. Uh, and, I, and I just say, hey, uh, you know, I'm Sal Sincata. I'm the photographer. Are you in charge of the church? And she's like, yes, yes, I am. I said, I just wanted to touch base with you, let you know I'm here. And this is how I diffuse the situation. I want to let you know I'm here, and I also want to let you know I'm a professional photographer. So I won't be doing anything disrespectful in the church. I'm not going to go on the altar. We don't use flash photography. That's another rule in the church. They don't want flash photography during the ceremony. I mean, that's just given yeah. uh, these days. So you've got to get the right equipment. Plus, I don't particularly care for the way no. photographs look with flash going on. So that's another reason we have to invest in the right equipment. But I, I hit her right between the eyes the minute I walk in the door, and I don't even wait for her to, tell, to, to start telling me what I can't do because I've already told her what I'm not going to do. Does that make sense? So that becomes really, really important. Definitely. And then I look for the priest, and I introduce myself to the priest uh, to let him know the same thing. So they... I know that most photographers won't do that. And so I'm immediately not only separating myself from the pack with my client, I'm separating myself from the pack with the, uh, the church. And, and now the church ladies love us because we are respectful and uh, we're responsible during everything. And uh, it's a refreshing for them to be able to work with a photographer that is a professional you know, business person and can appreciate things and, and just address it right up front. Right, and they understand that we're in it for the long haul. And so it becomes a win-win situation. But that being said, I think we do have to tell our church lady horror story um, because I love stories. And uh, so this becomes important. So pay attention to this, everyone, how you run your team. 
and your team has to be in complete sync. So there is a beautiful church in St. Louis uh, that just photographs uh, wonderfully. It's uh, big, ornate. It's over 100 years old. Uh, and this church lady is just in every, every photographer has a story with this church, right? So you know you're at odds. I've been photographing there for four years. This one day, I don't know what happened, she lost her freaking mind. As the groom was walking down the aisle, she started losing her mind. So Taylor, go on up to the, to the altar. And so this really, this really did happen, and you've got to have your team in sync. So here's what we do as a team. If somebody starts distracting me, it doesn't matter if it's law enforcement, doesn't matter if it's a manager, doesn't matter who it is, Taylor or myself will intervene and create a distraction. The other photographer will always shoot, okay? So my second shooter has to shoot at all times. I can't stop shooting like, oh, what's going on over there? It doesn't matter what's going on over there. Use your camera, you're a photographer. So I'm photographing the groom coming down the aisle. The church lady comes up and grabs me by the arm and starts yanking me. And she's like, you can't be there. I'm where I've been for every wedding for the last five years. She's like, you can't be there. I'm like, well, where do you want me to be? The groom's coming by me. I'm like, well, where do you want me to be? And then she gets distracted because she looks up at the altar, sees Taylor at the altar, and she's like, she can't be up there, pushes me to the side, runs up, starts grabbing Taylor. So she comes up here, and she's like, you can't, be do you can't do that. She pulls Taylor down. I step in. I'm like, chick, 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 chick. she lets go of Taylor. She grabs me, pulls me to the side. Taylor goes in there, chick, 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 taking pictures. Dude. Right? You have got to create confusion, right? When you're well, working. Plan for the worst. And so we, we have this skill because we've been in those situations where we're in the middle of shooting and, you know, a security guard will come up and interrupt us and tell us we can't be here. Well, there's no reason for both of us to talk to the security guard, so I'm usually the one that intervenes because I'm from Texas and I get put on southern, my southern I'm southern. so sorry, y'all. I didn't know we couldn't be here. We'll be out of here in two shakes. So. <laughs> And then by that time, Sal's done shooting, and we're finished, and we're we'll leaving. I've been with you for almost seven years. I've never heard you say two shakes. <laughs> Just so y'all know, that's from two shakes of a lamb's tail. That's how quick we'll be out. Oh, wow. Okay. So, I don't know where I'm going with that. Okay. So, um, in two shakes of a lamb's tail, we are going to take some pictures, right? We're going to move really quickly. Um, and, uh, but you've got to uh, deal with those situations as best you can, because why? The, the number one reason we are here is to document the day. Now, I will tell you in that situation that I'm, I'm referring to, we were not being disrespectful. Uh, I had already talked to the church lady, and I have been photographing at this church for a number of years. I don't know what got into her at that moment in time, but I know I couldn't miss the shot and blame the church with my client. That would be unacceptable in my mind. Because the client is the one that we take direction from. So whether it's an aunt or mom or the church lady, we're not going to divert from the plan that we've put together with our clients because ultimately we're responsible. Yeah, so that's one scenario. What about the scenario where they won't let you into, right, the sanctuary to photograph? Have you girls had that kind of situation? How do you deal with that? There are churches that, that will tell you you have to stay out of the main ceremony area, which makes absolutely no sense because the guests today are sitting in the front row with camera equipment that's as good as ours, taking pictures and popping off flash, by the way, which I don't want to use flash, but I just think it's funny that they give us all these rules and restrictions. And we're the ones getting paid to take these pictures. And we're pictures. the only ones being paid to be there. So I don't get caught up in all that, but when I get told that by the church, uh, when I come in and they're like, just so you know, right, I go and I introduce myself, and they say to me, just so you know, you can't be in the sanctuary. Right? We've got two ways to deal with this. Here's way number one. I'm giving you guys, again, the blueprint. So this is, uh, this is troubleshooting 101. You can't be in there. I am not going to be a victim of circumstance. I'm not going to walk away from this event and tell my client I didn't get the pictures I needed because I couldn't stand uh, in that area. So I go to my client. Uh, I go to the church lady, and she says, you can't be in the sanctuary. I'm like, well, where can I be? Well, you can be in the back balcony, right, where you need like a 400-millimeter zoom lens. to be. You've got to be like a sports photographer. So I say, to, I say to her, I say, look, I understand the church has rules. I don't mean to be disrespectful. I said, I promise you I'll be quiet, but I cannot be outside this room. I have to be able to get with the first kiss and all these other details that are going to happen. In and here. then I would go tell our bride and be like, listen, this is what the church says. They say I can't be in here. 
but honestly, I think you hired me to get these shots, right? You want these? And she'll say, well, yeah. They're like, okay, well, I'm going to be in the sanctuary, so I just need you to back me up if the church lady comes to talk to you. So we encourage, so I will, uh, I will say to the church lady, if I'm having that conversation, I will say to her, okay, you, I can't be in here. Just, I'm getting paid for this event. Uh, I'm sure you understand. If you wouldn't mind, I need you to tell the bride that I'm not going to have any pictures from inside the uh, sanctuary. And usually, not always, their attitude will change immediately because they do not want to go to the bride and let the bride know that the church is the one not allowing photographs to be taken. And I, I've said that to the church over and over again, and then the next response out of that church lady is always, well, where do you need to be? <laughs> right? So, and then I'll say, look, I will sit down. I won't jump all over the ceremony. I said, I promise you, I'll only get up when there, you know, when there's a, a moment for me to get up. I will be very respectful of the church. So you have to understand the mindset of the church. Their mindset is they've just had a bad experience somewhere along the lines, uh, and it's on us. It's our fault that they've had a bad experience, right? As photographers, sometimes we're disrespectful. Well, now we have to kind of win them back over. So by me asserting that I'm in control, it's still her church. I'm not stepping on her toes, right? I don't want you to be bitchy about it. Uh, but I'm asserting that, look, this is what I'm getting paid to do. I'm a full-time photographer. If you don't want me in there, I totally respect the church, but you're going to have to help come with me to tell the bride that we're not going to be in here. And I'm telling you, they don't want to be in that position. If they insist, what I will do is I will have my second shooter sit down as a guest. So that's the second way to get around this. They will sit down, right on a chair, don't get up, but at least they're closer than I am. So that's the second way possible uh, to get around that. Well, and I think to get in the good graces of a lot of churches and venues, something that we do is after our clients come in to view their pictures, I'll actually uh, mail a disc to the venue of a bunch of pictures we took from there with our logo on it, just small in the corner, letting them know they can use it for their website, for marketing material. And then after they see the beautiful pictures that we got, the next time we come back, oh, they love us. And we'll, they, we can do whatever we want now. So. That's a great way, not only, of course, to get a lot of marketing for your studio and get your pictures and your name out there, but also to get the venues on your side because, let's face it, we don't get pictures to venues because we get so busy and uh, we don't know what they're going to use them for. So just let them use your pictures. Of course, get photo credit, uh, but it's a great way to get on their side. They'll love you for it. Yeah, so that's good stuff. Quite, I want to I wanna keep an internet, start feeding your questions about dealing with church scenarios. I'll take your you know, what do you do in this situation? I'll try and answer that. But ladies, questions. Worst case scenarios you face that maybe this, you don't think this will work or do you think this will change the way you're doing business? Are we good? I have a question about um, your guests using flash. Do you say anything regarding that? That's a, that's a great question. So my guests using flash, I could care less. They can do whatever they want. They're really not gonna interfere uh, with what I'm doing. I personally don't photograph with flash in the church. And the way I get around that is by my, what's in my bag, right? So again, if you're a wedding and wedding photographer or you're trying to become one, you've got to get rid of the junky glass. You're not going to be able to photograph a wedding without flash, and the best lens you have is a 5.6 lens. It's not going to happen, guys. I mean, there's nothing else I can tell you. You've got to make the investment in your equipment. And so here, to, to me, is your must-have list of lenses. 7200 2.8, 24-70 2.8, 1635 2.8, and then I'd like to see you have a 15 millimeter 1.2. I know it's expensive. It's my favorite. That is our fav one of our favorites, but the next best lens would be a 50 millimeter, like 1.4. I think from a Canon perspective, that's like a $400 lens or somewhere in that range. So I need you to have speed uh, in, your, in your glass because that's what's going to let you get away without using flash. That being said, I could care less what, what the guests are doing. But good question. Anything else? Yeah. I your comment about having a second shooter sit as a guest because that's priceless. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of times they won't budge. So. Yeah, if they don't budge, then they don't budge. Just have your second shooter just go sit there as they're a guest. And once the ceremony starts, church ladies won't walk in and grab. And all they'll do is sit in this seat. Don't get, don't get out. All they have to do is while they're sitting here. Okay, what I do is I'm sitting in this seat and I'm just like... <laughs> Right? I just keep leaning in, taking some pictures so that I've got, what, I've got what I need. And then, of course, the other shooters, either in the balcony or wherever else, they're going to make us stand. Uh, go ahead. Do you, do you physically sit in the chair? 
Because they obviously know that you're the main person. Exactly. It depends on the conversation. If I was the one talking to the church lady, then no, I won't be there because she's watching me like a hawk. <laughs> if my second shooter was the one having the conversation with the church lady, then yes, I'll be the one to sneak okay. in there, right? So okay. you see what we're doing, man. It's just like a diversionary tactic. Uh, it's just this game, cat and mouse game we seem to have to play uh, with the church. Have you ever been caught afterwards where they were like, after they see you oh, yeah. with your second shooter and they're like... Yeah, I thought I told you you couldn't do that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they'll get on me, but I don't, I, what do I care? I, got, I did my job. I got what I needed. So, That's you know, and, and I try to be respectful of that person. And what I find is that when I ask them, like, logical questions, because I've asked church leaders, I'm like, I'm, look, I don't, I don't mean to be disrespectful to the church. I'm Catholic. You're going to have to explain to me. Can you explain to me why the guests can sit in the front row with camera equipment that's on par with mine, but because I'm the paid professional, I can't be in the room? Can you explain that to me? They cannot explain that. They start, they're like, eh, eh, eh. They're right? They start, like, breaking down. They can't explain why we can't do it. And I just think... Because it doesn't I, make sense. It doesn't make any sense. They don't know why anymore. They just, this is the church rule. So what about talking about, um, you know, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, uh, maybe different uh, Indian weddings, uh, gay marriages, things like that. Yeah. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, absolutely. Before? Okay. Um, so say you don't have a second shooter or they don't allow you in at all and they see him going to sit down, whatever. Um, and you're relegated to the balcony, you can't do anything. Do you recreate afterward, or do you just let it go and say, I got what I got from the balcony, and that's going to be it? I would never recreate it. Okay. Uh, that's, it it's never going to look right. It's never going to feel right. That's like circa 1980s, right? You know, okay. you get out there, get the bouquet out, put the hands over the bouquet. I think right? that situation's fine as long as the bride has okayed it. So okay. if she said, no, I don't care what the church lady says, I want you in here, then you're in there. I don't care what the church lady says or does. But if she said, well, if that's what they said, we can't do anything, then she's obviously okay. Let her know, okay, everything's going to be really far away. I won't be able to get any close-ups because they're, I'm so far away. And if she says okay to that, then it's out of your control and it's not a problem anymore. But okay. in, in a word, what Taylor's basically telling you guys, it's about communication. Right. Mm -hmm. right? What you don't want to do is wait till a month after the wedding because you're too shy and too timid to let the bride know. And then she comes in to see her pictures. Now she's going to be livid. Mm -hmm. So what I will do, I understand it's her day. We don't want to disrupt her day and get her upset. I'm not looking to get her upset. I'm just going to say, hey, Susie, just FYI. Remember, I'm going to bring that church lady. I'm going to make the church lady have this conversation with the bride. But in that conversation, I'm going to be like, look, we're off. They're pushing us off to the balcony. I'm going to do my best to get the images I can. I'm so far away, though. You guys are going to be much smaller uh, in, the, in the imagery. Are you okay with that? So as long as I've gotten clearance from her, there's nothing I can do. Now... You know, let's think about it. It wouldn't help to pick up one of those extenders for your lenses, right? One of the magnifiers, one of the, you know, uh, 1.5 magnifiers. Uh, it's a $40, $50 add-on to your lens. Or if you're photographing with a crop sensor, like a 7D, a 60D, that 200 millimeter lens is going to look like a 300 millimeter lens. And so those are the kind of things you can do to circumvent that. Uh, so you've always got to be prepared for what can possibly happen. Um, let's talk about uh, same-sex marriages, right? I mean, that's always a, a hot topic. Some people might agree with it, don't agree with it. It doesn't matter, honestly. What do you do when you're photographing it? We, when we're involved in, in weddings like that, we don't act any differently, right? We no. just, we talk to the couple. We talk to the couple as they are, as they exist. And if you don't feel comfortable with those kinds of marriages, don't do them, right? I mean, that's the simplest thing. Don't take those meetings. Don't meet with those people. Uh, and you don't have to worry about it. For us, we could care less. People are people. We want to photograph it. Uh, we love all kinds of people, no matter what sex, race, denomination, we're, we're involved in all that stuff. So uh, beyond that, right, you got to think about it. If it's, you've got to work within body types. I think that's the only thing I want to cover when we're talking about uh, same-sex marriages. You know, when you're photographing the day photojournalistically, it is what it is. But when you start posing the group and you have two men together, two women together, you've got to work Within their, within their body language, right? You've got to read them and, and photograph them for who they are as individuals. And I think, again, that's our job as photographers, is getting to know people as individuals. Um, well, I think if you research a lot of, you know, if it's a denomination, their religion or their traditions, like African-American weddings, I know a lot of the time they have a jumping the broom. Jump the broom, man. Yeah. And so make sure you know about that stuff. If that happens and you're like, what, why are you jumping the broom? They're gonna, that's going to be offensive to them because it's well, obviously would, important. But you would have missed it. Yeah, you would have missed it or maybe you didn't get a great shot of it not knowing how important it was. So make sure you research traditions. And when you're on that timeline call, that should come up. Are you doing anything different or unique that day? 
if it's a different denomination now, do you have anything that kind of explains your ceremonies or can teach me a little bit about it? That should come up, so should, you should be able to prepare yourself and know how important those types of things are. Right, yeah, and, I, and I, like I said, a little bit of research on your end will help you plan the day. But and you how know, impressed will they be if you're like, if they're saying, okay, it was time to jump the broom, you'll be like, okay, I got this great shot, I love this part, and so it means a lot to them that you invested time and really care about their day. You know, and, and again, you use that word again, timeline. Uh, you came back to the timeline, and I don't know if you guys remember the phone call Taylor had, the Skype call with our bride. The very last part of the call was, is there anything else you're doing that we need to know about? I, I can't stress enough that timeline form that we're giving all you guys, by the way, uh, with the course, how important that form is to making the rest of this work. It covers your butt. <laughs> so right. if she didn't tell you about it, she didn't tell you about something big that's happening, then it's not your fault. But if you didn't ask, then it's your fault. So you have to ask that question. Yeah, let's take a couple of questions on, from the internet, because, uh, and then we'll keep going. Okay, there's so many questions. I'm just, well, what if this happens? What if yeah, this that, happens? and those are the ones what I want, right? I want to help okay. you guys in, like, the, what are the worst-case scenarios you're, you're coming up with, and how would Sal handle that? How would Taylor handle that? Okay, this one is from Jules Gray. What about dealing with the amateur videographer or guest that doesn't roam and stands up by the minister the whole time? Ah, Jules. Love you, Jules. All right. So, so here's, here's the thing. What, what do you do with the, the videographer, right? Um, so the first part is when I get there, not only do I introduce myself to the church lady, I introduce myself to the video team if I see them there. Because here's what you got to realize. First of all, we run a full cinema division. So I'm very well aware of what they're trying to do, the angles they need, the lines they need. And so the first thing I will do is introduce myself to the videographer. That will immediately blow him away. Because there's this like bad tension between photographers and video people, which I don't know why. There doesn't need to be. So by me going and introducing myself, the videographer is already feeling the difference between dealing with me and dealing with somebody else. So now that tension, right, we've bridged that gap. And I'll walk up to him. He's got his video equipment, right? So I'm, I'm Captain Obvious at this moment. I'm like, hey, hey, dude, you the video guy? He's like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm Sal. I'm the photographer today. Let's talk a little bit about what you need out of today. And he or she is typically taken aback that I just ask them what they need out of the day. And then his first response typically is, well, well what, do you, what are you thinking? I'll work around you. I'm like, dude, you don't have to work around me. Let's work together on this. And so now I'm bridging this gap between photographer and videographer, and I will work with them. Because here's what starts happening. We did a wedding. We learned the hard way. I always tend to be on this side of the aisle. Well, the videographer had a camera set up there and had a camera set up there. So they were on the opposite side. So guess what? Every time those cameras turned down the aisle, I was in their shot. So I'm explaining to them, I'm like, guys, if we're all on the same side of the aisle, none of us are in the same line. And so it's that kind of thing where I, I don't want to say I'm taking over the video team, but I'm trying to help them, uh, and that's how we do it. It's a good question, yeah. Be proactive. We talked about the church ladies, but uh, folks, some folks are still asking about the priests or the clergy. And how do you deal with clergy? This is from Texas Argus, that don't allow photography from the moment they begin speaking until after they finish their prayer, rings, kiss, etc., still to follow. They will allow the processional and the recessional, but just not when they're speaking. And then Bail Fuji asked, some priests will actually stop the ceremony if you go there. How do you deal with that? Yeah, you've got to be very, very careful in those situations. Do you talk to the priest beforehand? We will, again, talk to the priest beforehand. And if those are the rules that are laid down to us, you're in a situation where that is common knowledge. So the bride is aware of what the rules are, and she understands there might not be any imagery uh, during that, that period of time. So I'm okay with that, personally. My bride's okay with that. We've spoken about that. That's okay. All that matters is the brightest. If she's okay with it, then it's fine. The word is communication. You've got to communicate with your client so that expectations are properly met and set. This is a good one. This is from Steph, um, Vitals Back Photography. What would you do if some of your guests get up during the ceremony, start taking pictures during the ceremony, and stand about 10 feet away from the couple? Is there a nice way to tell them to sit down and get out of their shot? Uh, so, wow. I, I can't believe that actually happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, to me, I think there's a couple of problems here. One is you're not, you're not in control. Uh, and I, I don't know if that happened, like, maybe during the ceremony or if that's happening. Yeah. I mean, but I will tell you, once again, 
a story and through my own experience. Uh, I, I was at a church and the, the, I had a guest who sat right by me, right here, uh, and she kept stepping into the aisle with her iPhone, with her <laughs> iPhone taking pictures. So here I am and she keeps stepping out, blocking me. So I very nicely, this was as the, um, you know, the bridesmaids were coming down. I said, excuse me, ma'am. I said, I I'm the photographer today. I said, every time you step in, you're, you're getting into my shot. I said, and I just got to get the shot of the bride coming down. If you wouldn't mind, can you just stay in your seat? I was very nice about it. And she's like, uh-huh, uh uh-huh. <laughs> and then just kept doing her thing, right? So the bride came down, and she stepped in again, and I stuck my pointer finger in her rib cage <laughs> and pushed her back into her seat. <laughs> And she never stepped in my way again. Okay? So sometimes physical violence is good, right? You can't say that. I can't say that on TV? Okay, so no, phys no physical violence. That no. is bad. But I still did it, okay? I asked nicely, and then it escalated. Susan, you're cracking up. You're like, we should have not asked Sal that question. Oh, <laughs> we should know better by now. Day yes, four. Yes. Day four. You are ultimately I love it. I love it. responsible, so right. you have to take responsibility. If you miss the shot, it's nobody's fault but yours. But the truth is, just in all fairness, look, we deal with the same issues you're dealing with out there where guests jump in, uh, they're doing, you know, they're, they're trying to get their shot, uh, they're, maybe they're not conscious of where you are. That's where being vocal comes into play. Now, if it's during a ceremony and the first kiss is about to happen and somebody jumps into the aisle, I don't know what I would do. Honestly. I would probably find the church lady. <laughs> It'd be too late. The first kiss would yeah. happen. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, if it's if you have a little bit of time, I would send my second shooter. Like, dude, get the church lady. This person is like interrupting the entire ceremony, and she's obviously on that, so she would take care of it. But I those think. are good questions because there's other scenarios where that could happen, like family pictures at the altar. That happens consistently, but they won't step in front of me. They'll just be behind me, over my shoulder, uh, and they become very distracting. Yeah. I'm okay with that because I'm being very vocal. I'm trying to control the group and command their attention. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, again, we've got to be in control of our own destiny. One thing that occurred to me, and I think you said this in the last few days, was that if you make it not about you, between you and the person, and you say, I have to do this for the bride, this mm -hmm. is for the couple, then they, they wouldn't take it as a personal kind of right. battle. They'd right. be like, oh, you're doing this for her. It's, it's, not, it's not me against them. Yeah. That's a good point, Susan. Yeah. It's not me against them. They understand I'm working on behalf of the bride, the person you're here to see. Let me get what I need to get. Yeah, you could probably get further with that than yeah, for physical sure. violence. <laughs> and it's not uncommon for me. Uh, so just last weekend, I had this, uh, all the kids. I like to take the kids outside after the church and put all the kids outside and get a picture of the bring bearer, right? All, uh, the cousins, all the little kids. And there was this dad off to the side, and he's got his little, right, um, cannon rebel pop-up flash. And he's off over here on the side, and I got my shot, right? And I looked over to him, and I see him keep trying to take these pictures, and he's having trouble with his camera. I'm like, Dad, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm just trying to get a picture. I'm like, you're in the wrong spot, Dad. Get over here. And I brought Dad in, okay? He was still having trouble with his camera. I took his camera, adjusted his settings, and took the family picture for him. That is good will. And when you're doing stuff like that, you will find that they will be less likely to step in front of you uh, because they're, they're going to have more respect for you. Let's take one more. Can we just ask one quick question? Uh, that was, who arranges whether you can photograph at the venue or not? Is that you or is it the bride? Typically so the bride. The bride's going to yeah. uh, uh, handle that because there's going to be a list of rules. And I'm surprised this question hasn't come up. You know, typically if it's a Saturday wedding, there's a Friday rehearsal. We do not go to the rehearsal question yeah. did come up. Okay. I'm su yeah, I was going to say, I'm surprised it didn't. But, so we will not go to the rehearsal. I don't need to see a mock processional uh, come down. I get it. I know how it works. So there's absolutely, I don't have time to go to the rehearsal. They're not doing anything with those pictures. Uh, it's, I just don't have the time. We've never done it. Lisa, you had a question? Yeah, it's kind of just a two-part one. Is um, First of all, Sometimes it's hard to get the shots like when they're getting ready and things now because everyone has their iPhone in front of them, so you can't always get like the mom's expression because now she's holding up her iPhone. Sure. Those kind of things. And then even during the ceremony, uh, I work with someone who has in their contract, they'll be the only photographer that day. Sure. So hopefully they talk to their family members. But do you say anything to the bride about talking to her guests and not get up or not, you know, try to keep iPhones, iPads down? Difficult now. Right, so uh, in our contracts, it also states we are the only professional photographer uh, at the event, but professional photographer. So we're the only ones being paid. That's never going to stop guests yeah. 
from standing up and, and doing what they're going to do. You've got to learn to work around them, and that's what we do. And if mom's looking down the aisle, taking a picture, that's, that is the moment, right? So that's still the shot. Yes, I know we love that emotional shot where mom's looking down the aisle and she's getting all teary-eyed and all this other stuff, but if it's not happening, it's not happening. Instead, I'm just going to photograph the moment. Hey, here's what your mom was doing. She was taking a picture of you uh, coming down the aisle. So why run from it? That's life. That's what we're there to, to document. The worst situation we ever had was dad forgot to take out his earpiece. So dad had an earpiece. Bluetooth. His, yeah, no, he had the wire. And it was going into his phone, into his pocket, and he's walking his daughter down, oh, no. and the bride sees her pictures, and she's like, is my dad wearing his earpiece? I'm like, he sure was. You know, and uh, I, what was I going to do? I couldn't yell at him as he was coming down the aisle uh, to take it out, but that's what we're there to photograph. So whether they're using iPhones or anything else, you know, it is what it is. Thank God she didn't ask me to edit, edit that out. That would have been a, a nightmare. Um, but good. So let's keep going here. Or did we have anything pressing, ladies? Good? All right. So hopefully that makes sense, my mindset in the church. But now pay attention because I'm going to teach you probably what I think is one of the most valuable lessons that we teach our team. How do you talk to your team in the church? I don't have a second shooter right now. I work with my husband, so. How do you talk to your husband? I ask him to sit in the back in case I need something. During a ceremony, how are you communicating? You're not, is what it sounds oh, like. Oh, we have hand signals. I'm sorry. I didn't you have realize. hand signals. Good. Yes. We have hand signals. Is hand signals anybody else? Somewhat. Nothing. Somewhat. Yeah. Nothing. Well, we're going to learn formal hand signals, not somewhat. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so here we go. I want you to pay attention, everybody. All right. So there's several parts of the, uh, of the um, group that we need to keep track of. We know we need the bride, the groom, the bride's family, the groom's family, and then there's always some variable. Maybe it's the priest uh, or something else going on in the church. So signal number one, eyes, right? So I'm saying eyes. Number one is the bride. Number two is the groom. Number three is the, bri uh, is the bride's family. Number four is the groom's family. Number five is the variable in the room. I'll say it again. Eyes. Number one is the bride. Number two is the groom. Number three is the bride's family. Number four is the groom's family. Number five is the variable in the room. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at Taylor and I'm going to say, I'm telling her she's got eyes on number one. And I can tell her, I'm telling her I got eyes on number two, which is the groom. This becomes very, very important during the ceremony as we're going. So let's, let's test this theory out. Taylor, go on up there. I don't know which camera I'll be looking at, but you'll see the signal I'm going to generate to Taylor. And then Taylor, just say what I, what I just told you using my hand signals. Eyes. Me. Bride. Groom, you've got. Right, so. Eyes. Eyes. Groom, you've got the groom. Eyes. Variable, I've got it. See? So just three quick signals. She knows exactly what I'm talking about. When there's mass chaos in the church and there's flowers being handed off, the bride's coming down, somebody's lighting candles, grandma's walking around, what do I do? Boom, eyes, who's got what? Now the team is in complete sync. Simple, simple hand signals uh, to get your team going, right? If you're like trying to talk to each other in church, like, what the hell? <laughs> Stupid. Right? You can't be doing that. Like, you're not going to get, you're not going to communicate that way, okay? And then the other thing we do in the church, right? I can't be like, Taylor, Taylor, Taylor. That's not how we, how do I get her attention? So there's a simple way I get her attention. That's the Don't signal, laugh. dude. That's it. It's like the dog whisperer. Are you referring to me as a dog? I don't know. That's not what I said, but I can see myself getting in trouble for this. Which, ha You've which happens on a, summer, uh, uh, on a daily basis. <laughs> but that's how we get uh, each other's attention in the church. So no matter where my team is in the church, if they hear that, they'll look around. Where a guest might not even pay attention to that, right? But if I were like, Taylor, 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 <laughs> everybody's looking at us, and we're now causing a distraction in the church. So hopefully that is a very useful tip for all of you guys out there. Uh, again, this is how our entire team communicates. Even if we're doing video, this is very, very powerful in the, uh, in the church. Thoughts on that? Easy enough to do? Awesome. Lisa's like, yes, I love it. <laughs> All right. Question from Cook Esquire. What is the variable? Can you talk a little bit about what the variable yeah, is? Yeah, the variable is going to be the priest. 
uh, the variable is going to be that uh, the speaker up uh, up at the altar, right? So the, the person singing, or if they're giving a rose to Mary, that's one of the traditions the Catholic ceremonies have. That would be the variable going on. Right. So I could say I could be telling Taylor, look, you <laughs> cover the variable, or my video team. Now think about it. I'm in the ceremony. Not only are we shooting photography, I got to communicate with my vi my video people, my camera operators. So I'm telling my ca I'm the creative director. I'm telling my camera operator what to do. I'm then telling the uh, tailor what to cover, and I'm telling my second camera operator what to do. So I'm directing everything so that I can ensure that there was no miscommunication, no misunderstanding. Saying I thought you had it, that can't happen because we know how to talk to each other uh, in the church through those hands. And that's how you're able to be a ninja. Yes, Ninja 101, yes. that is how you do it. Did that answer any other questions about the hand signals? Well, did you mention if you use or would use walkie-talkies? Not in the church. Because if you're using walkie-talkies in church, great question, by the way. If you're using walkie-talkies in the church, you're talking. I don't want to talk because you can hear a pin drop in some of these churches. So I don't be like, get the bride, get the bride. Right? I, I don't want to do that. So I, it's silence. We've got to be silent and respectful. I will take my shoes off in the church sometimes. All right, if you've got heels on a, on a tile floor or a marble floor or anything like that, and you're running around, you can hear every click, right, of your heels. I will walk around the church barefoot to be respectful uh, of the church. I'm telling you, man, this is, you've got to be respectful of the church, especially if it's in your own local area, so that they will let you back in. Because my church ladies, they love us, they remember us, uh, because we were respectful the last time we were in there. Good. Just one more. Could you yeah. show those signals again? Yeah, yeah. To the, That's to cool. The I'm glad everybody's, everybody's loving it. All right. Am I tight on this? All right. So signal number one, eyes. Okay. So I'm pointing here. I'm telling Taylor to have eyes on number one, which is the groom. Bride. I'm sorry, bride. <laughs> Screwing up my own signals. Bride. Number two, groom. Three is the uh, bride's family. Four is the groom's family. Five is the variable in the room. That could be the priest. That could be maybe a little kid coming down. There's always action going on somewhere. That's what number five is. Maybe it's the speaker. Okay, then I'm pointing to either her to signal she's got it or me, I got it. So I might go, and that means I've got the bride. Okay, I'm telling Taylor she's got the groom or the variable, something to that effect. So good. I'm glad everybody's digging the, the hand signal. <laughs> Just a couple of quick ones. Yeah, yeah. What do you do if you're not in the line of sight with each other, if you can't see each other? We always tell our second shooters, make sure you keep looking for me. So the whole time, they should be trying to make eye contact with you just to make sure you're not trying to signal something to them. Everything's okay. And, and we'll set up a plan of attack. Once the, when we get there that half hour early, we're telling them, okay, I'm going to be stationed in the middle aisle and I won't move because I have to get all the action going on. You have to go from side to side around the outside aisles and get side shots of the bride's expressions, side shots of the groom's expressions, the family's expressions. So their job is to keep bouncing around and in between keep looking for me in case I need you. Yeah. So again, communication with your team. Never ever assume that your teammates know what's going on, right? It's like, it's like being a football team. We're in the church, there's a play about to happen and my, I need to know, right, the quarterback knows where every teammate, team member is and what's expected of them, right? What's the route they're going to run, so to speak, uh, and we need to be in communication with each other. So, good. So the questions keep coming about this. They want to know the secret hand signals. <laughs> um, Marty R. had asked what... You it, know what, what I love about this, by the way, <laughs> is uh, we do have people who come out and train with us for like a three-day window. And they see my team doing the hand signals. They're like, wait, what just happened? What just happened? What is that? Number one, who is that? All right, so no, I'm glad everybody's digging this. I wanted to share this with everybody, so I'm glad. So Marty, I want, wanted to know exactly what does that mean, eyes? Keep your eyes on the person all, at all times? Eyes to me is camera. You own it, right? right? These are military hand signals, by the way. Right? So in, in the military, they're doing eyes, right? Or they're doing all stop, but we're not going to do all stop. There's no reason. I need you to keep shooting. <laughs> Um, basically, your when I say eyes, it's you and your camera are watching and photographing. Shoot this. Yeah. Shoot this. That's what you're paying attention to. Don't just shoot randomly, right? I want you paying attention to the bride, to the groom, and if something's happening, you've got it covered. Whereas I might be going to a new location, right? And I don't have eyes on the bride or groom. I like that. You're not just spraying and praying in the whole church. Or <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is what I have to do. Yeah, just like, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, got it. Done. <laughs> All right, cool. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Good, good. All right, so let's do this. We're doing good. I'm glad everybody's uh, enjoying this. We got the hand signals. Um, let's talk a little bit about must-have shots. 
right? So this becomes a little bit of your shot list, so to speak. Uh, and this is, again, from experience, what I know ends up in the album, what doesn't end up in the album. So like Taylor alluded to, we walk into the church. We need church details. And in about five minutes, I'm going to actually start photographing some of those church but details. One important church detail is an, what we call an establishing shot, especially for video. So an establishing shot lets, them, lets whoever's viewing the pictures of the video know where you're at. In order to do that, it has to be the full building. And so we'll take a full shot of the church with a 1635 from the outside right. and try and you know, do something creative with it where it incorporates the sign or the, the steeple or anything like that. But get an establishing shot to let everyone know where you're at. A great point, by the way. And so I don't know if you girls do this, but every time we get to a church uh, or a venue or something like that, the first photograph we will take is, again, that establishing shot. But you've got to understand why we're doing that for the album. So when you're flipping through a wedding album, if you want to produce a well-designed wedding album, the la okay, here's the bride getting ready. Here's the groom getting ready. Whoa, she's coming down the aisle. How did that story unfold? That doesn't make any sense. It's all about the story. It's all about the story. So now, okay, I open the next page. Oh, look at this beautiful church. Maybe it's across two page. Now show some details. Maybe the ribbons, maybe the altar, those kinds of things. That becomes a two-page spread in the album. Guys, we're going to talk about album design uh, tomorrow, but if I don't have these photographs, I can't design a well-thought-out album. I want to be able to tell the story of the day, so that is huge. Um, we know we have to get the groom looking. We have to get everybody coming down. Whether they make it to the album or not, we still have to photograph that. The bride wants to see that we're doing that. I don't invest a whole lot of time. I don't use any flash, okay? We've already established that. Um, they're coming down the aisle. I need the bride coming down the aisle, but I need a multitude of focal lengths with her coming down the aisle. So I need that tight middle wide, and I'm going to show you how quickly I work uh, doing that. Then we need them kissing. Got to right? get the first Got to get the first kiss. Got to get a tight first kiss. And we like to get a wide first kiss to, first kiss as well. So We'll you know, show you how we do that. Yeah. Okay, so we have a technique for that as well to ensure the last thing you want to do is let your second shooter off to the side for the first kiss. That's almost unusable There's every no single time. There's not a shot there. Either the bride's going to be, uh, you're either seeing the bride or you're seeing the groom. You're not seeing both of them. And it's rarely a good angle. So we'll show you how to do that. Uh, we need all this detail, okay? We need some expression from the parents, right? We need the parents to show, are they happy? Are they sad? What are they doing? We need the kids coming down, right? So, and then, of course, we're going to go into family pictures. So what I want to do is take a look at that. We'll talk about family portraits. I want to shoot a handful of details mm -hmm. as if we had just walked into the church just to give you a sense of what we would do really quickly. So let me grab my camera. And we can work off my camera, Taylor, because okay. uh, obviously this is uh, d dialed up. So I would walk in here. And in this particular room, uh, we've got this amazing ceiling here. It would be interesting to shoot a real church tethered. Um, <laughs> Excuse me, guests, move out of the way. All right. So what I'm seeing is this amazing ceiling above me. Well, what I'm also seeing is a background in my album. And so this would be a shot I would take. Okay. And this is going to be a background in the album so that I can lay images over this. Again, rather than putting everything in uh, on a black background or a white background, I'm taking ch detail from the church and I'm showcasing that stuff, okay? Then what I'm seeing are some of these details here, okay? So I'm going to come in here, and I love using some of, right? So I'm going horizontal. I can come here, use some of this ribbon, really, really use the depth of field, right? Show things going blurry. Maybe I'm going to shoot down on this, and I'm moving really quickly, really efficiently, to get some of these things. Then I'm going to back up here. And a typical church, can you just push my bag down, Taylor? Mm -hmm. uh, a typical church, we're going to have this altar, right? Or wherever you are, they spent money on something. Again, anything they're spending money on, let's photograph here. So I'm using a 1635 lens. Okay, I'm using a 1635 lens. I'm at ISO 1000, and I'm just working this, right? Now I got all these. Uh, petals on the floor. So maybe I lay down here. And this is all going on. Right? I put the petals in focus, take the shot. 
I put the altar in focus, take the shot, and I just keep moving to try and get different things, different options uh, here. Hold on, my mic just fell out. Got it? Hopefully you guys can still hear me. Then I'm going to come up here, right, and the, we got an arbor, so spend some time just photographing again with stuff like this. I'm thinking about the background in the album, to be quite honest with you. I don't think there's a bride in the world who's going to blow up a 20 by 30 uh, portrait of her arbor, right? If she does, I want that bride. Um, <laughs> she'd be a great client to have. That is the best looking arbor I've ever seen in my life. All right. So I'm going to keep photographing this stuff, right? Just trying to get as much detail as possible. But if you're wondering what I'm going to do with this detail, ultimately, it's all about the album. That's what I'm looking to uh, accomplish here, is just build a better album. I don't think you can really shoot too many details. Uh, even if it, you're not sure if it's something they spent time or money on, just photograph it. We actually had a bride that, uh, it was a very high-end wedding, and they had some very ugly white you know, lattice covering a part of the reception that they didn't want anyone to see. We didn't take a picture of it because we thought it was really ugly, and it was just from the reception hall. But it turned out she requested it, and it was uh, very important to her to have the lattice. So uh, just make sure you take pictures. If you're not sure, just take pictures of it. All right, so here, so from this, what I'm doing now is I'm backing all the way up. I might be in the back of the church. Notice the different focal lengths that I'm moving to. I'm up really tight, but I'm using this 1635. I love the way it looks. So what I'd be looking to do, and I'm just going to photograph this really wide. So I'm at 16 millimeter here. Okay, I'm going to get this wide shot of the entire room. Now, of course, in this room, right, we've got the crew in here and all that other stuff. So maybe I go vertical with it, and I really showcase some of the architectural detail in the ceiling, right? So I think stuff like this could end up editing really well. I'm thinking about the album once again and using all that uh, architectural detail in the album, but I'm doing all this with my 1635. If I had a, um, a card from the, from the wedding, they're going to have a guest book. Right, they're going to have their uh, program. Their program. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> right, so what I would do is, Rochelle, give me your book. What I would do with this book, let's say this is the program. I would take the program. To me, I think this is a creative shot. I would put the program right here, okay, in the center of the aisle. I would then, if there were petals there, I'd lay the petals around. I would then lay down, get the program, and get those architectural details in the photograph. So now, rather than sh shooting the, um, rather than just photographing, okay, the program, now I'm doing, you're, you're like happy right now. Your notebook is famous. <laughs> I love your flower notebook, Rochelle. <laughs> All right, so rather than just photographing the uh, program, I'm now adding more, it's making it more interesting. That's what you have to think about. How can I make this program more interesting? Sometimes all the programs are in a basket, right? So what I want you to do, give me this. Give me all your notebooks. <laughs> oh, yeah. iPad, we got it. <laughs> iPad works. Give me this. Good. So I would take all the programs, okay, in the, in the basket, in the bucket, and I would lay them and fan them out with each other just to make it more interesting. So bear with me. You get the idea. So now... Okay, I do something like that, and now the programs become a little more interesting. So and I don't know if you guys, like, catch how I'm holding his camera when he hands it to me. This is also something we train our second shooters on. When they hand a camera to us, they hand it so that we can just grip it right away. Yeah, that's important. Yeah, so they don't hand it like this. Because right, then, then I'm like, I'm grabbing it, I'm putting fingerprints on it. Now I've got I've to twist it around. So instead, she's giving me that camera, boom, I'm ready to go, and I can keep photographing Again, speed and efficiency. There is no substitute. Um, okay, that being said, I feel like we're good as far as covering details. La my ladies, details. Do you like the way we're doing this, right? We're not reinventing the wheel, but can you see just by doing little things, the album? So, it's all about the album. Sal, I, when Sal was teaching me how to shoot because he taught me everything I know, he put uh, a really great... Thing in my head whenever I was shooting details because I used to suck at taking detail shots because 
I'm like, what's the big deal? It's just, you know, a, a ribbon. It's like, you should be shooting that detail like it's going to be a 20 by 30 canvas on their wall. That is true. And I that, forgot about that. that made complete sense to me because now I put effort into making it creative, making sure things aren't cut off and it's the best that it could possibly be. And I feel like I've, uh, my pictures are much better now. That is probably the best tip for everybody out there yeah. is when you're photographing details, you know, because I've made the statement, look, if they spend money on it, you photograph it. Mm -hmm. And you go, okay, yeah, they spent money, take a picture. But I don't want you to take a drive-by picture, right? Mm -hmm. I want you to put some thought into it and think about it as they might blow this up as a 20 by 30, which You'd, they never will. Yeah. But if you photograph it like that... You'd be surprised at where your work will start to go. You'll be really happy. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great, great point. So hopefully that makes sense. My ladies, we making sense here? Mm -hmm. All right, so with that being said, why don't we start getting ready uh, to photograph them coming down? Now, let's talk about where your primary shooter is and where your secondary shooter should be. Here's a little thing to consider. As the primary shooter, I am here, center aisle. I am not up at the altar, as you might think. So we've had people come out and train with us, and the first thing they're surprised by is that I'm not up at the altar, that I'm here in the aisle. And the reason I'm here in the aisle is because I don't think being up the altar is actually that important. Here, to me, is where everything happens. This is part of our shooting style and philosophy. So all you got to do is plug your shooting into our framework. And so what I, what I want you to do here is understand that I'm looking for this big dramatic shot of the bride coming in. So we're going to use a 1635 lens. Then I'm looking for a tighter shot of the bride coming down. Then I'm looking for a 50 millimeter uh, middle shot of her coming down as she goes by me. So I'm actually going to switch lenses three times while she's coming down the aisle. And I'm going to show you exactly how we do that. My second shooter is up here at the altar. Taylor, why don't you come on up here? Second shooter's up here. Second shooter's job is one shot, one shot only. It is of the groom looking down the aisle at the bride. You miss that shot, we are not having a good conversation after the ceremony because that is all I need you doing. Uh, so Taylor, when, when our team gets to the church, we shoot all the details. When do you get dialed in? I get dialed in before the bride and groom come down the aisle. Do not wait for the bride and groom to come down the aisle. So what I do is I pose for Taylor where the groom would be so that she can get dialed in. Now her camera's not tethered. Uh, but You know what, Taylor? Let's do, just for the sake of the, of the program, let's just put that lens on this camera so they can get a sense of what you're doing. Okay. Show them uh, compositionally what we're looking for. So I will stand here as the groom would, and I will look down the aisle. We like to put them in the left third and leave that negative space to the right because it makes sense when we're designing the album that he's looking towards the bride. And we'll put an image of the bride coming down the aisle on the right. That's a great picture. Of that is not a good picture. <laughs> I'm boycotting that picture. All right. So here we are, I'm looking down, no poles coming out of my head, right? right? Pick a flattering angle. Obviously, we've got a TV behind me, so that, would, that wouldn't work. Maybe, uh, maybe you pick that angle this way. Well, I probably wouldn't come around here because people are going to be standing up here, and that's going to block my shot. So typically, the second shooter will be at the end of the aisle in the front. So it'll be right as the chair stops so that they're not blocking any family members' views and they're not in the way. Uh, right before people are there. And you'll, get, you'll either stay at that level or down a level, shooting right. up, right? Depending on what's in the back. If he's got a giant window right behind him, I might bend down. That way I'm not getting the window in the background. You know, frame it up so it's, it's the best that it could possibly be. Again, shoot it like it's going to be, a 20 by 30 canvas. And the, let's look at this image for a second. Right, she, I would probably want to see me more in a third uh, so we've got more room forward. Because in the album design... I want the groom all the way to the corner. Do it, do it, so we have it. Now you see your camera. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to want me all the way into this third here. Let this image come up. Okay, and then on the right-hand side of this image, guess what's going to be there? Pictures of the bride coming down the aisle. And so we're already thinking about album design at this stage of, uh, of the game. And so that's ultimately what we're trying to do. We might crop it differently, anything like that, but I'm already thinking about album design. Now, so that's Taylor's uh, shot. What, what were your settings there? 
Uh, so it's... she's shooting at ISO 1.2, right? You're, we love shooting wide open. And if you're in a dark church, right, I don't want to see all this distract, the distracting elements. We want to blow everything out. We want the subject to be the point of focus. Uh, here you go. Here. So now I'm going to be here in the center aisle, okay? And I, in my bag, I don't know if we can get a camera over here. This would either be in my bag or on, a, on, a, uh, on the pew. I've got my 7200 sitting in the bag laid a certain way. So I've got uh, a red dot so that I can grab this lens and just go right to my camera with it. So come on in here. So it's in my bag now because of the types of chairs we have. If we were on a pew, uh, the lens would be out here sitting on the pew, right? But the kind of chairs we have, I just leave it in my bag. And you can see here, the red dot is right there, so that when I come in and grab this lens, and let me show you this, I'm going to take this lens off, put it down, grab this, right in, and switch. So I'm not fumbling with my glass while the bride's coming down, because I am changing lenses while the bride is coming down, and then it just goes right back there. So, in the spirit of that, let's get Chris back up. She's been patiently well, waiting. First, yeah. we would set it up with our second shooter posing as the bride so that we can get settings sure, dialed in on Sure, you're exactly face. right. I'm sorry. So, we took a test shot, so Taylor's settings are dialed in. Now, of course, we're shooting aperture priority, but we can just as easily go into manual mode. But we're dialed in before the groom ever gets there. Same for me. So, now my second shooter would come here, play model for me, and I already know the settings here, so let me take this. When I go here, because of the light in this room, Taylor is going to be underexposed. So she's going to be dark in the frame. So now what I can do, sure, I can go, hey, I'll take care of this in post-production, something like that, but that's not where I want to take it. So now, because I'm in aperture priority, I'm going to go plus one on exposure. Okay, and I'm going to take that same shot, and now she's going to be properly exposed. Okay, that's in aperture priority. So I'm taking one or two test shots, and now I've got better exposure there, okay? Aperture priority. That's how I shoot all day long. Very, very efficient way of shooting. So now I'm dialed in. I know that shooting down this way, I've got to be at about plus one to compensate for the light coming in. So now let's work with uh, you guys, okay? So Lynn, let's get you up here first, right? Chris, you would still be waiting in the bride's ready room, patiently waiting. All right. What's up, baby? You ready for today? All right. Let's get you up here. Taylor, why don't you shoot this part of it uh, with your camera, or with this one, sorry, tethered. Yeah, just put that there. Thank you. And Lynn, let's make this as real as possible. So Lynn, what I want you to do is sometimes the grooms will come in from the back, so they'll come in from here. So Lynn, let's bring you over here. Right, the groom will either come out from the groom's ready room or the groom's going to come out from the back of the church sometimes, it just depends, and walk down the aisle. So t what you're going to do is you're going to walk up, um, and uh, I'll play the priest. I'll, I'll, no, I don't want to be in it. Let, let Lynn go. <laughs> Where is our priest, by the way? I thought we were getting uh, Father Veronakis to play priest today. <laughs> oh, George, I'm very disappointed uh, uh, about you today. All right, so you playing, you're, you're playing the best man. You're the priest today. Yes, okay. Well, today, um, for this case, uh, in this act, you will walk down with him as his best man. So come on behind him. Aaron, welcome back, buddy. Good to see you. All right, so here's what I want you to do. Uh, you two just walk up like you would on your normal wedding day and go, and go, to, your, and go to your spots. Aaron, you, might, you would probably be in front, okay? So you're going to walk this way and go up to the front of the altar. Go for it, guys. And Taylor's shooting them as they're walking down. Right? No, Aaron, you would stay there first. Okay. Right. And the reason is, now every, every denomination is different how they handle that, but typically Aaron is going to be there, okay, because he's going to come down and grab one of the bridesmaids. And then he, they're going to come back and walk. And then subsequently the groom will eventually be the last one there waiting for the uh, bride to come down. So, did you get some of those photographs? Of them walking, yes. Let's see, let's see some of these come up. Did we, get, did we get anything of Lynn or anything of Aaron then Lynn, sta staggering it? While they were walking, just... Yeah, so as they're looking down, mm -hmm. the shot we would take, right, you guys are looking at me, 
All right, we want some details for the album. See some of these come up. Okay, this is definitely a must-have shot in, in for our studio. Something like that, right? Where Aaron's looking down, right? We're showing this layering of all the groomsmen. So if you've got five, six, seven groomsmen, that becomes a very, very powerful shot, kind of a chest-up shot. Everybody's looking down, and you see uh, all of those images. So that becomes very, very powerful. Okay, so now, questions about this, just this part of it. We good? All right, so now, Chris, I need you up. And Chris, we are going to start you right here. Do, you have any, do we have flowers for Chris or no? Yes. Well, Chris, you're going to be right here. Where's my bridesmaids? Do we have bridesmaids? Everybody's trying to stay warm. <laughs> Perfect. It's your beautiful bouquet. All right, so I'm going to back you up because now we got bridesmaids here. They're going to come down one at a time. Where's my bridesmaids? Put your pretty flowers. Tuck in your strap. <laughs> All right, so everybody out there, where's my, where am I? All right, everybody out there, here's what I want you to uh, think about. How many of you have had challenges where your bridesmaids do a freaking sprint down the aisle and you can't get the shot, right? They're off to the races. That is your fault that they're off to the races. You have got to control your environment. So listen to what I'm going to say to my bridesmaids. Ladies, before you come down the aisle, okay, do me a favor. We're not using any flash photography here. So when you see me step into the aisle to photograph you, just slow down. Don't stop walking, okay? Smile for me as you're coming down. And when I step back into my seat, take off for the races as you want. All right? That is the coaching and direction that I give them so that, once again, I'm in control of the event. I'm establishing myself as an expert. You don't have to be cocky about it. You don't have to be arrogant about it. You just have to be in control. And it's just a little tip. Ladies, don't come sprinting down the aisle. Does that mean they will stop sprinting down the aisle? No, they still don't listen. Um, and sometimes I have to go to make them slow down, uh, especially if it's in an extremely low-lit situation. But nonetheless, I have done my job in communicating to them. So I'd rather communicate, control the situation uh, than not. All right, so what we probably want to do is get you all in a single line, okay? I don't care who comes, who comes down first. Who's the, who's the official maid of honor? You, then you're going to be last if you're the maid of honor. All right. Yes, yes. All right. Tuck in your strap for me. Now, typically, there should be a church lady back here doing this, but sometimes if I have to step in, uh, I'm, I bustle a mean dress. Uh, I've had to pin boot and ears. Uh, I, you know, I do whatever I have to do for my couple to keep them going. And again, that makes me more the trusted advisor. All right. So, ladies, one at a time. And somebody will just, Taylor will just wave to you because Taylor is now photographing uh, when we want you to come down. So, here we go. I'm going to take my camera. Now, this whole time, my second shooter my second shooter is photographing the groom, the parents, because guess who's going to come down first? Grandma. Okay, if they've got grandparents, grandparents are coming. Here's the thing. Once my second shooter has to know once anybody passes me, I'm done with them. I've handed them off. I will not turn around to take a shot of something going on behind me. My job is to focus forward. So as the primary shooter, I'm just looking forward. My secondary shooter is handling everything behind me and to her. So if, if grandma comes down here and is sitting down here or mom's sitting down here looking down, I'm not going to turn around and take that shot because there's a risk I may miss what's going on right in front of me. Stay focused, stay on your assignment. My assignment as a primary shooter is what's going on here. My secondary shooter's assignment is to handle everything else going on behind me. You guys with me? Okay, so that being said, ladies, let's start our little, uh, little processional here. Come on down. So I'm gonna again take a wide shot here. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, I'm just firing off, and I'm waiting for her to get closer. Keep going. Okay, hold on. Whoa, everybody's coming now. 
Good, keep coming. So I'm using that 1635. Go ahead on through, slow down. <laughs> Off to the races. Good, come on through. Okay, and so what I did there, don't come yet. What I did there is I'm taking a plethora of shots. We'll see those as they queue up. You're seeing a wide shot, and then I'm going horizontal, and I'm taking a horizontal shot as they get a little bit closer uh, in, th in that frame. And so I'm just photographing them as they come through that frame. I'm not switching lenses for my bridesmaids. 99% of my clients will not add these images to their album, okay? Because that's not what they want to waste their pages on. But I still have to photograph them. And so I'm not just taking one shot and hoping I got it. Somebody could be blinking. It could be a little soft. I'm taking a multitude of shots, okay? Also notice, you didn't hear me just go and fire off a bunch of shots, okay? What I'm doing is focus pop, focus pop, focus pop. You with me? I'm not in AI servo mode, right? That makes a lot of mistakes on, on the camera. I've, I've taken more soft pictures using that, that mode than anything else. So it's focus pop. If you're doing back focusing on your camera, you are going to struggle getting some of these images. Because by the time you back focus and fire, they've already moved through, through your focus point. So focus fire. Yeah. Focus. Never do back button focus. I, I don't like it at all. Okay. It's a moving subject. <laughs> by the time you hit the, by the time it focuses and you fire, that nanosecond, they're uh, they're going to be soft, guaranteed, right? Now, if it's a still subject, sure, but they're moving down this aisle. Focus fire, focus fire, focus fire. You with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now, as my bride is coming down, I want to do a couple of things here. I want to go vertical. Here's the one shot I must have of my bride. What will happen is the doors will open in the church, okay? Dad might be standing next to her. Sometimes grandma's walking her down, mom's walking her down. Multitude of scenarios that could happen with. with. So as, she's, as those doors open, I am vertical. I need that shot. I'm going to take that twice. I'm immediately going to come down, switch my lens. She's probably going to start walking towards me. Come on down. You're happy. Okay, I'm going to switch again as she's coming down. Keep coming through. Don't trip. Okay, and I'm going to take all those shots. You're, you're good for now. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch again. I'm going to go back to my 1635, and I'm going to get this handoff that's going to happen here. Can we show a uh, sprinkling of the images that were wide, tight, uh, and all the different lenses as she came through? So here's what we're going to do now. I hope that makes sense. And show me the big wide shot, too, in there. There were three different lenses I used for her coming down the aisle. And then I went back to uh, the fourth. Those are the ones, right, that we're going to use to tell the story uh, of her coming down the aisle. Okay? So look at all the different looks we have, right? And of course, these are raw, they're right at a camera. We're dealing with no uh, doors closed. We got light coming in, so she's being backlit. Those images, and we'll edit these tomorrow, those are the images I need to tell the story of her coming down the aisle. But look at all the different looks we got. Does that make sense? What are, what are your thoughts? I want that 16 to 35. You want that 16 to 35 <laughs> lens? Yeah. Okay. Good, good. Everybody good? Yeah. Uh, should I take some questions? It's up to you. Do you, do you want to take a few? Yeah, I'd like to take a few. All right. Um, there's a question from KL Photo Design. Do you stand in the aisle just like that, or do you peek out into the aisle more when the bride is walking down? I stand in the aisle just like that. As I'm taking these questions, I want to reset everybody. We're going to do this real time. So you guys get back there. I want everybody to see how we accomplish this real time. And you girls probably need to not be right behind each other. Don't, the next girl shouldn't come until this girl hits here. It's That's obviously how your first time. Yeah. It's your first time being a stand-in bridesmaid. <laughs> So, yes, I step right into the aisle, and I step right back into my seat. I step right into the aisle, I step right back into my seat. Yes? So, a lot of folks are asking, what if there's only one of you and you have no second shooter in this scenario? Then you do have to be on a pivot. I mean, you've got to turn around, 
forward, turn around forward. I think you're going to miss some stuff. I think you need to work second shooters into your package. Um, but we, where, we, would you be standing in that same spot? I would stand in my same okay. spot for sure. Okay. But you better be aware of what's going on behind you so your head needs to be pivoting nonstop, looking front and back to make sure you're not missing anything. Okay, so there are about 30 questions about focusing. So we <laughs> talked about focusing before, but can we just go over it again? Um, so, do you use automatic or manual focus? What does focus fire mean? Um, do you use focus or release button to focus? What AF are you using? Okay, all good questions. Um, wow, what was the first one? No manual focus. Holy cow, no way. Those days are over. I'm not using manual focus unless I want to take a lot of blurry artistic pictures. Um, I'm using the focusing system that is built into the camera. Uh, thank you, Canon. Thank you, Nikon. So, I'm using that focusing system. Um, focus fire means, if, uh, if we can get a close-up on my hands uh, at all, basically the cameras are set up with the possibility of using the back button focus, meaning you can hit this button back here and that will get the camera to focus using autofocus, then I use my finger to fire. The problem is by the time you get the camera to focus by pushing back here and then fire by pushing the front button, the, your subject has moved through your frame. That's a problem. Instead, what I do is my ca every camera has its own way of setting this up, so you're going to have to look at your manual. Uh, I'm using the default, which is right out of the box, which is the same button that focuses is the same button that fires the camera. So when I'm saying focus, fire, it's focus, fire, focus, fire. Now, you know, and I don't know if you can hear that, so hopefully that makes sense. Uh, when we talk about modes uh, on your camera, there is a drive mode. And the drive modes are single shot, burst shot, and then uh, AI servo, which means it's tracking the subject as they're moving. So the focus is constantly trying to keep up with your subject. I have produced uh, really bad results by doing that. So I don't use that mode. I use single shot mode to get those, those shots. Okay, Daniel Farajun, Cupcake Photo, Cup, Cupcake Photo, My Personal Photographer Studios, and Matthew asked, what about multiple cameras? Wouldn't it be better to work with two cameras in spite of being constantly changing the lens? So why not two bodies? Yes, save on time that would be lenses? ideal. Until I get sponsored by Canon, I am not <laughs> going to be able to do that. My, uh, I use a Canon 1DX, and the price point on that is $7,000. So for me to have, just for the ceremony, which is where I'm switching lenses the most, to have $14,000 worth of body just sitting there. Well, and it uh, has to be a grid body because you have to have the dual card slides. I got to be able to produce the slideshow. Slide right, I have to be able to produce that slideshow. So, yes, two cameras would be ideal. Uh, Canon, I can give you my address. Just drop like five <laughs> cameras on my doorstep. Love you guys. Yes. All right. So for those, if you are changing lenses, uh, do you carry around a bag? Do you carry around? No, what it's sitting out the way we were showing out, you. Like you yeah. Said, okay. And typically, it's right on that pew. I don't want a bag because then I'm fumbling with my with my bag. Can we go? Yeah, so, because uh, normally I'm fumbling with my uh, bag. I don't want to fumble with my equipment. You're seeing, bump out of there, Taylor, how quickly, and we're going to do this in real time now. I'm taking this lens off, and I know that my lens is here in such a way that I can just grab it like a doctor grabs a scalpel and go right into the body with it because of the red dot. That's what that red dot's for on the lens. Uh, that's where it connects to the camera body. So I know that I can come down with this, reach over, come right in, okay, and twist, and I'm ready to go. And that's why I do it that way. If I had to go in my bag, I guarantee you if we had like a quick draw contest, you'd be dead uh, because uh, you'd be still fumbling with your bag, all right? Am I not allowed to say that? You got the Wild West going on. It's the Wild West of photography right now. All right. Yeah, it looks like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one more quick question for you. When you're going in the aisles, Aren't there all these people sitting there? Like yes, that's else? why I've got my bag here. So yeah, whenever we first get to the church, we set up our bag here so that we're taking up that whole pew typically so that no one sits there. Uh, right. Yeah, or if there's no entry into the pew except from the aisle, we take up the whole pew. Okay. If not, we don't want to hijack the entire right. church. Um, they can come in through the outside, but we're taking at least three seats wide mm -hmm. so that my equipment is there so that I have a space to step and step back out step in step out right you've got to be able to do that don't feel like you're inconveniencing anyone that's what you're there for mm -hmm. if you don't do that then you run the risk of having no place to step and now as your bride is coming through you're on somebody's lap and you're trying to get out of the way you don't want to do that so have your space we have never had a problem with anyone complaining great thank you all right so what i want to do 
is I want to do this real time. So you get on up there. Okay? Now, a typical church scenario, the next group wouldn't come until the first group hits here. Okay? Uh, so what we're going to do, where's my groom? Let's have the groom and the best man walk up. Yeah, come on up, guys. All right, Taylor's shooting that. And now I'm just waiting. So now, right, the groom and, and the best man are there. Well, you're the priest now. Now you've stepped in, Aaron, to play the priest. <laughs> Uh, here's all our groomsmen coming down with the, with the dates. And this can work either way. The groomsmen can come down with the uh, uh, bridesmaids, or the groomsmen can come from behind me and meet the bridesmaids. Either way, it doesn't matter, right? We're just going to adapt to what's going on. We know what we've got to get. So, in the spirit of that, let's go with this, all right? So as soon as you hear that first frame, come on down, guys. Again, I'm using my 1635, getting my shots. Good job. Next group's going to start coming. I'm not switching lenses for this. I just need those shots to have my butt covered so they can see all the great people they've walked down. Okay, next person's going to come down. I'm wide. I step in. I go horizontal. Good job. Okay, so now what will happen is all my bridesmaids are up here. All the groomsmen are up here. And now the priest will say, please rise. Okay? Different music will typically stop playing or start playing. The doors will open. Again, it doesn't. Don't discount everything I'm teaching you because you shoot Indian weddings. You shoot Asian weddings. It doesn't matter. The concept of what I'm teaching you is the same. Take your shooting style and plug it into our framework, and I promise you it's going to work. Now, you're not seeing images come off Taylor's camera, but she's photographing everything going on behind me. I've never looked back once. That, my second shooter has to cover anything going on back there. A candle being lit, anything like that. Candid moments where the groom maybe makes eye contact with his mom and dad, right? Where he gives him a little smile. That's the job of my second shooter. So that person who asked the question, you know, what if you're just a single shooter? You're gonna miss that. There's no way you're gonna get that shot unless you're just damn lucky. And so that's why you need that shooter back there. Build it into your packages, build it into your pricing, and get him there. So now my bride comes down. And remember, you're going to walk slowly, right? I'm going to do this in somewhat real time. So here we go. I got my big wide shot, one or two, lens down. Okay, I'm switching in. Boom. Now I'm horizontal. I want some tighter shots. Good. Boom. It's coming off. I want my 35 millimeter. Keep coming. She's happy. Don't trip. Okay, boom. I'm coming down. I now got my 1635 on. I'm stepping into the aisle right behind her. I'm taking that shot, I'm going to duck down, and now these are the shots that I'm producing. That was all done near real time. This is a pretty short, short run for her to come in at me, and you're seeing a plethora of shots with three or four different lenses. I didn't fumble once with my glass, and I went through four different focal, focal lengths uh, on that. Thoughts? Just from the group. I, you're about, Lisa's like, yes, Master so you Sal, thank you. You went 1635, 70 to 200. What was your third one? 35 millimeter or 50 millimeter. Okay, and then you went At 1.2 or 1.4. I want that bokeh. I don't want to see the guest behind her in focus. That's not what I'm looking for. So I've got this big dramatic shot, right? Maybe this room doesn't lend to that. But if we're in a typical church, the back behind her is just going to be gorgeous, right? Stained glass window, maybe, things like that. So I get this big 1635 shot once or twice. She starts coming down. I come, I come and put my 7200 on. You can see that picture on the screen. That's my 7200. Then she gets really close to me. I can throw a 35 millimeter on. One four, one two. Yep, some of them are going to be blurry. I'm okay with that. I'm just looking to grab one frame that's not. And when you, when you look at it in context, we've got everything that we need. Now she comes by. Okay, I go back to my 1635 for the handoff. That's the picture on the screen that you're seeing in the bottom right-hand corner. And I'm ducking down so that I'm not in the way of my second shooter. So I start walking down the aisle with my 1635. I get down on one knee, and I let my second shooter fire in uh, and capture the handoff as well. So the handoff's now covered from my perspective and my second shooter's perspective. And we've got maximum coverage. Did you think that was smooth? Okay. So, that being said, I'm going to rush through this part because I want to get you to some ceremony pictures. And this, is, this has been good. It's just going longer than I thought it would. Um, so, you guys are holding hands. 
Aaron, the good news for you is I'm not expecting you to give an actual uh, ceremony here, right? <laughs> Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today. Um, so this might be your typical setup, right? So what am I looking to shoot here? So there's one shot I have to have. It's a wide shot. Again, I'm thinking about the album. So I'm going to take this shot. Make sure I like it. Then I'm going to come in, and I'm probably going to switch lenses. My second shooter is rolling around the perimeter. We've already talked about hand signals. And I'm going to come around here. Not only do I need that wide shot, but I also need a tighter shot. And I'm going to take a couple of different shots. Hands. Okay, let's do this. Because I'm overexposing a little. Let's do hands. And I'm having to bump up to ISO 3200. And that's pretty typical in a church. I'm then going to get them looking and smiling at each other. I'm then going to go vertical. And I'm just going to roll through these just to give you an idea of what is a must-have shot. Good. And then I'm going to go off to the side. And these, to me, are those must-have shots, right? And Aaron's looking at, at her. He's smiling. I'm looking for the reaction. I'm sorry, Lynn is. Aaron better not be looking at the bride. <laughs> Dirty priest. All right. And then I'm going to come over here to the side. Watch the cord, baby. And then I know I need pictures of, all right, Chris looking at Lynn. I'm thinking of the album. And so you're seeing the diversity we're looking to get. The biggest mistake I've seen photographers make is they overshoot the ceremony. There's only so many ceremony pictures that are going to end up in the album, okay? And now... That's how we do the first kiss. Yeah, yeah, that's where we're going. So now, I may just sit down. I'm not going to overshoot the church where it's just like... Ch -ch 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 -ch. Dude, they're looking at each other. How many, nobody knows what the priest is saying in your photograph. If you got, got the pictures of them looking at each other, you're done. You only need so many of those pictures. Get the family members. So come up on the perimeter, shoot into the family members. Now we're going to go to the first kiss. Here's where it matters. I'm going to be with my 7200. Taylor or your second shooter, she's going to be vertical with a 1635. So Taylor's job, use this camera so we can show them. So Taylor's looking to get, this is the must-have shot. Now, for everybody following along, these are going to happen in parallel, okay? So you guys give each other a kiss and hold it, okay? Let's bring one of those up, switch again. So that is Taylor's must-have shot, right? That is going to be combined. Remember, these are being shot at the same time. So my second shooter would be here, and it's not uncommon for me to be here over her shoulder. Guys, kiss each other again. and me get th this shot. So now we are shooting in parallel, and I don't know if we can bring those pictures up side by side. Those are the shots we're getting, and can we bring all of them up? The big wide one? There we go. You start showing your bride and groom shots like that, you are giving them diversity. What point does it make to have your second shooter off at some random angle getting something that they're not going to use? So make sure you're checking the program and when things are happening so that you can keep track of when the first kiss is going to be and you can be at the same spot at the same time. Yeah. We go, go ahead. Can I ask about the ring exchange? Yeah. How do you handle the ring exchange? Same way. What would be different in your opinion? Do you do close-ups of the hands or anything like that? Do you move closer so that you're just showing hands? No, you're like going to get in the way. You're going to be in everybody's uh, shot. You're going to be obnoxious. And just get right where we are, which is where my bag is. We don't move past our I bag. never go past my bag. So I'm always right here. And that, with a 7200, that gives me enough of what I need. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I'd love to have this tight, wonderful hand shot, but not at the risk of disrupting the guests. Because we get a lot of compliments from our guests on... Hey, guys, we love the fact... We didn't even know you were there. We didn't even know you were there. And they absolutely love it. So, that being said, I think this is a natural time for a break. Because when we come back, what we'll do are start going into what we call the creatives. And we'll start in here.
And we're going to do a couple of things, everybody. We're going to start in here, and we're going to do the family portraits at the altar. Okay? We're going to show you the lighting for that. We're going to go outside and do the creative pictures. Um, right? Let me make sure I'm saying the right thing. That's what's next, I hope. Yes. So are you checking your Facebook messages? Yeah, I'm checking Facebook. I want to make sure I was saying the right thing to everybody. So, yes, on Facebook, we're good to go. All right, so what we're going to do when we come back is we are going to do the um, altar pictures, which are a little more traditional, those family pictures. We'll talk about lighting, how we light that, what our settings are, and how I train my second shooters. And this is really key because I honestly don't know hardly anything about flash. I'm not comfortable with it. I don't know anything about off-camera flash, but Sal has a system to where I know exactly what settings my flash and everything need to be at so I can go and replicate exactly what he does. Right. So if I can do it, you can definitely do it. <laughs> we can all do it. So, and that, that's it. You all want right. to take a couple of questions or you just want to hit break? Well, we have so many questions, so it's, so up, to, it's up to uh, you. Give me, give me a couple. I think we're doing good. Okay, okay. Can I first just say that you, I just, this is incredible for me. You especially saying that a lot of photographers overshoot during the ceremony. That's totally me. And I overshoot and I will actually miss the moments because I'm just. I You're all over the place. Yeah, You're over. not anticipating. Nope. That's, the, that's the word. You've got to, we know what moments are going to end up in the album. And it's not all those random things. Random. It's key moments. So we try to make sure the team is in the right space with communication. Random yeah. moments right here. <laughs> so I'm going to see, Susan. I'm going to put you, I'm going to test you right now. Uh-oh. What am I saying? You're saying C. Eyes, the bride. Yeah, me. You're covering the bride. Yep. You got it, baby. <laughs> you got it. You got it. You got it. Right. Sue, you can come out, you can come out and second shoot for me anytime. <laughs> nice Sal. Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to, especially after this workshop. All right, quick question about the um, where did it go? The question was, do you tell the the parties to not look at the floor when they're walking down? Do you we, do you give any instruction to them? Yes, when I went into that back the back room. Right and coach them not to sprint down the aisle, I tell them, hey, when I step in, make sure you got your best smile on. Uh, because a lot of them are focused. They're walking in heels. They've never been, a lot of girls, maybe they don't wear heels. They don't know how to walk in heels. Uh, and they are very cautious about the way they're walking. So you'll have bridesmaids just looking down at the ground. So I try to, but of course, you're going to have that bridesmaid who's just looking off in la-la land, and we get a bad picture of her. But I'm okay, because again, that part of the day is very much photojournalistic. I did see a question. I'm not sure who asked it. Do you, do you want them to look at you, or do you want them to look straight down the aisle? No, I want to be invisible to them, so okay. I don't care where don't they look. look. The I don't tell them to look at me. Uh, if they make eye contact with me, that's fine. And I have brides that are so camera aware that when they're on the altar and we're off on the side, they'll look at us and they'll be like, smiling. <laughs> I'm like, that's money, man. I'll take that shot. But, uh, you know, it, it just depends on your bride and groom. Okay, so we'll take one more question before we go to break. Let's do okay. it. Okay. L.A. Photog had asked, what, what are the must-have shots and the must-have lens um, when, peop, when the aisle is not this long? A lot of people are saying the churches are smaller, so if you have less time, you, you don't have time to switch lenses out, or you, know, you just have time for like two shots. I'd probably stick with the 1635 and zoom it all the way out and then zoom it in. For yeah, or 2470 will yeah. probably be a better lens. 1635, you're going to get some distortion. Some people hate the distortion you get. Some people love the distortion you get. Uh, so I would say the better lens, if you're in a really short church, is to go with that 2470. But man, I'm telling you, you've got to. I still have been in very small ch churches and switch lenses because when those doors open for the bride, she's not immediately coming down. So when those doors open, you can get that big dramatic shot. And you just and need one. You just need one, right? Yeah. Don't overthink it. Don't overshoot it. Get that one must-have shot. Of the, of the architecture, switch lenses, go to your 2470, go to your 50 millimeter. I think that's the way to do it. All right, great. So everyone, we're gonna take a 20 minute break and a small request over break is that during our lunch later today, we're actually going to be doing an audience choice rewatch from one of the, either the first or the second days of this workshop. So we're gonna have a little bit of a long lunch. So if you go to our Facebook page, there is a spot where you can vote that's pinned to the top. It's going to be a short voting period to see what you want just during this over this break. So go on over there and let us know what the audience choice rewatch of Sal's workshop is going to be. I wonder what they're going to pick. I know what they should pick. <laughs> don't should influence. Be... Don't influence. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I am so buying this course. I don't know what to say. I just shot a wedding a couple weeks ago, and I've taken some other wedding photography workshops here at Creative Live, but this one for me, 
Honestly, the things that I've just learned right now, I wish I had known two weeks ago. Yeah, this is where I think a lot of photographers panic. And that's why I hopefully, guys out there, please let us know if you're loving the way we're teaching this because I had to make some changes uh, based on the feedback we were getting. And I wanted you to be in my head, not necessarily turn it into this technical uh, discussion, but just understanding what you have to get, why we're doing it, where staff is, how to communicate, and I hope that's helping people. You know what is worth $149 is the shot list that Sal is giving you right now. He's not only giving you a shot list, but he's actually giving you the visual photos of the shot list, which is, that's how we work as photographers, we're visual. So that is worth $149, and everyone, the time is running out. You have until tomorrow to purchase the course and save money. Save $100 and purchase the course right now. And we'll see you guys back here in 20 minutes. Welcome back, everyone, to our wedding ceremony here with Sal and Taylor Sincata. Before we hand it back over to them, we're going to give away our first prize of the day. Okay, this is a great prize. I would love to win this one. This is an On One Perfect Photo Suite 7. And Sal, tell us a little bit about the Photo Suite 7. Yeah, Photo Suite 7 is a huge improvement in the On One uh, editing suite. I'm a big user of On One. My editing team are big users of On One. We love their tools. It's all in one. You can control focus, you can control uh, all sorts of creative edits. And uh, Seven just came out, so it's brand new. And uh, the best part of all is you don't need to work within the Photoshop environment. So you don't need to know anything about Photoshop. This works totally uh, on its, as a standalone product. So I, I think people will love it. Very cool. We'll okay. demo it tomorrow. What's that? Oh, we'll awesome. demo it tomorrow. Perfect. Okay, the winner is Elizabeth Kennedy. And she participated on Facebook. And the quote was, if you're going to be a wedding photographer, you've got to get rid of the junky glass. Yes. yes. That's a true statement. It is yeah. a true statement. True so story. congratulations to Elizabeth, and thank you again to On One. And just a reminder, everyone, we'll give away more prizes later today. And if you go to the Creative Live blog, blog it explains everything there, creativelive.com slash blog. So keep tweeting and Facebooking away your favorite quotes and tips. So, Sal, we just we were talking over break. We had a couple of outstanding questions that we wanted to address right away for folks online. And 
The first one was about a backup camera. So you explained that you don't have, a, you don't shoot with two cameras, but do you have a backup in case something goes wrong? Yeah, yeah. The lounge was like freaking out. He's running a million dollar studio. He can't afford two cameras. Yes, yes. We can afford multiple cameras. Uh, we probably have eight different bodies uh, in our studio. But what I cannot afford to do uh, is tie up two 1DXs. Uh, just to get the ceremony. So instead, we have backup cameras. Uh, my backup is a 1DS, but you've got to remember why I'm using one camera. I'm building a slideshow that night. So I don't want to have to download cards from multiple cameras when I'm building the slideshow. And we'll show you how we build the slideshow later today, but it's very important that those images are coming off one card to allow me to be very, very, again, efficient. So we definitely have multiple bodies. Cool. And the other question that had come up, I know we talked about walkie-talkies, but would you guys consider using headsets? Or? No. No headsets, no walkie-talkies. It defeats the entire purpose. We want to be invisible ninjas, as the lounge has uh, referred to us. Uh, we want to be very uh, invisible, if you will. And if I'm talking on a walkie-talkie or a headset, I'm not invisible any longer. Guests can hear us speak. And so hand signals are a conscious decision we made. Of course, we can go out and buy headsets or walkie-talkies or any of those items. But I'm telling you what, if you want to be uh, unobtrusive to your guests, the best way to do it is Im implement these hand signals. It can't be easier. couldn't be and easier. And just a, a follow-up on that, because folks had asked, what about if you are working with your video team, or what if you have three shooters? Right. How do you communicate them? Is it's the, it the same, same way, because the okay. whole team understands what's going on, so we're all in sync. It is truly like a football team on the field. Everybody's watching the quarterback to look for instructions, look for signals. Everybody's been trained. They're following our system. That's the key here. Uh, I know we keep talking about this being a system, being a blu blueprint. I'm not necessarily trying to show you how to shoot. There's plenty of seminars how to shoot. I'm trying to show you how to make money uh, using your shooting style, plugging into our system. And so this is something where we've got multiple teams uh, working together, and everybody's on the same page, so it works. And it's easy. I could grab any of these girls here, throw them into our system, and in less than 10 minutes, they're going to understand the entire process. You, you coming, Lisa? You there? He's like, I'm coming. I'm nice. coming out to St. Louis. So I hope that makes sense. That's great. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Well, cool. We ready? We're ready. Uh, I want to point everything out. You might notice that I'm wearing sneakers now. Um, for women out there, I wear dressy black flats for the ceremony and the reception. The other parts of the day when they're getting ready and when we go and do all the creative shots, I actually just put on flip-flops. Because I'm running around like crazy, and I, uh, let's be honest, my feet are going to be killing me by the end of the day. So just switching out for those uh, parts of the day really helps. So I just want you to know I forgot my black flats at home, which is why I'm wearing my uber trendy running sneakers. So <laughs> let me see if I, if I got this right. Yesterday, you were walking around barefoot with polka dot socks. <laughs> uh, and today, we've got bright gold yellow sneakers on. Can I keep you, you guessing? Correct. Keep she's you guessing. She's keeping us guessing. Tomorrow there's no town. She's walking around with Crocs on. I don't know. <laughs> and so just a reminder to folks, is this what you would wear, both of you, to a ceremony? Not me. Okay. Uh, I would be in black dress pants yep. uh, and probably a, a gray top, a, a muted color top. Of okay. course, if, if it's cold, I might have my black jacket on, right? So these are kind of standard issue for our team. We all have embroidered jackets so that everybody there knows that we are the photographers uh, and there's no misunderstanding who's with who. If you just dress in black, there's a good chance you're going to get confused with other people, with the video team. I don't want the video, if the video team's not mine, I definitely don't want them being confused with my staff. So my entire team gets uh, branded jackets so that we're, we're all in sync on that. So yeah, black dress pants, sh nice shoes, uh, and a dress shirt. No tie for me, uh, none of that stuff. You've seen I'm laying on the floor, I'm running around, I I've got to be comfortable. Same for me. So I've got black slacks on, black or gray, and then I'll have a dressy button down or a dressy sweater. I'm not taking my jacket off because it's freezing in here, uh, <laughs> but that's what I would wear. Yeah. And so uh, just to be clear, the, uh, apparently the key words uh, today are ninja and um, true story. So Sorry. we're going to tell you a true story about a ninja, <laughs> I guess, and uh, drink up in that lounge, all right? So I'm on to you guys. So, all right, that being said, let's get serious now. We are here, right? Now we're talking about the... Uh, ceremony and the pictures at the altar and this is where I think again panic is struck into the heart uh, of photographers especially if you're in that mid or newbie range you know if you want better pictures I'm again gonna teach you the same way we teach our second shooters so anyone who comes to work for our team I'm not looking for you to put your flash in manual mode uh, be, pull out your light meter uh, get your ratios down, your light fall off down, oh my God, I, my head wants to explode. It's got to be quick, easy, efficient. So, 
Get your flashes out, get your cameras out, and practice along with us. I don't care if you're taking a picture of a soda can sitting on your counter, you're going to see that this absolutely does work. And we run through this part of the day in about 20, maybe 30 minutes, the family formals just by themselves, because it's the most painful part of the day. No one likes to do those pictures, but they know they have to, so don't make it more painful than it has to be. And, and that's a good point, right? First of all, because of our style of photography, again, if you look at our website and you see our style of work, we don't have a lot of uh, family formals in the album. That's not why our clients are coming to us. But they still want them. They want them for 8x10s, right, as gifts for their family after the wedding. So we still have got, got to be diligent about grabbing these images. Now, I also don't want it to look like, you ever see those pictures with flash? And it looks like there's just basically a flashlight firing on the person. Um, and then everything's black behind them. There's no ambient light coming in. That is, again, not understanding your flash, not understanding uh, the, the, the process. So we're going to break it down. Uh, and again, just simplify it because this is how we train our shooters. So get your flashes out. The first thing we're going to do is when I'm shooting family pictures at the altar, my, I go to my 2470. That is the lens I want to use for the family pictures. I then uh, set my camera in new manual mode so I don't photograph these in aperture priority. I photograph these in manual mode. I drop to ISO 800. Uh, aperture is 5.6. And then I will typically be at a 40th, a 60th, or an 80th of a second. What I'm doing here is dragging the shutter. And what that means in English, okay, is your camera sync speed, we've all heard that word, is usually at about 200th or 250th of a second. Meaning the flash is firing at that pace to ensure that as the shutter, first curtain goes up, second curtain comes up, all right, in between there somewhere it's getting that flash. Well, if you photograph at 200th of a second, 250th of a second, okay, it's going to look like they are in just in a black closet and they have a flashlight uh, shining on them. That's because no ambient light is getting through. You're overpowering that ambient light in the room. And that's that yellow warm light. That's the ambient light. So we need to slow down our shutter speed, drag the shutter. So I'm going to drag it to about a 60th of a second. Those are my starting points every single event. That's where I start. That doesn't mean what, that's what it's going to be. But 90% of the time, I'm spot on. Rarely do I have to make any further adjustment. So let's, right, let's revisit this. Camera, ISO 800, 2470 lens for the family portraits, right? Not a 1635. It's going to start skewing things on the corner. Nobody wants family portraits where things are just weird uh, looking because of the, the lens apparition and the, and the skew on the lens. I've got my ISO at 5.6, 60th of a second, manual mode. At home, put your cameras in that now. Test this. We are shooting an ETTL, electronic through the lens. I'm letting the flash and camera determine how much power it needs. Uh, I'm not in manual mode on the flash. I'm going to look up at the ceiling. How tall is the ceiling in the church? If it's a 30, 40 foot ceiling, bouncing light is going to be a challenge. So I'm going to have to look. If it's a dark brown, dark black ceiling, bouncing light is also going to be a challenge. Color matters. There's going to be color cast on all sorts of other issues. Well, I'm looking up here. I want to say maybe that's a 20, 25 foot ceiling, somewhere in that range. And I, it's, uh, it's kind of a brown and a, and a white in color. So I'm going to bounce off, but notice I'm going to pull this little white card out there, okay? This is for your catch light. We want this pulled. Pull this out. This is going to push a little bit of light forward. So I want some light coming forward, and I want some light bouncing from the ceiling. With that being said, if it's, the ceiling is super high, I'm going to go to plus one on my flash. Add more power. Okay? So let's take one shot just in my base settings. Remember, this is how I, I uh, teach my own shooters. So you guys can just hang there. Get close to each other. Aaron, you could bump out for one second. This is a test shot for me. Okay? So right out of the gate, it's Taylor's mean mug right there. <laughs> Right out of the gate, I like the way that looked. Let me go a little wider for them. Okay? So I'm not blowing everything out in there. Um, I'm bouncing that light, and that's giving me kind of what I'm looking for. And you can see my settings there. 60th of a second, 5, 6, ISO 800. That has not even been edited, right? That's just coming right off the camera raw. So I know that this is about where, where I want to be. I can drag this down to a 30th of a second. 
And now you can see I'm letting in a little bit more ambient light. And they are still tack sharp if you want to zoom in on that a little bit. And so don't be afraid. The flash is going to freeze that uh, for them. Okay? That's, that's damn sharp at a 30th of a second. Okay? So you don't be afraid to drop down there. The flash is what's freezing the action. Okay? So that's where I'm going to shoot this. I'm going to stay at a 40th of a second. I don't want to even move forward until everybody un understands the flash part of this. So, ladies, do we all understand what just happened and any questions about that? You made it easy. I made it easy. Thank you very much, because <laughs> that is always my goal. When I'm teaching my second shooters, I don't want... How many of you get nervous, right? As soon as you get into church, you start getting nervous, especially if you're not comfortable with flash. I would say in our industry right now, in the world of everyone's a photographer, and we all got started there some, at some point, all, all that was given... You got a camera, and you shoot natural available light. That's fine. I'm not hating on you. We just have to understand how to make a great image here without making it overly complicated. So I'm using all the features in this camera. I'm telling you what some of those settings are, and I'm telling you, I'm telling you that if you do what I'm telling you to do, match it into your shooting style, you're going to get the images you need, and when you get nervous, you just go back to basics. You don't have to worry about what's going on. You with me? Any questions from the Internet on the flash? Just a question from uh, Picardo. Do you shoot verticals with on-camera flash? I do not shoot vertical in the church. I would shoot vertical with flash. I love the question because here's what we don't do. I've had to uh, tap my second shooters on the side of the head when they do this. So we, I don't know if I can get a camera on me. Here's the worst thing you can do if you go vertical. Yeah, let's do it this way. Where's my flash going? Yeah, I'm going to light up you guys there. And I'm going to create, let's do it for argument's sake. I'm going to create this ridiculous, well, unfortunately, that lighting looks pretty good. Um, <laughs> what would normally happen here is you could see, even on that picture, it's somewhat directional coming in. And that's not what we're looking for. So when you go vertical, okay, you've got to get in the habit of now pivoting this flash up. That's why they made it to turn, right? Turn it up. I can't tell you how many people have come work side by side with me and they still leave the flash there firing it that way. Doesn't work, doesn't make sense. You've always got to go back to where you're reflecting from. So, but for family pictures at the altar, I tend not to shoot vertical because they, I know my clients like them in those 8x10 frames and we're going wider and wider. So family pictures tend to be more about your subject and less about architecture. So I'm gonna, I really don't bring a whole lot of texture into the family portraits at the altar. Any other questions about that? Uh, yes. Well, DZ Photo Boston would like to know if you're using front curtain sync or rear curtain. Um, we're not messing with the curtain sync at all, right? So it's, it's first curtain sync, not second curtain sync. Just leave it by default in, in your camera. Great. Second curtain sync is going to start doing a whole bunch of tricky stuff with your camera. Uh, it's great artistically if you're messing around, but right out of the gate, keep it at your default settings, which is the first curtain. Okay, a uh, question from London Girl to clarify. Why was it that you were setting the flash to plus one? Awesome. So the only reason I would set the flash to plus one is because if the ceiling is super high and I'm using the ceiling to bounce light in, what happens is, this is when we're going to start getting a little bit more mathematical and technical, the further that light has to travel, there's this ratio, there's this fall off. The light's not going to be as powerful when it goes up to the ceiling and starts coming down. So I have to push more light up to get more light to hit my subject. That would be the only reason. Or if the ceiling is a dark color. Right? If the ceiling's black, it's not going to reflect light. So I've got to shoot more light up there to get less light to hit my subject. So I'm looking at what's happening up there above me and what light's hitting my subject. And don't be afraid to take a test shot here. But that's the only time you'd go plus one in this environment. Cool. We have a couple more. That's yeah, right. hit yeah, me. People are asking about brackets. Uh, my personal no bracket. photographer studio, do you use a bracket with flash to avoid shadows behind their heads? No, no brackets. Oh, my gosh. I, that just takes me back to the 1980s. No brackets. Uh, if, if I haven't imparted any knowledge on you at this point in time, it's I want to move and be lean. I want to be quick, efficient, and I don't want to walk around with some contraption uh, on the top of my camera. So absolutely uh, no brackets. I, that's, I've been shooting without a bracket for four years now. Okay, and a question from Forever Photos in Seattle. Why is your ISO at, one, at 800 instead of something lower in this scenario? I could push it to 400, I could push it to 100, but where's that light, right? We all know what ISO is, I hope we do, uh, sensitivity to light. 
So if I come down to 400, down to 200, what has to happen? Flash has to start working harder, okay? And that might be okay, but I don't want to wait on my flash to recycle. So by having that ISO 800, uh, which on the 1DX, ISO 800 is beautiful. Uh, there's not a whole bunch of problems there. And so I can now make the flash work less, which will give me quicker recycle time. So I hope that, that makes sense there. That's a good question. Okay, we'll ask one more. This is from Brenda. Are you using the flash just for catch lights in the eyes? If you can shoot the entire ceremony without it, why are you using it now? Let's take a picture without the flash. So I'm going to go into aperture priority. All right. First of all, without flash, at ISO 800, I'm at a 20th of a second. There's my shot. Let's bring that up. Yeah, it looks absolutely horrible. Let's bump up to ISO 3200, get close together. Now I'm at an 80th of a second at 2.8. So I cannot get to 5.6, and if I've got layers of people, I cannot shoot at 2.8 because then they're going to be blurry. So let's go here, looking right at me. So there's a very big difference between using flash and not using flash. So when I'm using those family portraits, I want them to look a little bit more polished. Uh, I need to have the, um, everybody lit up across the board and in multiple layers. Flash is the only way to do that. So I'm not using it for flashlight. I'm using it to fill and give them a nice warm glow. Now typically they'd be at an altar and there'd be all sorts of altar lights behind them providing that nice warm glow. Yeah. Now when you start getting into the big family coming up, you know, we've all had them where... The fake they, family? The, well, yeah. <laughs> the big family that comes in, are you upping the f-stop? Are you staying at 5.6? No, I'm staying it? at 5.6 for sure. So I'm going to photograph uh, this entire thing at 5.6. I might create two or three layers, but if they get six layers deep, I'm still photographing that at 5.6. But you can go to f8, f11, uh, and your flash is just going to have to work a little bit harder to light all those, those people. But it's not impossible. You're just going to have to slow down your shoot speed because okay. this is going to have to do a full dump. To that point, let's keep moving here. Can I just make a comment before yeah. we move on? Katie Winterflood says, Sal, I have my camera out and I'm photographing my sleeping dog in my dimly lit home office and it looks great. You're a genius. So practice on whatever you have in front of you. It's yeah, awesome. Shoot a can of soda. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and again, when Taylor was learning and she, this is, you know, true story. Um, this is Taylor was sitting there reading this lighting manual and it's talking about ratios and f-stops and light fall off and she threw the we were laying in bed one night and she just threw the book next to me and she's I'm like what's wrong she's like why does this have to be so complicated and you know I started looking at what she was reading and that was when the light bulb went off for me I'm like it really isn't as complicated as they're making it in the book it's just very technical but you can, if you just do what I'm doing, and I'm so happy to hear you're out there practicing it because that's what I want. I set the camera up. I explained the Taylor concept, dragging the shutter, what's doing what. She went downstairs and started taking a picture of a can on our counter just to get the sense of how it all worked. I was more confused when I finished reading the book than when I started. And I learned everything I needed to know after talking with Sal for five minutes. So this is what this is for, for you guys. Uh, don't be upset if you read the books and it doesn't make sense. That's what we're here for and that's what we're doing today. So hopefully this helps and you don't have to read as many books. <laughs> yes. Uh, reading is good, but sometimes, right, it slows us down. And the truth is, like Taylor said, we, we can be more, more confused when we're done reading something. So this process I just showed you is exactly how I train my second shooters. And the light bulb goes off for them immediately. They're like, oh, okay, I get it. And there's rarely a scenario where this won't, won't work. Rarely. Uh, so this will work. So get out there and, uh, and practice. Now, in order to ensure that I continue to get good recycle time, I do have a battery pack. Uh, this battery pack is a Cyclone Bolt. Uh, this is about $300. I definitely encourage you to get something more than the four AA batteries inside your camera because they are not going to recycle quick enough. So if you've been out there photographing weddings and uh, you're, you're, you get like one frame lit, five frames unlit, that's because you're trying to light this with AA batteries. And when it does a full dump, right, meaning it does all full power, comes off this flash, it is going to take forever with four AA batteries to recycle. So that's another reason I'm upping my ISO 
because I want the flash to not work quite as hard. I'm trying to help the flash out. This helps even more. So this battery pack, uh, this is from B&H. It's like I said, it's about 300 bucks. Um, I love this thing. So I just pop this on my hip. All right, it's got a little clip there. Plug it into my flash, and now I'm off to the races. And uh, it's got a little LED panel. I don't know if anybody can see that there. So I can tell how much charge is left on this thing. And you know, you can't feel it uh, because you guys are out there. But the weight on this thing, it is super, super light, and that's what I love about it. I'm not lugging around this big battery pack. Now, that's going to give me better recycle time. That being said, uh, from the lighting perspective, let's talk about the posing here. We've got to be able to pose these groups uh, in order to get what we want, right? And then we're going to deal with some scenarios here. We've got divorced families, right? We've got pe people who don't talk, uh, parents that won't stand next to each other. Uh, what does the shot list look like? Here's what we don't do. We do not take a shot list from the client. You know what I'm talking about, right? Bride at altar. Bride with her dress fanned out with flowers on the edge of her dress. Bride and groom. Bride and groom and little girl. No, 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 stop the madness. We are the professionals. I'm going to control the day. Here's what we have to get. I've got to get the bride and groom alone, the bride and groom with the priest, the bride and groom with their parents, the bride and groom with their siblings, the bride and groom with both sets of parents, the bride and groom out to grandparents, and then maybe one giant family picture. That is my shot list. And I get out of this church in 15 to 20 minutes, and I have never, maybe not never, one time in five years, I've had a client ask for additional shots that maybe we didn't get. But I'll show you how we get around that. So with that being said, can I get my bridal party to sit down? You sit right here. You two are going to stay there. Yeah, you girls sit down. Okay. Slide you a little bit this way. So I want to get them centered. Perfect. Right? Nothing drives me more bonkers than when we take family pictures at the altar and they're off center. Okay? Get them centered. You're, nothing's happening. This isn't photojournalism right now. Get them centered. This is a portrait. Get them the way you want them to be. And so what I'm going to do now, the bride and groom. Uh, here's another thing. This is my, uh, uh, this goes different ways depending on who you talk to. Take your hand out of your pocket. Can we get a, a shot of Lynn? I hate this, by the way. You see Lynn with his hand out of his pocket? I don't like the way that looks. It just, it drives me nuts. Now there's a school of thought where that's how all the groomsmen's hand should be. I like to put the groomsman hand in his pocket. Go for it. And the reason I like it is because it seems and looks and feels more natural. I don't know if you guys caught it. I had to actually tell Lynn to take his hand out of his pocket. Why? Because that's where he wants his hand. I am a guy and naturally my hand is in my pocket all the time. I don't like the thumb in the pocket. Okay? So I don't like the way that looks. I like the thumb out of the pocket. So this tends to look really weird. I like this. I don't want this. That's too casual. I tend to like just this. So that's the way I have my groomsmen stand. That is my personal preference. You figure out your preference. But whatever you do, be consistent. Nothing drives me more bonkers than watching all my groomsmen across a row. One guy's got his hand in his pocket. One guy's jacket's unbuttoned. Next guy's standing there out of the pocket. That looks sloppy. Be consistent. Whatever your formula is, make it work. All right. So where's her flowers? All right. So here we go. So what we're going to do is you two, and this is exactly how I would talk to my couple, you two are not going to move. All right. Everybody's going to move around you. So the two of you will stand there. I want you to hold your bouquet right here up in front. Um, yeah. How about, yeah, stand like that. I like that. Maybe you put your hand around her waist, Lynn. Perfect. Good. That's going to be their position. So from there, and of course, guys, you know we're doing this on the web. This is not a real wedding. We're not going to have every single family member here. So I'm going to walk you through what your shot list should be. So write this down. So here's going to be my first shot, guys. And I'm going to announce to the couple that this is, in fact, a test shot. Because I want to make sure I've got what I'm looking for. All right. I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to make sure I like the way everything's looking. And I do. And now, uh, Chris, I want you to turn into Lynn a little bit more. There you go. Good. Now just put your hand around her, the small of her back. Yeah, I like that. Good. And then I'm going to get her hair right. Good. All right, you too. Good smile one more time. I like the way this is looking. Ooh, I hit something on my camera by accident. Make sure this is working. Good. Now what I'm going to do, you two stay there is I'm going to bring in, I'm going to take you through the shot list, the groom's parents, 
Okay, so you are going to be the groom's parents. So you are mom. Mom, I'm going to put you on this side. Okay? Dad, you're going to come over here. Did you give birth to him when you were like six months old? <laughs> All right, so what I want you to do, mom, is I want you to grab onto his arm. Yeah, both hands. Grab in there. You can hold onto your flowers. Yeah. Grab in there. And then, mom, what I want you to do is just kick that leg back. Get in there, snuggle with him. Good, good. Love it, mama. Good. Dad, get in there. Put your left hand around her waist, right hand in the pocket. Perfect. That is the instruction I've given the parents now. Everybody looking at me? Good smiles. One, two. Okay? Awesome. Here's the thing. Dad, I need a better smile out of you, all right? Here we go. One, two. Awesome. And I would do that. If dad's not smiling, dads are notorious for not smiling. They look like they're on a death march. Look, that bad is a bad smile. First one, dad. Boom. Next one, he's happy. He's happy to be there. We've got to coach our clients. Notice how I went boy, girl, boy, girl, right? That's my way. I don't put mom and dad on the same side. Well, now, next up in the family should be the siblings, okay? We're going to take two sibling shots. We're going to take just the kids, and then we'll take the kids with their, with their wife, husband, kid, with their kids, right? So, Dad, I'm going to take you over to this side. Okay, get right next to your wife there. Awesome, guys. And what I want to do is I want to pull you guys forward just a half a step so you can all be on the same plane. There you go. Grab onto his arm. Dad, you're in there. Okay? You are sister. Okay, so get in there, uh, sister. But you are brother. So, brother, I want you here first. And sister, you back out. Let your brother in there. Good. Yeah, right hand in the pocket for me. Left hand around her waist. And then grab onto your brother's arm for me. Perfect. Grab on with both hands. Love it. Good, good. Okay, so now I'm still trying to go boy, girl, boy, girl, and it's not always going to happen that way. We already know that, but I'm going to mix it up as best I can. All right, great family. And, and you're grabbing onto his arm too hard. Let your hand slide a little bit for me. Yeah, he's so muscular. All right. <laughs> Put, let, your, let your hand come, just come down in here. Yeah, perfect. Love it. All right, here we go. Then I'm going to go through. Fix your bangs for me. I'm paying attention to all my couples. All right, I'm, I'm establishing myself as an expert. I'm making sure that everybody looks good. That's building more and more trust. All right, here we go, guys. Good smiles, everybody. One, two. One more, one, two. I'm a liar. Stay with me. Here we go. Good job. And now I've popped off three quick frames, moving very, very quickly through the scene. These are my family portraits. We can do the same thing, okay, even if we were uh, going outside, right? So if you live, look, if you live in Southern California, uh, if you live in Hawaii, if you live in a warm part of the country, you can absolutely go outside and do the same thing. Find a great green background. Find a great color door, right? Something uh, artistic. But the process is still the same. So merge your shooting style into this system, and you will move so quickly through the church. I don't care what's going on. And remember yesterday, Sarah, we were talking about what do you do with that person who's behind you. They cannot keep up with how fast I'm moving. So you could try. God bless you. And get the shot. Good for you. But you're not going to be able to do it because I'm moving way too quickly. So now, what I would add to the shot would be all of the siblings, spouses, and kids. Okay, so uh, you're the wife. Come on in here. You're his wife. You're a little underdressed for this uh, function, Darlene. All right, so we're going we're gonna to keep you there. Grab onto your husband's arm. Okay. Great. Hold on with both hands. Awesome. Okay, and then what I want to do is we need a husband for you. All right, so... Lisa, you look like a good husband. You're a same-sex marriage. Come on up here. <laughs> I'm not judging you, Lisa. All right? So here we go. Now, here we are clearly in a situation where we're going to be off balance. Okay? And, that, and, that's, and that's okay. So what we would have to do in this situation, we could surely try and shimmy everyone down, but I'm not going to do this uh, because I just can't. I don't want to move my bride and groom. Uh, and no matter what I do, I don't want to move center here. So let's go get in there close, everybody. We love each other. Okay, and here we go. Good smiles, one, two. Good smiles, everybody, one, two. And everybody, do me a favor, just talking to each other. You love talking to each other. Family event. Awesome, good. You guys are horrible storytellers with each other, all right? <laughs> so what we're trying to do now is now we've gotten that picture. Now I might come in and grab a whole bunch of other people uh, to be part of this uh, shot, right? The entire family in. Now, okay, everybody sit down except mom and dad. I need you to stay up here for me, okay? Everybody sit down, okay? And now what you're going to do, okay, you're, uh, who are you? Her mom? You're his mom now. You're Lynn's mom now, okay? Uh, so now you're her mom, okay, and I need a dude. Come on, Aaron. 
Okay, Aaron, you are her, you are Chris's dad. Okay, so here's what we're looking to do. Grab onto her arm for me, mama. Yeah, Chris, get in there. Uh, put your arm around your wife's waist and right hand in your pocket. And unbutton this bottom button for me. Okay, on two piece suits, we want to keep that un undone. Good, you're good. All right, thumb in the pocket for me, Lynn. There you go, uh, especially for this. All right, here we go. So everybody's looking good for me. I like the way this looks. Now what I've done is I'm taking her family and his family and getting a nice parent shot. All right, so let's get this, guys. Good smiles, one, two. One more, one, two. And last one. And that's how quickly I'm moving through that set. All right, you guys can all sit down. Great job. I would then take this. We, these are the must-have shots I'm giving you right now. We need to add grandparents to that giant family shot. We then need to take the same thing we did for his family, we need to do for her family, okay? And then that is all I'm taking in the church. I am not taking that traditional uh, bridal party shot along the front of the altar. That is not our style. We don't take that shot. I've been in business for five years. I've taken that shot once. So we will not take that shot. Questions? Sarah? If this was outside and would you and doing like the family portraits outside, would you still use the flash for Phil? For or? Phil, I would not use okay. the flash for Phil uh, unless I had really bad shadows. What I would be doing though is looking for open shade. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to be doing. So if you find open shade, you don't, need sh you don't need any of that stuff, right? I'm not getting a reflector out, anything like that. But if I've got bad shadows, I will absolutely use this for Phil. Um, and of course, in that case, there's nothing to bounce it off with. I'm going to have to find some sort of diffuser and, and fi fire right at them. But at a very, very low power setting, the flash might actually be at like minus one, right, just to get that fill in, in their eyes. Good question. Anything else? We good. Internet. Internet. So quite a few people are asking about the crop. If you could talk about where you crop the, the group photos like this, if you crop them at the knee, above the knee or, you know, above the feet. Yeah, the rule of thumb rules? is to never crop at, the, at a joint. Okay, that's the rule of thumb. We don't want to crop off fingertips. Uh, we don't want to crop off at the knee. Uh, you know, the thigh's okay. But f my mindset on this shot, just because I know my clients, most of them are printing 8x12s, 8x10s of this. Um, I've had, we had one family, uh, probably about four years ago, got a 20x30 canvas of an altar picture. Talk about not being with the right client. That was not my client. Our clients today, this is not what they're blowing up. I know they're doing 8x10s, eight 8x12s. Eight by eight by so that's where you see that mid-level shot. I don't want to pull back, because if you pull back too far, an 8x10, they're going to be tiny in the frame. So they like seeing their faces. This is after years of feedback from our clients on what they're looking for. So again, find your own style and what works for you. Great, thank you. Cool, so another question is, uh, how do you handle really large crowds, like two rows yeah. for the group shot? Is that what you would do? Yeah, so this would be, uh, this particular situation for us would be an absolute nightmare right here, right now, if we were trying to shoot two rows of people in here. We would not really be able to do it because there's no, we don't have risers, right? We're not walking around with risers. So we'd have a couple of options. We'd have to try and find a wall where we could go somewhat wide, but I wouldn't go any deeper than two layers. Now at a church, we've got the steps up to the altar. Almost every church has that. We are going to start piling people up on the second step, on the third step, to give us those, uh, th give us those layers. I'm not sure if you talked about this, but Stefan in the chat room had asked, what is your second shooter doing during the formals? I had not addressed this. My second shooter is doing absolutely nothing. There's nothing here I want from a second shooter perspective. That's a great question. My second shooter is helping me get my bag together so that as soon as this is done, we can leave here uh, and go get some better pictures. Great. So great question. Great. So, gosh, there's so many, there's so many questions. A lot questions. of questions coming in. <laughs> I, what, I'm, what I'm hoping, everybody out there, guys, I'm hoping, the only part I want to imp, impart on you, so to speak, is the settings with the flash, right? You're going to take your style of photography and just use our system with it. So, again, the settings on the flash are key. This is how we train our shooters. You're going to go into about ISO 800, uh, 5.6, manual mode, 60th of a second, ETTL on your flash, bounce it off a ceiling, bounce it off a light source, pull that little white card out, don't fire straight on your client with it, and I guarantee you if you practice at home you're going to love the way it looks. 
Okay, so question on that. Uh, Jerry and Gonzalez Photography and A. Holloway had asked about diffusers such as the Gary Fong diffusers, Rogue modifiers. Would you use those in this situation? I would, in this situation, I wouldn't use them. I'm, uh, I love Rogue, by the way. Uh, I've got some light modifiers from Rogue. We're going to use them later at the reception. But in this particular situation, uh, I, don't, I don't use any light modifiers uh, at all. For I'm, the family. In, in, in a certain sense, by reflecting off the wall, off the ceiling, the ceiling becomes my light modifier, so to speak. I'm making the ceiling a giant softbox, uh, and that's what I'm using for that. Okay, should we take one more? Yeah. Okay, Jason says, Sal, why not off-camera flash with umbrellas and flash manual mode for consistency? Set it and forget it. Set it and forget it. You are not setting it and forgetting it. You need 10 to 15 minutes to set up your umbrella, carry your extra equipment, open up your light stands, and it turns into a three-ring circus. I don't want to be that guy. I am, guys, if you haven't figured anything out about me, I'm about speed and efficiency. These are not what sell prints for me. Let's, let's stop there. I, you know, yes, I guess in a sense we're doing wedding portraits. I don't sell a whole lot of these. So why would I want to invest any more time than I have to to photograph something I know my client's not going to necessarily buy, anything bigger than an 8x10? It's too much extra work for not enough return on investment. ROI, baby, this is business. All right, one, one more really short one, which is because a lot of people have been asking about your CF cards. And how many gigs are on your CF cards? Do you change them throughout the day? Awesome, awesome questions. Those are the kind of questions I love getting because that, that tells me people are thinking the right way. Um, we will typically use nothing larger than a 16 gig card in our camera. I don't want to, and forget what number it is because as cameras continue to evolve, they're going to have the ability to, the file size is going to get bigger and bigger. Here's my measuring stick. I don't want to put more than three or 400 pictures on any given memory card, whatever size that may be. And here's my thought process there. If I lose a memory card, which I never want to do, by the way, uh, I don't want to lose 2,000 images. I mean, they're making now, I, don't, I can't remember, I think it's Lexar, is making a 256 gig card. 256 gig card. That means I could probably shoot three weddings on one card. I would never want to risk losing an entire wedding because a card went bad, it fell out of my pocket, my, my car got broken into. So my rule of thumb is to try and not put more than 300, 400-ish images on a day where I'm shooting three to 4,000 images. So I'm, you know, I don't want to lose any, but I'd feel a hell of a lot more comfortable telling my bride I only lost 300 images than I lost 4,000 images. Great. All good questions. Great. Okay, I think we're ready. All right, let's keep going. So uh, here's what we're going to do next. This is a uh, live broadcast, so as you can imagine, I'm being extremely um, handcuffed, if you will, on where I can go, what I can do. But you know what? We're going to make the best out of this because it's easy for me to take you to a park and show you uh, this gorgeous background, this gorgeous uh, setup, and you go, oh, well, you're lucky, Sal, you get all these beautiful venues. Well, I can tell you right now where we're being forced to shoot. I've got an alley I'm about to go into, uh, and I've got a uh, window light that we're going to use. What I want to do are two things. I want to show you how we deal with adverse conditions. Everything isn't always going to be rosy, and we still have to be able to perform. So how can, what, what do you do when it rains? What do you do when they give you 15 minutes and you don't have a limo to take you from location to location? How do you respond in those situations? We still have to get certain images. And then what we're going to do is we're going to shoot in these adverse conditions, and then uh, the Creative Live team, we're going to go to lunch, and over lunch, they're going to let me go do whatever I want to do with the bride and groom. So we're going to show you this bonus segment um, later tonight, or I guess it's only if you download the broadcast. Uh, if you've purchased it, you'll get this bonus segment where you can see me outside doing my thing uh, in a much more uh, natural surrounding. So we'll go with that. So what are the must-have shots from the creatives? Again, get a piece of paper out. To me, this is our must-have shots. I must have a picture of the bride with each one of her bridesmaids. I don't want that at the altar. I must have a picture of the groom with each one of his groomsmen. Again, don't want it at the altar. I'm thinking about this for the album. I need to have all the groomsmen together. I need to have all the bridesmaids together. I need to have all the groomsmen and bridesmaids together. I need to have a giant group shot, right, for the album. Then I need to have, of course, the bride and groom alone, the bride alone, the groom alone. That is my mental shot list. Do not start carrying around a piece of paper with things like, because I've read books, and the shot list is like, bouquet, 
uh, bouquet with hands, uh, bouquet with rings. That'll make me nuts, right? What you need to do is just write down uh, the, the generic high-level list and then use my system of tight, middle, wide, 70 millimeter, 135 millimeter, 200 millimeter, and you're going to pick off all those various shots with you and your second shooter. So with that being said, let's relocate to the window area. My whole bridal party, let's go. No flash. I'm probably going to switch to my 7200. That is my favorite lens. And because I'm on my 7200, my second shooter is probably going to use a 2470. Right? So that we have diversity. Switch to this. Taylor, what I'm going to have you do as soon as we get over there is talk to us about what your mindset is um, in, in uh, photographing. Should I go over this way, guys? And what you're looking for to compliment me. Okay. So let's get over there. Let's get this cord. It'd be funny if you ever had to shoot tethered <laughs> during like a wedding. All right. So here we are. We're indoors. And you know, from your perspective at home, you know where we are? We're in a hotel lobby. We're in, a, uh, in the venue's uh, reception hall. We're in the church, uh, you know, in, in a waiting area. We've got to use whatever. We've got to be creative. So I'm going back into Aperture Priority. I'm probably going to go ISO... Uh, um, 400 and 2.8, right? So that, oh, hold on, camera's coming back. All right, those are going to be my starting points, and I'm in auto white balance. And so we've got to be creative with what we have. So I know I want each one of the groomsmen uh, together. So let me get uh, Lynn, come on in here. So what I'm going to have you do, Lynn, is I'm going to have you stand right here, up here. Come on up. And then my groomsmen, come on up. You're just going to stand there. Okay. Flip towards me. Right there. Perfect. And I just want you to get in one at a time. Come on in. So I'm looking to get each one of the groomsmen together. Go ahead and get right next to him. Yeah. Yeah. You guys like each other. Here we go. All right. Let me get a test shot. Okay, so here's what, that, these are the kind of shots I'm going to start taking. All right, we're losing a little bit of light here in sunny Seattle. One, two, good smiles. One more. One more. Done. Next up. And that's how quick we would work. And the only thing I'm doing as a second shooter at this point is just getting the line of ties going down. So you, I don't know if you guys saw me come over here. And it just took one shot while Sal's shooting. Just to get the ties down the I'll line. I'll show them what that should look like. This yeah. is the shot I'm expecting. So half step up. There you go. And so Taylor's getting stuff like this, right? Just so she's got something that is complimentary in the album, okay? Other it's than that, don't be shooting right here because they're not going to know which camera to look at if you're being distracting like that. That's a great point. I don't want my second shooter here. My second shooter is also, the girls are all over here. So let's have the girls here. So come on in. Usually my bride and bridesmaids, uh, they're standing right here watching uh, whatever we're doing. So come on over right here. Yeah. So they're just here. Okay, guess what Taylor's doing? Taylor's fo photographing. She's probably standing over here shooting back into uh, looking at the bridesmaids and what they're doing, goofing around, talking, have fun with each other. Okay, that's my second shooter's job. All right? You could probably, you could probably, you want me to get them out of the way? You're not my way. Taylor's got, she's not tethered. All right, so here we go. Now I'm going to get a shot of you guys. Good smiles. One, two. One more. One more. So notice I took three shots. Now they're done. I would do this for every single groomsman. Were we able to bring one of these shots up of the groomsmen? Just the two of them? 30 seconds. No worries. Okay, so we'll, get you, we'll show you what we're taking. It's a chest-up shot, okay, and it's just of the two of them smiling. That's all I'm looking to do at this point. Now I could have ten groomsmen... And I would go through this series of shots in literally five minutes. And they are freaking out at how quickly we are moving through this. 
That is the goal, speed, efficiency, and get what you need. Now what I want to do is just maybe something with the groomsmen chilling alone. Do me a favor, guys, sit on the couch. Where's my other groomsmen? Come on in here. Yeah, Lynn, I'm going to put you here in that corner. Yeah, switch down. And maybe, maybe my man, I've got you uh, ch chilling on the wall or something. Actually, how about this? We have you on the wall, too. Yeah, you're just chilling, leaning back. You're owning the wall. And Lynn, I need you to get, you're almost too comfortable, buddy. So get in the middle. Right, be careful. Lynn, Lynn's like leaning back. He's lounging, right? He feels comfortable, but it doesn't look good in a photograph. So Lynn, what I want you to do is maybe lean forward, bring your butt all the way to the edge of the chair, spread your stance, and lean it in. There we go, buddy. Right, so what I'm looking to do here is create something a little more masculine for him. Okay, so Lynn, what I want you to do, boys, I want you looking out the window. And so here's some shots I might get of Lynn. So Lynn, you're looking right at me. Love it, dude. Okay, I'm seeing this already in my head as a black and white shot. Awesome, Lynn. I love your expression on that. Here we go. Keep looking at me. <laughs> love it, dude. Was Chris telling you you didn't have your A game today? Love it. Keep going with that, Lynn. Now I'm zooming in on his hands. Just getting some shots of his hands. I'm vertical. I'm horizontal. Now, Lynn, I want you looking out the window. Yeah, that's what I want, buddy. Love it. Notice, well, how, notice how I'm using the, um, if we can bring up that image, uh, 357. Notice how I'm using the groomsman is just kind of eye candy at this point. It's still all about Lynn. Are we getting images up? I can't tell. Okay. So once we get 357 up, you can see how we're cropping this. We got Lynn looking out the window. We're using some of the architectural detail. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm looking for here, okay? As we scroll back through, let's see. I also like 355, so we got a vertical shot. And then I've got uh, 354, which is just of Lynn's hands. And you might be thinking, what the hell would we do with that? Again, it's just a detail for the album. And what I was going to say is while Sal's setting these guys up, uh, Chris has the best expression on her face. She's just laughing and enjoying him. So it's a really natural expression. It's something great to capture as a second shooter is the stuff that Sal doesn't even know and can't know what's going on. Perfect. So let's keep, let's keep going with this. Lynn, and boys, I want everybody looking at me now. Right at me. There you go. And everybody's, I, I love your two expressions. Very stoic in the background. So Lynn, you're too happy. They're like mean mugging. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, you own it now, Lynn. <laughs> Love it. And when he starts laughing, I'm not going to start stop shooting, right? I'm looking for that. All right, let's stay with that, gentlemen. Perfect. That's all right, Lynn. I love it, buddy. <laughs> and I'm shooting away, man. That's why I've got, that's why I've got, you got to think about what's happening right now, everybody. This is what I'm doing. I intentionally have my bride here watching what's going on. Because he's giving me, even though I'm asking him to be serious for a second, he cannot stop laughing uh, at, his, at his bride because she's making fun of him. Um, <laughs> and that's perfect. So hopefully my second shooter is catching her making fun of him, and I'm catching his response to it. This is completely controlled. So this has nothing to do with us being on Creative Live. This is happening because this is the way we stage and run our day. We know that if we force two people to look at each other, they are probably going to start laughing and it's going to be natural. So we're controlling and creating the moment. That's probably a better way to think about it. We're not hoping the moment happens. We're not state necessarily forcing the moment. We're create staging and creating the moment, right? Mm -hmm. So let me show you, why don't you use my camera just to show the audience what we've been, um, what we would shoot from your angle. And I'll direct Lynn again. Okay. So that you're doing it. Be tight with it. Yep. All right, so Lynn, just pretend I got a camera. All right, buddy? Yeah, let's go uh, serious first. All right? And go ahead, Chris, if you want to make fun of him again, you can totally make fun of him. And while Taylor's doing that, she's going back and forth between the bride and groom. That's going to be a good shot. So, Lynn, yeah, you're looking at me. Give me some, give me some serious expression. All right? Look out the window now. All right? Funny stuff going on out there. Yeah, I love it. Perfect. All right, so I don't know what images are coming up. We can't see the screen. Bring this uh, uh, back around for me so yep. I can have that cord. Um, now here's what I want to do again, gentlemen. I want to have all three of you sitting down. So sit down next to uh, Lynn.
So now what I might do is, again, this could be happening in a hotel lobby. Do not be a victim of circumstance. Do not worry uh, and blame everybody else for why you're not getting a shot. Look at your environment, take whatever you have, and use it to the best of your ability. So now, gentlemen, open up your jackets. I might have these guys sitting there with a cocktail. Yes. Yes. Just to let you know, we can't take any supplies right now. We're all working on the tethering. Okay. Um, but we are saving the images. Okay. So you will have them later. Perfect, perfect. Okay. Thank so you. Everybody at home, I apologize. You're not seeing what images we're, we're taking. Um, we will either later today show you or when we're editing them tomorrow show you. So I'm going to do the best I can. We're having some tethering issues to walk you through what I'm seeing uh, on camera. So here's what I want you guys doing. I want you guys getting very casual with each other, okay, and just shooting the shit with each other, okay? So talk to each other. Tell a story. Lynn, tell a funny story. There's a priest, a rabbi, and, uh, and they walk into a bar. I don't know. Tell a story. And as a second shooter, I'm paying attention to what Sal is shooting and trying to shoot opposite. So he's got a 7200 on and he's shooting horizontal. If I had a 7200 on, I could come right behind him and do a different focal length and go vertical just to get a different uh, line of sight or stick with my 7200 and go wide right over his shoulder. So even though we're, it's taking half the amount of time to get all the pictures that we need to get because we're always opposite angles, opposite lenses the whole day. That's why we have so much diversity in our portfolio. Well, now these guys, you three are done. Good job. I don't know what stories you were telling, but uh, I'm, I'm sure they were good. All right, you're done. Now I'm going to take my bridesmaids through the same process, and I'm going to work just as quickly. So come on here. Okay, so Chris, you're going to be right there in the middle. And then one at a time, I want you to step in. So again, my settings, I'm going about 4.0 on my camera. Get on in there with the flowers. There you go. Get right next to each other. There you go. Come a little bit closer. Yes? Yes. Um, okay, so I am focusing on my bride. The bride is what, I'm, is what I'm focusing on. I'm also adjusting her details, and you can't see it at home. Your necklace is crooked. crooked. And then you got the little hoop, uh, so put the lock all the way behind your neck. So I'm paying attention to all these little details uh, on my bride. Again, earning trust, earning respect, earning confidence from my couple. Exactly, here we go. So you two get in there. Yeah, put your arm around her waist. Awesome. Here we go, one, two. Good smiles. Awesome, one more. And do me a favor, you two, just talking to each other. They're your friends, you go way back. And what I'm doing there by getting them to talk to each other is getting a little bit more candid expression uh, from them, and that's the goal. You're done, perfect, come on in, next up. No flash. This is how I work. This is how quickly and efficiently we work. Get on, on in there with her. You love her. Perfect. And just talking to each other one more time. Awesome. And that's it. I would do that. Boom, 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 boom. Bridesmaid, bridesmaid, bridesmaid. Now I want to get all my bridesmaids together. Here's what I want you thinking about. Taylor, help me move this. I mean, you know the movie Bridesmaids, right? Do you remember the cover of that movie by any chance? All right, it's a whole bunch. You don't remember it, I can tell, just by the look <laughs> on your face. And that's okay. Now, you notice as I'm talking to them and goofing around with them, they're laughing, they're giving us natural reaction. You know what's happening right now? My second shooter is like a ninja picking this stuff off, knowing that I'm about to goof around with them. That is very, very important. But in the interim, let's move this couch off here. Let's pull it down. Yes, we move furniture all the time. There's nothing wrong with that. So now what I want you is, Chris here, I want you here like this, okay? Holding you bu your bouquet here. So come on in. Good. Let's get this behind you a little bit. Let me see that. Awesome. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to come here, okay? And I want you keeping your hip away, and maybe you're on her shoulder like this. Okay, let's get that going. Yeah, I like that. Put your left hand on your hip. Good, I like it, good. And then what I want you to do uh, is I want you here like this, holding you, your bouquet here. And just make it, make it feel sassy. Give me a lot of sass. Love it. That's what I'm talking about. This is bridesmaids right here. I need you to move closer for me to her. There you go, good, good. All right. So, ladies, here's what I need out of you. I need two looks out of you. One is your big smiles. I've seen all of you smiling. You've got beautiful smiles. The next one I need is your sassy look, okay? 
And as I'm talking to them, my second shooter is right here waiting for these moments. Okay, let me see your sass. You got sass? Oh, sass, you got sass. You got, let me see your sass. Yeah, there you go. You're doing good. So, when I need sass, we need sass. You're doing great, ladies. All those candid moments with me goofing around with them, my second shooter is picking off, providing balance to my portfolio. Okay? Good. You three keep talking. I love it. Oh, my camera's busy. I can't take a shot. I can't take a shot. Just unplug it. Gotcha. Now I can move much quicker. Here we go, you ladies looking at me, good smiles, talking to each other, giggling. Looking out that window, there's good stuff going on out there. All right, I'm going vertical, horizontal now. This is very liberating right now. I'm not, I'm not limited by the, uh, the tether. All right, here we go. Ladies all looking at me, sassy. Stay there with it. Also notice I'm going vertical, horizontal. 70, 100, 200. You should see my hands, they're all moving. The camera's not coming away from my face. Looking out the window again, being sassy. Awesome. Talking to each other. Awesome, ladies, perfect. And I'm done. And that's how much time I would spend. That's how quickly I would move. I would do what I had to do to get the shots I needed. I got the bride. Uh, with each one of her bridesmaids. I got the groom with each one of his groomsmen. I got all the groomsmen together. I got all the bridesmaids together. And now, once I untethered, I didn't have to slow down my shooting. I just kept going as quickly and in normal pace as I would work, which is usually a lot faster than most photographers would work. Now, I want to get the two of you off here for a second. You'll stay there. Lynn, let's get you back in. Glasses off. Okay. So, Lynn, what I want to have you do is stand right here, okay, hands in the pockets, and turn towards that window a little bit, yeah? And then I'm going to have you right here, Chris, leaning right back there, okay, and leaning straight back. Good. Holding that bouquet there, all right? And, Lynn, I'm going to move you right here. Good. All right, so some things I've got to get now. I want the, I want the groom, and I'm going to get a picture of him alone. And then I want the groom with my bride layered in the background, very similar to what we were doing on the engagement pictures. I don't want just a wall behind them. I want layers. I also need a picture of just the bouquet in her hands. That's my second shooter's job, capturing these little details. And I can also get the bride by herself while Sal's shooting the two of them together. Because they're separated, now we're just adding more diversity. I can zoom in with the 7200 and get her just by herself three quarters up. All right. So... What I'm going to do is come here as much as I possibly can, right? And I'm going to get this shot. Should I unplug it again? It's not working? Okay. Let me know when I can use it again. All right. So what I want to do is I want to isolate. Can I, can I get a camera over here or no? All right. Yeah, let's take some questions while we're waiting for this. Okay. Come out here. Nothing wrong with technical difficulties. That's right. This is a live broadcast. This is a live broadcast. This is how we roll sometimes. So Vicky from Salvador would like to know, what about if the wedding was at night when you don't have any window light in the same situation, what would you do? Video light. Video light or flash. So if you were watching, was it Tuesday we talked about the engagement session? I pulled out some video lights. That's why I always carry four of those lights in my bag. Uh, for situations like this. But if you've got a group where it's 10 on each side and it's dark out already, you have a major problem. You start using lamps, turning on indoor lights, using as much light as you can. Yeah, there was a situation where that has happened in the past and we go right into the hotel ballroom maybe, the lobby, and we're using whatever we can to light people up. And so, you, you know, again, this comes back to, I hate to say it, the timeline, mm -hmm. but by, that's why we control the timeline because we know if they're scheduling creatives for 7 p.m., and it gets dark at 5 p.m., that's not going to work. All right, so it's not a surprise when we get there. We're always aware of what our surroundings are going to be. So a follow-up question to that. If that did happen, would you just bring in more lights and just go with their schedule, or would you make them change it? I know we've talked about this before, but just to clarify, would you say they, they demand that it's at 7 p.m., so we're going to have to bring in more lights? No. If they, if they demand that, let's say it's a New Year's Eve wedding. That's a real world scenario. If it's a New Year's Eve wedding and they're not getting married until 7 p.m., we've had that happen, 
Uh, it's dark at 4 p.m., right, on New Year's Eve. At least by us it is. And, and the bride doesn't want to be in her dress till 6 o'clock or 5 o'clock. That's fine. However, just keep in mind, if you want those pictures that you've seen on our website, you have to give us the time we need. If, this is what I say. This is, the, this is what closes the deal, I think, for our brides. If you're okay not getting those pictures, I'm okay not getting those pictures. And the second I say that to my bride, the light bulb goes off for her, and she's like, wait a minute, I'm paying these people a lot of money to be there. I need to give them the time they need. But I can't, I mean, what, I don't want to bring in a studio set to light uh, the event. I travel really lightly. Okay. I know we t we've asked this many times, but people just need it reiterated yeah. again. Yeah, own <laughs> destiny. <laughs> Thank you. The timeline worksheet is a must-have. Thank I you. I think that is the theme. It sure. is a theme. It's a good theme. <laughs> yeah. So another question from TSC Tempest in Hamburg, Germany. When you were shooting, and we've got uh, the big window that's the lit to the side of the group over here, are you plus halfing or plus wanting your exposure to reduce shadows on the opposite, opposite side of the faces? Or what's your thought process when you're exposing here? That's where that test shot comes into play. I need to see what's happening with those shadows, right? And I'm using a couple of things on my camera. The camera screen can be very, very misleading. Do not trust the back of your camera. What you need to trust is that histogram. That's what that's there for. So I'm trying to make sure I'm not losing my shadow detail, and I also want to make sure I'm not blowing out my highlights uh, for that very reason. So I know that there's going to have to, when I've got directional light like this coming in, I know that I'm going to have to use some fill light in Lightroom. Uh, there's going to have to be post-production work done to these images. But I think the key here is, as much as I'd like to get it perfect in camera, that sounds great in theory, that sounds great in a workshop, but in the real world, that's not always possible. So it becomes the lesser of two evils. What are my capabilities in post-production? As long as I know what I can do in post, uh, that's, where, that's where I'm erring on that side. So yeah, I was, I was making sure I didn't lose highlight detail. That's the answer to your question. As long as I got the highlights, I feel pretty good. Great, thank you. Okay, I guess uh, another question would be from IC Photography. And I know we've talked about shooting with glasses, but in group shots, like at formal events, when you have multiple people that have glasses. Yeah. You know, I mean, when there's one person, you can work around it, but what if there's three or four people with glasses? I usually ask them, be like, hey, I'm getting a little bit of a glare on your glasses. Do you always wear them, or do you mind taking them off? Whatever you prefer. But let's work, let's work within, within, within that. Let's get a little more technical on it. Uh, angle in is angle out. And I don't know if a lot of people know what that means. Unfortunately, I took physics in uh, high school. And I still remember this. Light, right, travels, angle in equals angle out. And in English, what that means is the reason you're getting the reflection in their glasses is because this is, it's like red eye, by the way, right? That's why if, I, if I'm looking right into the camera and that light's hitting me directly, that's where I'm getting that glare from. So you will find that if you change the angle of your light source and change the tilt of their head a little, the reflection will actually disappear. Uh, on you. So just keep that in mind because the light uh, reflection in glasses, while you can fix some of that in post, it is not what I want you to be doing. So take it off if they, if they don't mind taking their glasses off, but if it's part of who they are, understand the angle the light is bouncing in is what's causing that reflection. And in this scenario, as we saw yesterday, Lynn wanted to take them off. Is right. He told me, he said, right. I'd prefer having my right. glasses off, which I find a majority of my groomsmen uh, actually do. Because glasses tend to date the image. Right? Glass has become a fashion statement mm. today. Right. And so, you know, I've got grooms that, um, you know, they, they're lighting this up where they've got certain spectacles on, certain glasses on, and they're, they're, they're spectacles. <laughs> it just reminds me of pictures from the 70s. Like, oh, that picture's from the right. 70s. <laughs> exactly. It dates it. So uh, you want to make sure you don't do that. Cool. I think we're good. Yeah, we're tethered. No, we're I, my, go. team, my team's got oh, questions here. Oh, team's got questions. Okay. Just curiosity on the video light. Come up so they can see. Ooh. Well, okay. Um, on the video light, if you put it on the camera or have it off camera, are the settings the same or different? Uh, for this particular scenario, if I were using video light um, mm -hmm. and we were dark and we didn't have any light here, uh, the, the video lights would in fact be off camera because I'm so far away, the video light's not going to be able to throw far enough. It's not powerful enough. Uh, so my, my, my second shooter may have to actually stop shooting in order to come over here and start holding my light. And now let's say I was working with just the guys and I had multiple video lights because I carried four of them in my bag, I would actually have bridesmaids helping out holding lights. Then when I'm working with the bridesmaids, I'd have groomsmen helping out holding the lights. And you'll find that most of your groomsmen and bridesmaids 
love helping out. I've never had a problem where my group isn't like. So you're still shooting wide open, whether they're on your camera or off yeah, your camera? Yeah, that's my shooting style. Okay. I love that wide open look, right? So okay. you've got to shoot within your style. Okay. All right, Tyler's We good? good? Let's go. All right, so I know we've got uh, 20 minutes before we break for lunch. Um, what we need to do, though, is take a, um, you know what? Uh, Amanda, I, don't, I, I know she can hear me, but what I think I'm going to do is rather than going into that alley uh, and working in the alley, I'm going to keep working in, in what I consider to be a somewhat difficult situation from both space and lighting and make this work. We go to lunch, and then we'll go off and do the uh, extended lunch, and we'll go off and, and do the South and Cotta style of shooting where I can go <laughs> shoot some brick walls in the middle of the street, maybe? Yes? I don't know. I like <laughs> maybe it. not the middle of the street, but yes. that sounds great. That, yes. That sounds great. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. So let me get my group up here. And I think understanding how to pose your group is very important. So I'm going to have you two step down for a second. I'm really big on layering. So uh, Lynn, you're going to come down. Chris, you're going to come down. I'm really big on layering. That's how I work with my group. So I don't like to pose them in a perfect pyramid. That is not my style of shooting. So what we can do here is I want to have you. Who's your date today? Somebody. Yeah. So you're going to come here. I want you here almost as close as you can get. Uh, maybe your ankles are you cross at the ankles. Come on down. Okay, get a little bit closer for me. Good. And what you're going to do is snuggle up right with him. Yeah, put your arm around her waist. Get next to her. How about, uh, yeah, and p switch your hips for me. There you go. That's what I want. Perfect. All right, you two, you're going to come right here. And so I'm going to have you on the outside. And then you're going to do the same thing. So you're going to get into him. Put your arm around her waist. Pivot your hip away from camera. Go the other way. There you go. You feel that? Perfect. Good. And just so everybody knows, I don't remember if we did this yesterday with the engagement session. The one thing I teach my couples to do is how to pose. So there's two things you need to teach your bridesmaids, and they will love you forever. The one thing they never want to do, ladies, is push your hip into camera. You will gain 10 pounds on camera if you do that, okay? So you always want to slide your hip away from the camera and give me that little bit of S curve, okay? So that's going to shave 10 pounds. The other thing is all of us naturally like to pivot our necks from here. And that's going to make you heavy in the chin. So models know how to do something. I call it turtling, and that's pushing your chin out, okay? That is going to thin your neck. It's going to feel ridiculous, but it's going to look good. And so let's keep that in mind. All right. So what I want you to do, don't slouch towards me. Stand straight up. There you go. Perfect. You're perfect. Now you two come in here. I'm going to put you dead center. That cord has been attacking you all day, Chris. All right. So get into each other. And what I want you to do here for me, uh, Chris, uh, Lynn, I want you to put that right hand in your pocket. Good. And Chris, maybe uh, with your hand, go under his shoulder. Underneath. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. Does that feel comfortable? That's what I'm looking for. Beautiful. And let's uh, put her dress toward, more behind her. Okay. And what I'm looking to do here, guys, is just create a layer. You two, can you sh just shimmy this way a little bit, a little bit, a little bit? Perfect. Right? Okay. And now what I'm looking to do, and Taylor, can you move that table for me? Yeah. And it's directional. And so what's happening to you is you're getting hit with the shadow from this curtain. So I don't know if we can move that. There we go. Oh, maybe not. There you go. Can we hold that? Perfect. Okay, I'm using the light that's available. It is a directional light source. And so what I want, all right, everybody is looking at me. Listen to the progression, guys. Everybody's looking at me. I'm at two. Well, you'll see my settings come up on the screen in a second here. Everybody's smiling. Test shot. Let me make sure I like it. Okay. Good smiles, everybody. One, two. Good. Everybody being sassy. Gentlemen, you're mean mugging. Everybody sassy, mean mugging. You two looking at each other. No smiling, you're sassy me. No, there yeah, you go. Chris, drop those flowers just a little bit for me. Good, looking at each other again. Everybody looking out that window? You guys get in for a kiss? Don't give it to him, though, Chris. Make him work for it. <laughs> no, he, you know, oh, oh. All right, give him one. Give him a smooch. You can kiss him now, Chris. Awesome, guys. And what I'm doing, do it one more time. Looking at each other, kissing. <laughs> Chris, you don't have to play hard to get anymore. You can give him a little something. She's making you work, Lynn. Love it, guys. 
And what I did there, and I don't know what medley of pictures are coming up, is I took this group, I went tight, middle, wide, as best I could. I went vertical, I went horizontal. I isolated the bride and groom. I took one shot with everybody looking at me. I took it with them kissing. I took it with them looking away to add the maximum amount of diversity. And I don't know if you caught it, but while I was doing that, Taylor is floating around on the perimeter getting some of those shots I'm while I'm working. I'm getting Lynn's expression, and if I ever might come over here and get Chris's expression, I get close up on her bouquet, on the dress, on his tux, and then zoom in where I just see their faces, so it looks like they have more pictures of just the two of them instead of with the whole group. Questions for me? Absolutely <laughs> questions. All right, so a question from Rachel Ann's photo in Dubois, Dubois, Dubois? Dubois. <laughs> Dubois, Pennsylvania. Uh, I thought it was France. <laughs> <laughs> um, do, why does Sal shoot these portraits with the guys and girls separately after the, after the ceremony instead of beforehand to save on time during the cocktail hour? For example, shoot those outside the hotel of the church before the ceremony. Exactly. That's actually a great question because typically, in order to do that, I would need more time before the ceremony. And that would mean my bride would have to get ready 15, 20 minutes earlier. My groom would have to get ready 15, 20 minutes earlier. And they typically don't want to do that. They don't like getting ready three or four hours beforehand. And so we could do that if time allows. Mm -hmm. We would absolutely do the guys alone uh, yeah. and each guy with each other. If beforehand. during the timeline they didn't give us that hour and a half for this, then we would push for extra time in the beginning of the day to knock out all this beforehand as yeah. much as we can. So very astute uh, of, her, of her or him to figure that out, and, and we would do it, but I would tell you what, 80% of the time, we don't get that time up front mm -hmm. uh, to do it. So where you can, cover yourself, get those shots, and then do a little more creative. Because hotels don't always look the, the greatest. I'd rather do these outside, to be honest with you. That's where I'd rather perform uh, these shots. Cool. Okay, question from uh, Rihanna, Rihanna Durst. I'm not sure how to say that name. What factors do you look for when choosing a lo location for these shots? The natural light, the couch, etc. Yeah, so great question. You've got to understand what's going on here, right? We're producing a, a, a web show, right? It's a live broadcast, so I can't, do, it's not ideal. I can't get outside with an entire film crew and do what I would do. Me, personally, I'd love to be on a brick wall right now, uh, maybe with a, a, a park-like setting. And I think, you know, when we, when we were taking breaks and planning this event, as we talked to the producers and we listened to you guys out there, we, I didn't want to make everything rosy. I wanted to show you how, this is not the most beautiful spot. Uh, I don't know if we've got a wide shot of this space, but this is not the most exciting of spots and not ideal. That's why we wanted to do this, to show you that even in a not ideal situation, we can still get great shots for our couples. I don't think the shots that have been coming off my camera, anyone would complain about, especially once they've been processed. And so, what am I looking for? Diversity. If, if, if everything was perfect, I want natural light where I can get it. Uh, I cannot stand using fluorescent light or, or you know, any kind of other artificial light source. I love natural light, as most of us do. It's easy to work with. What you see is what you get. Uh, I would love to have uh, a textured wall, like a brick wall, uh, a wood wall, something like that. And then, of course, I'd love to have a park-like setting, again, to give my client diversity. So I hope that makes sense. That's what I'm looking for. Open shade would be ideal. That's great. Quick question from Sid's Designs. Does Taylor ever shoot the girls while Sal shoots the guys, or do they always stay together for this scenario? We always stay together because Taylor's providing balance to right. my portfolio. And but the slideshow. And of course, again, the slideshow. We wouldn't want to have Taylor, unless there was a serious time crunch, right? But again, it comes back to the timeline. If you own the timeline, you know if there's going to be a time crunch. But I wouldn't have Taylor go off, do all the girls this way, and me go with the guys, mostly because I need those images on the same camera for the slideshow uh, later that night. Okay, I have a question from Vil Fucci, and I can't actually find it right now, but I think what she, the gist of her question was that when she tries to get creative, because she's a creative wedding shooter as well, the people always look at her like, aren't we going to just stand in a line and do these shots? Like, how do you combat that kind of creative difference that they're not expecting? Yeah, yeah, that, and that happens to us all the time. Um, so I will tell you exactly what I say when I walk into the room with the groomsmen. And this, I set the tone right in the morning with the bridesmaids. So I'll say, I'll, I'll walk into the room, and I'll do this both with the groomsmen and bridesmaids again. I walk into the room, I'm like, hey, guys, um, where's all my bridesmaids? Hey ladies, my name is Sal Sincata. I am the photographer today, and uh, here's what I need you to do for me. Be ready to have some fun. 
And so what we're not going to do is we're not going to do any cheesy pictures. We're not jumping in the air for no apparent reason. Uh, I just want you to be silly. I don't understand why people jump in the air. That's my biggest pet peeve, right? <laughs> if, you, if you're just gay and happy, then jump in the air. But uh, other than that, stop jumping for no reason. And it, I think it's a girl thing. You girls started making us dudes jump in the air. And I don't know many guys who just want to be like. Unless they're on a snowboard. Yeah. <laughs> a snowboard, and yes. Jump, baby. Jump. Get some air. But other than that, I don't want to jump in my tux. Anyway, I usually, it usually creates a laugh or two when I say that to the bridesmaids. I'm like, we're not going to be doing anything like that. We're going to have fun. And I want you to start thinking more like a fashion magazine and less like a wedding. So if you've been in a wedding before, we are not going to pose in a pyramid. Do not pose that way. I'm going to yell at you. Other than that, think magazines, magazines, magazines. And that just sets the tempo right out of the gate. I like that a lot. That's awesome. Awesome. Question from Bodman. Are you leaving enough room for cropping? Or are you just shooting like you know you're going to use it? I shoot the way I know I'm going to use it, right? That we've all heard cropping camera, get it the way you want it. Uh, there are times, though, where I'm not quite sure. But this comes down to experience. I think because we've been shooting weddings for so long, I know where I need to leave room and when I can get away with cropping in tighter. Uh, but that comes back to, again, my system, our system, tight, middle, wide. So you will see shots coming off, even in this group of shots, and I know they're not showing every single frame coming off the camera. I'm shooting at 70 millimeters, 135 millimeters, 200 millimeters. And what that's giving me is a variety of crops so that I have everything I could possibly need, even if I shoot too tight. You want to keep taking a few more? Yeah, let's take a few more. Okay. Because I'm going to stop. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass on, on the alley. We don't need the alley. Okay. I think, we've, I think I, we have established what we need here. Uh, so that people understand difficult uh, situations. And I think this is a pretty difficult situation, and we were still able to make something uh, out of it. Absolutely. Okay, this question is from Underland Sounds and Images. When the second shooter is getting shots from almost the same angle, is that a problem with models' eyes? Yes, we've covered that. So Have we? Okay, I th I sorry. Think he, he tuned out. The yeah. only time I'll get close to Sal is if I am right over his shoulder with a different lens, different composition, so that it looks like they're looking right at me because I'm right over his shoulder. Okay. It is a problem. So you've got to make sure you control your second shooters. If I'm directing a group and Taylor's right here photographing, the group is going to get very confused on who they should look at, me or Taylor. So Taylor is either in right next to me on my hip so here. that they're looking the same way. Or she is completely off at a completely different angle to avoid any confusion whatsoever. So, great question, but you just got to make sure you don't, uh, you got to control your second shooter. Okay. Question from Tara V. Photos. Any strategies with photographing this? Oh, I'm sorry. Any strategies, this is from Tara V. Photo, any strategies with photographing receiving lines after the ceremony? Yeah, we, uh, so when the receiving line is going to happen, the primary shooter, I won't go and, and shoot the receiving line. I just let my uh, secondary shooter go cover that. Usually the receiving line, it can either happen at the church, they're doing an exit, or row exit, right? So the bride and groom are exiting each row. Or they go to the end of the church and the doors open and the bride and groom are getting all this beautiful natural light on them as the guests are coming out of the church. Either way, my second shooter is covering it. And I would say I don't let them capture more than about 25 frames of the exit because no one really uses those images. Do okay. you agree? Yes, definitely. Sounds awesome. Question from Rick Star One Photography. Going back to the family formals, can you explain your philosophy on starting with just the couple and building instead of the reverse? Yes, uh, that's a great. That's a really good question. So the reason I like building. Uh, into it because it truly is we're just building up if I put everybody out there at once and then I'm like okay you're gone uh, it becomes you start hurting cats because everybody wants to start saying goodbye to each other okay I'll give you a hug I'll see you at the reception <laughs> and now everything really slows down and again I'm about speed and efficiency so I'd rather build the groups up have everyone paying attention because they never know when their name's going to be called and then then let that whole side of the family go verse the building it and then start tearing away. It, it tends to be a little bit more clumsy. I've tried both, and the way we do it is really, really efficient. Seems like you've really thought this wedding photography thing through. So. <laughs> you know, we shoot one or two weddings a year, so <laughs> we're, uh, we give it a little thought. Uh, maybe just a couple more, and then yeah, we can and then go we can to break, lunch. Yeah, we can okay. break for lunch. Bailey KR says, or sorry, uh, Fashion TV from Singapore, would you uh, suggest we shoot from a higher angle uh, like top down on the families, like from a balcony or a higher floor, or are we able to flash downwards? Do you ever do you, that shot? 
Yeah, we don't do that shot. I, I've seen it before where you get the entire group outside. I, I don't want to say we don't do it. If we've got, every once in a while, we'll have a client that wants everybody at the wedding in one giant photograph, like where there's two or 300 people. Well, clearly, there's not many altars in the world that are going to fit 300 people on it. In that scenario, yes, we'll go outside. The, we, that case, I'd go outside. I wouldn't do it inside. Uh, but let's talk about their scenario. I would go off up on a balcony uh, for that kind of shot or up on a ladder for that kind of shot if you have it. And you're still going to bounce that flash off the ceiling. And it's going to work well for you now because now instead of them looking straight at you, they are tilted up a little bit. So now that bounce is really going to fill their entire face uh, with that. But ideally, what I would do is I'd take that group outside the church. I'd probably stand on the higher level steps and then just get a giant shot using probably a 24 by 70 uh, lens, not even a 1635. So a lot of people are starting to ask about the slideshow. And yes. uh, Mofo85 says, who takes care of putting that together? How long does it take to put that together? Is that something you would plan for in the timeline as well? Uh, the, the short answer is we are going to cover that this afternoon, and I'm going to show you exactly how I build a slideshow. But let me give you the, the uh, longer answer. A, I'm the one building the slideshow. B, timeline again. We own the timeline, so we tell the bride and groom we need time to build the slideshow because it is being built from the pictures of that day. Uh, it usually happens during cocktail hour, uh, and that's when we build it. When you it. build it. Well, that's when I'm building it, right. When I play it is, at, is just before the dances begin, right after dinner. But we will cover that later this afternoon, and you'll watch me start editing pictures, and, and I'll tell you everything uh, about how we do it. I think you'll be impressed. Okay, just to ask again, when we come back from break, what will we be doing right when we come back? When we come back from break, um, we will be doing... Reception? The reception. We're covering the reception. Uh, and then in the, the latter part of the afternoon, we're going to do the slideshow, uh, talk about some social media aspects. What happens after the wedding. What happens after time. the wedding. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Great. So it's going to be about reception coverage when we get back. First dances, multiple lighting techniques, uh, things like that. So, And we're taking a, a longer lunch, correct? That's what I was just going to try to find out, was if somebody could tell us how long lunch is, that'd be great. An right. hour lunch. Hour lunch. Thank okay. you. So, everyone, we're going to take an hour lunch, and I just want to let everyone know that the contest that Sal and Taylor are giving, the $9,000 win three days with Sal Sincata, those entries are due by noon tomorrow. Got to get on it. You guys are, you guys are running out of time. So I'm just going to walk you through quickly what you need to do to enter this contest and win three days with Sal and Taylor Sincata. It's a value of $9,000. So you need to purchase this course, Wedding Photography Boot Camp. Um, in the body of the email, you need to include your full name and the username for your Creative Live account. You need to either in the body of the email or in an attachment, like a PDF, tell us in 200 words or less how working side by side with Sal and Taylor for three days will transform your business. And then also attach a business plan, PDF, or a Word file, preparing uh, using the business blueprint, blueprint template that they have provided. And um, also, it's included in the course materials. Yeah, I think, dude, we, do, do you want to talk about the... Yeah, you you guys got to get on. I'm giving you an amazing opportunity to train side by side with Taylor and myself. Uh, we will impart everything we know into you and invest in your business so that you can walk away and just kind of recreate our business model in your market. And I, I, that's got to be, I think that's incredible. So you're yeah. going to have like kind of the South and Cotta franchise opportunity in your uh, local market. I get 2%. <laughs> yeah, sorry for sorry for having to spell that out, but I just want to be very specific of what it takes to do this, and it's very easy. So and where can they find that information? They can find the thank you, Kenna. They yeah. can find the information <laughs> on the Creative Live blog. It's and about four posts down. Yeah, so go to the blog and scroll down, and the link for the blog is creativelive.com/blog. Nice. <laughs> okay. Play to win, everyone. There are so many people are saying such wonderful things. Awesome. Again, we're now on day four. We still have a full day and a half to go. We're in uncharted territory here. Normal Seriously. classes on Creative Live are three days, Seriously. Man, so we're keeping the momentum going. So just one comment from DDD967 who says, this is a great, great wedding photography course. I've been studying wedding photography religiously for a year, and some of the tiny details he's mentioning I just haven't seen explained so clearly and simply elsewhere. And I just think that sums up how 
detailed we were able to get in this five-day workshop that is uncharted territory. And so if this is something that you are liking, truly $149, today is the day to get it. The deal goes away after the workshop is over. And go ahead and do that now. There's, you can see on the course page uh, all the different things that are included along with this course, not just the videos. And it's just thank you. Thank you, both of you, for providing this education to all of these people out there so that we can raise the bar of, of the industry and be successful. And just, again, another thank you to our bride and groom and wedding party. So, folks, have a lovely break. Let your brain get a little bit of rest before we dive into more this afternoon. And we will see you back in one hour. Welcome back from break, everyone. We are here at Soto Park um, here in Seattle with Sal and Taylor Sincotta. Big shout out to Soto Park. Thank you so much. We are loving this building. And um, we're going to get started pretty quick, but I need to give away a prize first. The prize we're giving away is Evolve Edit $200 post-production credit. This is so awesome. I can't wait to start using Evolve Edit, by the way. You've been talking. I know you have been. I'm very excited. OK, and the winner is Trina Knutson. Trina uh, put her quote up on Facebook, and the quote is, I am about speed and efficiency, ROI, baby. There that we go. that, that is, is a quote. business. That yeah. is a business. She's a business person. Yep. She's thinking right, man. She's got her mind right. That's, That's awesome. Right. That's right. So congratulations to Trina. Thank you again to Evolve Edits for donating that as well. All right, so over lunch, if uh, we mentioned it before going to lunch, but we put Sal to a challenge. You know, we're, we're restrained kind of in this building, and Sal's normal thing is out and about in the middle of streets and such. So we gave him the challenge that was going to be part of the later download. Um, however, what it was was whether he could get his creative money shots in 10 minutes or less. And he nailed it. Sal eight minutes. Of course. I eight did it minutes. in eight minutes. That was the tell challenge, us, tell right? Tell us about it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, obviously this is an instructional environment. If you've seen my website and my work, this is not ideal for me. But you know what? Welcome to the real world. We don't always have the best scenarios, and I think all of us deal with those challenges differently. And for you as photographers out there, I hear your, your pleas all the time. You're like, Sal, there's no way my bride and groom are going to give me an hour and a half to go do creatives. Well, I stepped up to the challenge. I did it in 10 minutes or less. That was the challenge. In eight minutes, not only did I get a series of tight, middle, wide, vertical, horizontal, creative shots, I also got off-camera flash going using the technique that I teach everyone. And we nailed it. So that is part of the additional download, I guess, right. with purchasing the course to see how quickly we move through that. But uh, we'll see system. some of those, I think, in the slideshow. Yeah, as part of the, the slideshow, shots, we'll show you some of those images. How you did it, like everybody, you can do this. If your bride and groom are saying, "Oh, we don't want have enough time to do the artsy stuff," 
Eight minutes. Yeah, eight minutes. Off camera flash. You can be do it. Yeah, yeah. It can be done. Taylor does right. it. Our second shooters do it. We all work in this rhythm, this system, and it really does work. So, uh, yeah. Well, let's get back to it. Let's get back to it. Yes, we have an action-packed afternoon. I cannot even believe that this day is almost over. Uh, you know, I, I feel like the way things have been going, we could probably go from like 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. every day. Well, and I'm glad we're not. Yes, I, I'm glad we're not, too. <laughs> and some of you out there, man, they will write, people will write on my walls, you two. I can't believe it. They're like, Sal, wake up. We need to get our learn on, uh, the people from the East Coast. So, uh, <laughs> pushy people. Um, but so here we are, right? We're at the reception. And what is the first thing? Uh, you know, first of all, let's talk about what has to happen when we're here. Anything the couple spent money on is something that has to be photographed. Establishing shot again, so a wide shot of the room. Who, what, when, where, why, right? Where are we? What are the details in the room? So to your point, establishing shot, big shot of mm -hmm. the room, and then what are you doing as soon as you walk in the room? As soon as I walk in the room, I find the DJ because I want to get in sync on the timeline for the rest of the evening because, you know, sometimes even though we had that conversation with the bride, she may not have had the conversation with the D DJ. And so I just want to make sure he's aware that I'm here and the timeline that I have, compare it with his, and that way we're on good terms and he'll wait until he sees me for any big event to happen. So Hang now, tight, man. He's the, my buddy. Yeah, yeah, the Internet is a buzz right now, I'm <laughs> sure, because you and I both know that when we're talking to photographers, <laughs> the one thing they tell us is that when they get to the reception, they feel like they lose control, the timeline's all over the place, and then the next thing you know, they're staying there till midnight waiting for, like, the dollar dance or something. Uh, so, once again, you're going to hear this timeline. I'm almost tired of saying it. I know. Timeline uh, is so imperative. That's why we included that form for you guys. When that form is there, that becomes your Bible for the event. And we take that timeline. We now walk up to the DJ, introduce ourselves, just like we would with the priest, just like we would with... Um, um, you know, the church lady or whomever. Right. Hey, I'm Taylor. I'm Sal. Um, just want to check in with you before we get going tonight. Here's what my timeline looks like. According to the bride, dinner served at 7 p.m., uh, first dances, slideshow, et cetera, et cetera. What, with that being said, give us like uh, two good stories. One where uh, there was trouble, thank God we talked to the DJ, and another where, you know, what's our normal scenario? Because we don't typically run into trouble because of this timeline document. Yeah, I, I don't know that I can remember a time where there was trouble, just because we always kind of cover that. Uh, but Slideshow trouble we run into, right? So the slide bride is supposed to... Slideshow the bride to forgets to tell the DJ that there's a slideshow and that the DJ has to play music for it. So that's why I tell the bride you have to tell the DJ to play five songs, but they always forget. And so that's one of the things we cover as soon as we go introduce ourselves to the DJ is, hey, did she tell you about the slideshow? No? Okay, well, we're playing a slideshow right after dinner, and we need you to play five songs. Michael Bublé, John Mayer, that type of stuff usually ends up being perfect for it. But it's important we coordinate with him, especially if you're considering doing the slideshow, so that he knows exactly where, when it's supposed to be. If we didn't tell him, uh, he would go off and do his own thing. Well, and he's also going to be making an announcement. So we asked the DJ to let people know five minutes in advance that, hey, there's going to be a slideshow with pictures from today. Uh, make sure you get up and watch. And so... If he doesn't like you, he's going to make a crappy announcement or no announcement at all. So it's important to get on his good graces, too. Right, right. And, and something else to consider is the DJ is typically, once you get into the reception, I feel like the reception hall or the DJ is really marching to their own beat at this point, even though you've been with the couple. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important to get into that room with the DJ, band, uh, whomever, and really have this meeting of the minds uh, just to get in sync because the DJ... Yeah, he knows he's got to do the bouquet garter toss, but guess what the DJ's primary concern is? Dancing. That's all he cares about. He does not care about your timeline or your agenda. Or, and so what I want to do is I want to go sit with that DJ and be like, hey, FYI, dude, I'm out of here at 9 o'clock tonight. Coverage ends at 9. I need to ensure that the dances, cake cut, and everything are done before 9. We can do it at whatever pace you want, but they have to be done by the time I'm out of here. Having that conversation with the DJ is priceless to getting in sync. So mm -hmm. I hope that absolutely makes sense for everybody. Let's talk about um, when we walk into the room, okay, let's come back to mindset and a shot list and what we have to have. I know my mindset when I walk into the room again, and I, we teach all our second shooters this, if they spent money on it, photograph it. And I'm going to tell a horror story uh, because that's the only way I know how to the teach people. The lattice one? The lattice one. I already one. told that one. You told that story? Yeah. When did you tell it? Oh, we were over there at the ceremony. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. So you told it on air? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I must have zoned out. All right. So uh, we all have those horror stories. The lattice story is one of those. It looked like a 1980 lattice. My bride was completely irritated 
that I didn't get that photograph of the lattice, but it was just more like a, a, a backstop, and yeah. she spent money on it, and I missed it, and I never heard the end of it. So okay. we're going to miss shots just like you do, but again, your, your rhythm, your progression, if you will, has to be looking for things they spent money on, napkins, M&Ms, no matter how trivial it is, get an isolated shot of that. Uh, flash or no flash? Uh, we try and shoot with no flash for as long as possible, but usually by the time you get to the reception, you don't have an option. You have to use flash. So. Well, and the venue we're in today is, I would say, indicative of, of some half the sure. venues we go to. Yeah. There's a lot of venues. By the time we get to cocktail hour, it's 5 o'clock, 5.30, especially in the summertime. There is natural light coming in yeah. the room, and we will opt initially to photograph without any um, flash whatsoever, right? Mm -hmm. It just changes the look and feel of the image. Even if it gets into the night, if we can shoot with our 51.2 or, you know, go really down low in our f-stop, we'll do that versus using flash. If we can, you can't always do that. Right. you got to open up, right. right, fast glass. This is, again, where it comes into play. 1.2 is our friend uh, in this situation, right? We're not layering people. That bokeh effect looks uh, really good. And just so you guys know, it's not bokey. Right? Bokeh. <laughs> bokeh. All right. So, <laughs> I was laughing people say it. So. Bokey. Okay. Bokey. Um, so, what I want to do is, um, right now, uh, I'm not tethered, I need to get tethered, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to photograph um, some of these details without any flash whatsoever. Option number two, before we would pull out flash, once again, my handy dandy video light. SEMA light, $29 B&H, pick it up. Um, to me, this is just a no-brainer. I've got four of these in my bag, and these are going to make my uh, images, uh, you know, look really good. And I'm just going to have my assistant overhead lighting that stuff. Who's photographing? Uh, primary shooter or secondary shooter? When we walk in, depending on what's going on, uh, I'm going to start building the slideshow. In the slideshow, typically, we don't have reception detail images, and I'm okay with that, right? That's not what needs to be in the slideshow. I don't want to end the slideshow on a picture of the cake. I want to end the slideshow on a, a dramatic picture that maybe I got outside, right? Some of our architecturally based images. Or if they have a cocktail hour, he might be photographing the reception details while the second shooter would be photographing the cocktail hour and getting candid down there. Exactly. That is a time that we would in fact, we would in fact split up with each other. So, right, th here's my mindset. I don't have a, we don't have couples putting a whole lot of images of the uh, cocktail hour in their album, but they still want to see them for some reason, right? We are, we're all in that boat. It drives us nuts. We're taking pictures that we know they're not going to use. But ultimately, they want them just so they know they were taken. Um, and so I, I'm willing to let my second shooter go do some of that stuff. The most important thing for me is, is doing the slideshow. And if, you know, if I don't have to do the slideshow, uh, that's, that's fine too. I'll shoot the room. Let's come back to that. Sometimes cocktail hour is in the same room uh, as the actual reception. And I got asked earlier, would I clear the room? Nah, you're not going to be able to clear the room. That's not reality. If you're doing a higher end event, cocktail hour, or a mid-level event, cocktail hour is separated from the main uh, reception area. In that case, make it a priority to get in that room. And I don't know if everybody remembers from day one, on day one we talked about vendor referrals. So we want a picture of the room with empty, showcasing the detail, print that image out and deliver that to the reception venue and you are gonna make a lot of friends. Uh, so those are the things we need to be able to do. Uh, questions around that. We've talked about talking to the cake lady, uh, all cake those lady? other things. Not the, yeah, well, we'll go with the cake lady <laughs> since she was a church lady. We'll just we'll keep the trend going. Meals. Yes, that's what I want to talk about. Don't Me put it in your contract. Oh, for crying out loud, man. Really? Where, what job have you worked? I guess I'm spoiled because I, I come from corporate America, or at least my mindset, maybe it's tainted is a better word. Um, I come from corporate, and when I signed on in corporate, they weren't like, yes, we pay for your lunch. You get a guaranteed hot meal and three 15-minute breaks during the day. That's absolutely preposterous to think you were going to request hot meals. Uh, if you work with me or have worked side by side with me, you know you're lucky to get a freaking granola bar if, uh, <laughs> if I feed you. So don't be a diva. You're not going to request a meal in your contract. Most venues will, 98% of the time, have a vendor meal for the band, for the DJ. They know to do this. Let's say, worst case scenario, you don't. Our team, what do we do? We would snack on some hors d'oeuvres or go or ask cooler. the venue. We have a cooler. Yeah, we have a cooler. We could ask the venue, hey, do they provide ven vendor meals? That sort of thing. Right. Or we might even order from the hotel. If it's a hotel, we'll order from the restaurant, have our assistant go get it. Right. Or a cooler. 
cooler. So in the cooler, <laughs> uh, in our cooler, we have snacks throughout the day, bottled water, Gatorade. We have a giant cooler on ice in our car, uh, and we're not expecting anyone to feed us. If we get fed, icing on the cake. But God, come on, guys, we're already getting paid to work this event. To think that we can request a meal is ridiculous. And I've seen a lot of your contracts, and in the contracts, there's an included uh, meal. And I see some of you girls shaking your heads. <laughs> Oh, for saying that. Yeah, somebody had to make the call here, man. It's just like <laughs> we're photographers, not rock stars. Like, I'm going to start handing over a, uh, my rider, and it's going to be like Sal Sincata wants white M&Ms, or he well, just can't photograph. Well, we saw someone's contract where it said they had to have a hot meal. Like, they couldn't have a, a cold, you know, sandwich vendor meal. They had to have a hot meal, whatever the guests were eating. It's not uncommon. A lot I of photographers do it. I can't believe people would put that in their contract. Yeah, no, that's insane. So just buy your own damn meal. You're getting paid for it. <laughs> All right, so... What else we got? Cake cut. Now, here are the must-have shots. We know that we're going to do a cake cut. We know that we're going to do first dances. We know that we're going to do um, bouquet garter, lighting on camera. I'm going to show you a couple of different lighting sources. I'm going to show you with a flash on camera. I'm going to show you how I run around with a video light. And then I'm doing something new now with my lighting is I've got two lights on light stands with light modifiers. So I'll show you how I would use that as well. So that's really the focus of this. So let's with that being said, let's start photographing here uh, and just doing some details. So I'll start shooting. First thing I'm going to do on this particular camera, I've got my uh, 24 millimeter 1.4 lens. And I'm going to shoot wide open uh, on this. Mess here, hold on. And so here I've got the cake, right? So I want to isolate each one of these details. And I'm, I've been told to slow down my shooting so I can get you guys seeing this online. And so there's a shot of the cake. You can see the light, the string lights behind. And that's the kind of stuff I'm doing. So of course, I'm going to take, same concept, right? Tight, middle, wide. As best you can, take as many shots uh, of, the, uh, of the details as you can. Now I'm going to get in a little bit tighter, which I don't burn myself. OK, I'm focusing on the flowers, 1.4. Now you're seeing that side of the cake. Now I'm going to go. I don't know if some of you have seen this. I go right over the cake, right, and I take a shot like that. And I like that shot. I don't know if we're showing uh, 595 up on the screen, um, but I like the way that shot's looking. It's a different perspective. If I want to come in again and maybe change my angle, okay, I think that's a really cool shot. That's a neat detail shot that we're able to showcase uh, of the cake. So now, maybe I'm done with the cake. I move on, right? I'm not going to obsess here and, and spend all this detail around something. I'm just thinking about the album. Now I'm going to come in, right? And of course, you know, we've got this set up here. Well, guess what? I want to get one wide shot of the entire table. So maybe I come in and I do something like this. Maybe I come in and I come up top. OK? If I can, I'm going to get on a chair. Then I'm going to get in again, and I love angles on this stuff, right? So I don't particularly care to shoot this kind of stuff straight on. I like very shallow depth of field. Okay, yes, I'll move food if I need to. Okay, we're putting the strawberry in focus. Okay, I like that kind of stuff. Maybe we've got some champagne here. Uh, maybe it's a nice bottle of champagne, so I'll always check. Right? If it's the cheap stuff, then I don't want to photograph that necessarily. I'll find an artistic way to do it. If it's an expensive bottle of Dom, then I'm going to photograph that. that. Um, right? Again, it's all about little things like this. Right? So I'm putting the cork in focus, everything else soft. And again, I'm just thinking about the album, guys. Right? Maybe I take this, and I didn't know, do we have place card settings? No? Okay. So I would take place card settings if we had them. Set this up with the glasses of champagne. And I'm just working these details, guys. OK? And then, so that's it for this, this table here. OK, so I've covered each thing on this table. Now I'm going to walk around and look at some of these other tables. What's here that they've spent money on? That is my driving force. So they spent money on chairs, OK? So they had to pay for the chairs. So now I'm going to take a big shot of the table, different angles. I'm going to come in and get a shot of the table setting, right? Some nice hotels, they've got chargers, things like that. 
Then I'm going to sit down. Always put the chair back when you sit down. Remember, people have spent a tremendous amount of time setting up this table, making the investment in it, and they hate photographers when they show up in the room, move a chair, move play settings, and then don't put them back. Be sensitive to what, you know, people, their time, and that they've invested. So now I'm going to take some pictures here of just this uh, play setting. Remember, anything they've spent money on. Uh, my camera's having fun focusing on a white plate. There we go. Okay. Then I'm going to take again a picture of, can I get my 1635? Mm -hmm. I'm going to take a picture of this flower. Am I shooting slow enough, guys? All right. Take a picture of this. Oop, I went plus one by accident. Sorry. Okay. Now Maybe I'm going to take... I've been asking to see the lens exchange between us two. Oh, uh, okay. You guys want to see the lens exchange? Where Can I get a camera that's somewhat tight? All right. So, you're going to come here because I'm right-handed. All right. So, your second shooters, all right, have to be able to work together um, and exchange gear with you. So, there's something uh, everyone on my team has to know how to do this. This is learned on the bag. Taylor is about to hand me glass with the red dot up. So she's holding it in her hand. Okay, red dot up. Hold on. Red dot up so that I can come in and grab over the top. I want to be able to come in and grab this with my right hand. She's going to grab with her left hand, but notice with my left hand, I'm pressing the release button on the lens, on the camera. So that's releasing the lens. She's going to grab. I'm going to grab. Go ahead. I'm still looking at you guys. I come right in done. I never broke eye contact with you. That's because of the way she's handing me that. And in real time, this would look something like this. Done. Okay, so that's how quickly we're exchanging gear. So imagine if you're talking to, your, to the friends. Okay, guys, here's what we're going to do. We're going to come over here. Let's go do this. And I'm done. That's it. That's how quickly we have to be able to exchange gear because equipment cannot get in the way of the shot. And so I don't know if that impresses you or not. Everybody was asking us in the chat rooms to show you that. And so that's how our team is trained to exchange equipment. Um, so let's come back to the table. Okay, what, I am, what I'm going to do is I want this table shot here. Okay, let's adjust my settings. All right, and I might come over here and get that top down shot. And so I love shots like this. Right, show us 615. I love getting shots like that when I can uh, because it's a different perspective uh, from an overhead down. You don't particularly see that. And so be conscious when you're st standing on chairs because people may not like you standing on their uh, chairs at the venue, but it definitely provides interesting perspective for the table settings. So we've isolated uh, almost everything on this table. If they had menu placements here, we would take pictures of the menus. Uh, if they had a guest book, we would take pictures of the guest book. Anything they spent money on is what we would do. Now, we did this all with natural light. Okay, we could just as easily come in and added video light to light some of this stuff up. So, that being said, ladies, questions? Internet. Let's get up. Sorry, we're working. Sorry, ladies. So, I have a question from Fashion TV from Singapore. It says, wedding vendors usually require specific detail shots in a reception. Would you suggest we entertain their requests and shoot what they require, or do you need to shoot their images since it's the couple who engaged us in the first place? Yeah, I'm confused. That if doesn't a, happen to you ever? That doesn't happen to me at all. They they're, didn't, they're not paying me. So the wedding venue shouldn't tell me anything. Uh, except Singapore. thanks for coming, stopping by. Um, <laughs> so, but let's, let's take his question for, for what we're, how we're hearing it. Uh, you know, here stateside, the venues are not requesting images of us. Uh, from us at the day of the event, right? They're not telling me I want a picture of this, this, and this. They didn't pay me. I wouldn't be responding to them. However, I, with that being said, if I were to be asked for certain shots by the venue, I would oblige because I want to be on their preferred vendor list. So if I get to the room and they're telling me there's a big wide, we need that big wide shot of the room, okay, then I'm going to take that big wide shot for them uh, just to make them happy because they're going to end up using that image on their website and that's ultimately what I want. 
And so I'm going to try and take a shot that I can edit, maybe HDR, maybe dodge and burn it, just do something really cool with it so that they're using it in their marketing and advertising. If you go uh, in St. Louis and pick up any of those bridal magazines, you're guaranteed to see anywhere from five to ten of our images in the magazine that are not tied to our studio uh, in the sense of it's not a Salvatore Sincata ad. It's an ad for a venue. It's an ad for a, right, a catering hall, something like that. And then it says photo credit Salvatore Sincata. And we do that by photographing the room and all that stuff for the venue. So a question from Jules Gray says, uh, how do you get the empty set up room if you've made it there after all the guests have <coughs> crashed it? You don't. If you get there after the guests have, that's one that comes back to a timeline discussion. Right. Uh, but if it, that happens to us from time to time where the ceremony and the cocktail hour are in, or the reception and the cocktail hour are in the same room. When that happens, there's just nothing you can do. You have to just shoot the room as it stands. And that's where getting a fast piece of glass and photographing at 1.2, 1.4 really blows everything out of focus and you can isolate detail. So that is why I love like a 50 millimeter 1.2 or 2414, because then it d somebody could be standing three feet behind the cake and you won't see him. Okay, ladies, are you okay? Do you have any questions? Yeah? Okay. Um, so someone had asked earlier, how do you get all of these shots and get the wedding party, all of this before the reception? How do you end it, how, how much time do you spend in here total, I guess? In the room beforehand? Yeah. I could probably knock out this room in about 15 minutes. Uh, I don't need more than 15 minutes in an empty room. I, I have no idea what you're doing in the room if you need more than 15 minutes. And again, you've got to understand what drives my behavior. Uh, there, there's probably true artists out there that are cringing right now at maybe the way I work and my workflow. And it, I get it. I have respect for you. I'm a business person. Business first and foremost. And I know I'm not going to sell this amazingly artistic cake picture to my bride and groom that they're going to put on a wall. It's not going to happen at all. So what I'm doing is making sure I get the images I need of the cake that are complementary in the album. You know what I know they're going to spend money on? The artistic and creative images that we create outside. So if you're obsessing about like your cake pictures and making sure the flowers are just in the perfect spot and you're looking for just the exact perfect compositional elements to be around and back, whew, that's exhausting. I would never do that, man. You've got to focus on what matters and what sells. And don't listen to me. Listen to your clients, listen to their dollars, because they're going to tell you what they want. Right, Fifteen so, minutes. So a couple of folks were freaking out when you jumped up on those chairs and said... <laughs> Was Amanda freaking out? That's all that matters. <laughs> Not Amanda. <laughs> um, and said, has a venue ever freaked out on you when you have jumped up on chairs or no. you worry about getting stuff dirty? The other one was, how do you get your feet not in there? Yeah, my feet were in this particular one, so you've okay. got to have really long arms uh, to do it. And... Uh, so here, a couple of things. Um, you've got to use common sense. If it's a very high-end venue and there's like white table uh, or chair covers, things like that, do not stand on the table, right, or on the chair. That's, common sense has to prevail. If they're just standard chairs, things like that, I will always stand on, on top of them. Get on, up and down. Take off your shoes if you have to. Be respectful uh, in that situation. That being said, um, you know, this almost happened to me. This was about four months ago. I, um, I move very quickly, left and right, and you've watched me on camera. I don't pay attention to what I'm doing sometimes. I'm only paying attention to what's in front of me. And we were in this, this was probably, probably like a $60,000 wedding, $70,000 wedding in St. Louis, a very expensive wedding. And they had this like five-tier cake, and it was on a roller stand uh, for the cake. And I was moving back and forth very quickly. And I moved back. I kept going back. And I hit the cart almost at full speed. And my second shooter happened to be behind me and thumped me in the back as I was coming into the cake. They're like, Sal, watch out. Smacked me in the back, but I still hit it. The cake cart started sliding across the entire dance floor, uh, heading towards the band station. And it, it's, it was almost like slow. You know, we were like, no, right? I mean, we had to run and grab it, stopped it. That cake almost fell five minutes before the bride and groom walked in the room. Uh, I don't think I would have ever been invited back to that, to that venue. So the, the truth of it is, man, this crazy stuff happens to all of us, including us. So um, pay attention to where you're moving, I guess. All right, Karen Loudon said, how do you shoot a buffet setup with the food in it? I find it really hard to make this look good. It is, 1.2. Uh, <laughs> very, very shallow depth of field. Uh, I tend, that's a good question, though. I want to expand on that. We don't spend a whole lot of time photographing food. 
uh, just because the caterer, that's not what I'm known for, right? So I don't want to photograph food and um, put that on their website, photos courtesy of Salvatore Sincata. That's not really what I'm looking to do. I take a couple of creative shots of like hors d'oeuvres, things like that, but I don't spend a whole lot of time shooting plated food either. So if it's a sit-down dinner, I'm not going to photograph plated food. And definitely if it's a uh, buffet, you know, take one or two shots just so the couple sees it. But I mean, how interesting can you make a giant thing of peas look? I, I don't think that's very interesting. And do you not shoot at all when people are eating? No. Great question. I stop shooting when people are eating. Let's expand on that as well. The, the days of the 1980s when you would gather the table shots and have uh, half the table go on the other and stand up very traditionally and form, we don't do that anymore. Those days are gone. Uh, when dinner starts, we do not disturb people by photographing them. No one's doing anything with it. It's not going in the wedding album. Uh, don't waste your time. Don't waste your battery power. And just let your guest be, uh, you know, uh, uninterrupted. That's what they want at that part of the, the night. Can we expand on that a little bit more? Yeah. So that's 30 minutes that you are doing what? 30 minutes that th everyone's eating? That what, are, what are you doing? We'll either eat, right, take a break, or 90% of the time I'm building my slideshow. So that 30 minutes is when I get to build my actual slideshow. Without that, I wouldn't be able to, to build it. But, you know, the couple gets it. You've been working with them since 9.30, 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I, no one's losing their mind because I, I took a 30-minute break or, or an hour-long break. Just, be, you know, be alert, be listening, so that when the if dancing starts or something starts, you're not in another room somewhere. Be uh, proactive. Talk to the DJ. If you've talked to the DJ, what will end up happening is, he will know to get you. This is a horror story I've heard over and over again from photographers. You step out of the room, and the DJ continues on with whatever events he's doing, and he never looks to even see if you're in the room. And we make sure that the DJ knows, hey, man, we're stepping out there feeding us dinner in the hallway. Please don't start anything until we're there. This is where communication uh, really helps you. Okay, I have one more follow-up. Yeah. And just so you know, we have about 35 minutes till our next break. Okay. Um, do you let the bride and groom know that before the wedding that you're not going to be shooting during the, f during the meal and that you won't be, do you even say anything? I don't even have that conversation okay. with them. Uh, okay. they, they, it's a non-issue, honestly. So I don't know if people out there are having issues with that, but for us, it's an absolute non-issue. Okay, great. Thank you. We good? Yep. yep. All right, so here's what I want to do now. Uh, what I want to do is photograph, I want to get to a point, you know, I don't need to cover uh, the, the, the bridal party arriving. Yes, we're going to take those pictures. We're going to use on-camera flash for that. So, Taylor, can you give me a hand? I need an on-camera flash. I'm not photographing that right now. There's no point in doing it uh, here from an instructional perspective. We're going back to flash on camera. And so if you're following along at home, get your flash on camera. We are going back into manual mode. Whenever my flash is on camera, I'm in manual mode. So my settings, I'm going right to ISO 800. 60th of a second, 4.0, 5.6. Those are going to be my starting settings. And what I want to jump to now are not necessarily the details. Let's do the cake cut. So if we can get the bride and groom here. Let's say bailed on us, Lynn and Chris. And what we're going to do, it's time for you guys to cut your cake. Lynn, take those glasses off for me. All right, now, for movie magic purposes, this is not a real cake. It's a real fake cake. So here's what has to happen. Now, you two hang right there. Again, understanding what we're doing here is very, very important. My couple has never cut a cake before. So they walk in, and they don't know what they're supposed to do. They don't know where they're supposed to stand. That's our job. So I'm the trusted advisor. I'm going to tell them what to do. I always want them opposite me, okay? I don't want to photograph them here. I kind of want to photograph over this cake. I like layers. So I want to see the cake and then see them and then see all this light behind them. So I don't know if you guys can see the string light uh, behind me, but that's ultimately what I want. I want to create a layered, interesting image. So I'm strategically picking, right? What you don't want to do is if there were a wall right here, I don't want to photograph the cake cut this way using flash because then that whole wall is going to be lit up with flash and it doesn't look good. So then I'd have them on the side here and maybe I would photograph from this side. I need depth, right? I need fall off. I don't want my light to light up everything. Um, maybe I would use video light, but for this purpose, I'm going to use flash. So you two, and I instruct all my clients, just so you know, I tell them what to do here. So pay attention. All right, you two. 
I'm going to have you right here. So you're going to come over here, Lynn. Perfect. All right, you're going to come in here, Chris. All right, and what you're going to do, oops, sorry, uh, is we don't have a, a knife, but we can get a pretend knife. Perfect, perfect. Thanks, brother. Yep. All right, and so what we would do, they're going to have the, the, the setting here, right, the cake knife and all that stuff. If this is a family heirloom, which, which sometimes it is, make sure you get a photograph of that. Now what we're going to do is we're going to tell them, and we, can we, yeah, we got this camera on. I tell my couples to cut a wedge, right, so a triangle, because they don't know how to cut the cake. And so I tell them to cut just a wedge and go straight down, put it on your plate, and the wedge should look like this. This is a very healthy piece of cake, by the way. Um, is this real? Yes, I say. I have a good shape. Your wedding cake is delicious. All right. So, but we tell them to cut the cake. It's probably everybody's lighting me up online right now, I'm sure. All right. We tell them to cut the cake, okay, in a wedge, bring it down, feed each other, and then give each other a kiss. That's what I tell them to do. Now I come over here. Remember, they don't know what to do. Now I come over here. I'm here as the primary. Taylor is my secondary, and I've lost her. She's over here photographing hands and expression and then maybe taking some risk. Maybe Taylor's going to take a shot where the cake is in focus and they're blurry, right? I can't take that shot as the main photographer. I've got to get the must-have shot, which is them feeding each other, Okay, maybe they're having fun with each other, smashing it in their face or not. Or, right, they're being nice to each other. Exactly. We've seen both. Uh, and so that's my job to get the master shot. My second shooter is always at a complimentary angle. So if you're training your second shooters, you need to tell them where to be. That being said, let's get in here. Okay, let me take a test shot. You look good, Lynn. Okay, so what I want you to do What I want you to do is, I want you to slide this way, man. We're getting hard light coming in from outside, and I want to use more flash than anything else. So, uh, Lynn, come on in here. Yeah, can we kill that? That would be awesome. And it's nighttime. Okay. So, <laughs> come on back here. Thank you so much. That was perfect. And now, what I want you to do is pretend to cut the cake. So, you're going to come in there. There you go. Yeah, grab whatever you want. Cut that cake, and then pretend you put it on the plate. Feed each other. Have fun with it. And here's my job, guys. I'm just going to come in here. Make sure I'm getting the images I want. <laughs> right, maybe if I got some time, I'll put this cake in focus, make them blurry. It's a big piece of cake. You can feed each other. Not that whole piece of cake. You're feeling aggressive, Chris. And I'm just letting them be, right? I'm just letting them have a good time with each other, waiting for that moment. You better be nice, Lynn. There you go. And go ahead, give him a little piece. Isn't it good? And no, I don't normally eat my bride and groom's cake, just so everybody knows. And give each other a kiss, guys. Okay? And so... That would be where we would go for a cake cut. That's it. Don't overshoot it. Get a handful of shots. Get the emotion. The emotion is what we're looking for uh, there. And I don't know if you notice, you might be thinking at home, like, does he talk that much to his bride and groom? Yes. I am talking to them all day long, cracking jokes, being silly with them. Um, I mean, before you cut your wedding cake, did you ever know how to cut a wedding cake? No, right? And so they need a little help. And you'll be surprised. You go to these venues, and the venues are like, Okay, go for it, cut your cake. And then they're like, how the hell do I cut this thing, right? I, I'm not a caterer. So I just told them how to cut it, again, reinforcing that I'm the trusted advisor, and that is, again, my job. <coughs> Perfect. Can we clear this table and get dance floor ready? So? So now, what we want to do is, yeah. Some water? Uh, yeah, let me get a sip of water, please. What we want to do now is dance floor pictures. Now, here's, remember, we're not bothering our guests. Uh, we've already photographed all the details, the establishing shots. I'm going to shoot dancing pictures um, three different ways, okay? Um, and this is going to cover uh, mother, daughter, uh, mother, daughter, uh, daughter, son. Holy cow, I'm a mess right now. Somebody is, dan somebody is dancing. 
All right, let me get my voice back. All right, father-daughter, mother-son dance, uh, and, of course, bride and groom. I don't care what's going on. We're going to photograph this the same way. I need two types of shots. I need a wide shot. Again, I'm thinking about the album. And so that's going to be my 1635, and then I need a tighter shot. And for that, I might go to my 50-millimeter uh, lens. And I will be switching lenses, whether my bag's near me, I have an assistant with me, or we're, opting, or we're switching on and off with each other. So you two are going to come out here to the dance floor. I'd like to invite the bride and groom to the dance floor for their first dance as husband and wife. Yes. All right, so what I want to do, just rotate you around this way, okay? And can I get a camera that's seeing my viewpoint? This is perfect. And so what we're doing is I want you to see what I'm looking for. I want ambient light behind them, right? I don't want it to look like we are sh photographing them with a flashlight and you see nothing but blackness behind them. If you've ever seen images like that or your images look like that, that is the first sign of an amateur photographer who doesn't understand their lighting. And all those tips I've been teaching you all week hold true here. Cameras going on manual mode, ISO starts off at 800, 4.0, 60th of a second, right? And I'm using my on-camera flash. That's just one option. I'm going to show you multiple options. So you two, just pretend like you're dancing. Just hang tight right there. You don't have to really dance. We don't have any good music in here. Okay? And so, oh wow, we do have music. Yeah, let's get down. Let's get funky. <laughs> You're not supposed to laugh during your first dance, Lynn. All right, rotate towards me a little bit just for the, these purposes. Keep rotating there. Stay there. There you go. So what I'm looking for, here's a mid shot I would get, guys. Boom. Okay, then I would pull back here, and I'd be looking for this shot. Okay, and I love the way they're dancing with each other. Then I'm going to go vertical. Okay, so these are the shots I'm looking to pull off. So there's a mid, a vertical. Then I might go and switch up to my 50 millimeter. Or your second shooter is doing this. Okay, and what I want to do is, same concept, but here I might shoot at 1.2. So I really want this stuff blown out. And yeah, it's going to require you to get a little closer. That one's a little too hot. I don't know, you guys got to rotate for me. There you go. And, and now, I would not talk to my bride and groom while they're dancing and be like, hey, can you guys rotate for me? That is not what I'm doing. This is for the sake of, of uh, the show. But what I would do is I would not be firing to the back of their head. I would just keep waiting until they kept rotating to me, and that's when I would be getting my master shot. Right? And in here, with 1.2, I can probably go to aperture priority and photograph with no flash whatsoever but I'm blowing out that background. Questions? I want to go back to my 24-7. Uh, people, people are saying, wow, there's music on Creative Live. <laughs> <laughs> we got the rights to that music. Excellent. <laughs> so can we go back to the cake cutting, too? Or? Yeah, absolutely. Go back to whatever you want. All right, we didn't really get to those questions. So uh, quite a few people, including Sarah B. Um, and K. Rice Photos had asked, do people at the reception ever complain about you blocking their view when, say, they're cutting the cake, uh, you know, such as standing in front of them or getting on the dance floor? Do people ever complain to you? That's, uh, that's a pretty interesting question. No, no one ever uh, complains because the DJ, most DJs who know what they're doing will make the announcement, uh, hey, everybody, the bride and groom are going to come up and cut their cake. Uh, please be aware there's a professional photographer up there. Uh, feel free to take pictures if you'd like. Just make sure he can get his shot. So most DJs where we are know to make that announcement, but I've never had anyone complain uh, that we're in the way of them for the, for the uh, cake cut. That would be kind of funny to me. So no, we don't get a, a lot of uh, complaints like that at all. Okay. And don't, don't, you know, don't be turned off because you got one complaint. Everything in this world for me is 80-20 rule, right? So there's always going to be that one off. You can't make everybody happy in the world. You're always going to make someone uh, mad or upset about something. Uh, but I'm trying to keep 90% of the people happy, 95% of the people happy uh, in the world. I, I want to pause here for a second. This has nothing to do with lighting. Uh, let's talk about customer service for two seconds here. You know, everything I'm trying to teach you guys and impart on you with my system, with our processes, everything we're doing is about trying to keep your clients happy. With that being said, do you guys really believe that you could keep 100% of your clients happy? 
I hope nobody out there believes in 100% customer satisfaction. It is impossible, okay? There's 2% of the population that no matter what you do, you are gonna piss them off some way, somehow. So what I do is I invest my time and energy into keeping the 98% of those people happy. Do not let those one-offs, this is why we're talking about this 80-20, or in this case, 98-2, don't let 2% of the population uh, get you off your game. Focus on a strategy and try and keep 98% of your clients happy and you will be going down the right path. Don't let that one person uh, get you off. Yeah. You had mentioned early, right in the very beginning, about when you shoot, when you've noticed maybe that the backdrop is dark and that your subject is lit up, what would somebody be doing? Because I feel like I might be one of those people that what would somebody like me be doing wrong that is getting the back backdrop too wow. dark? Yeah. You're doing two things. You're not dragging your shutter, okay. right? Meaning getting it down below 200th of a second, okay. right? Okay. You can't be in auto mode. You've got to use this simple technique I'm showing you. You can't be in auto mode. You got to get that shutter speed dragging to let in that light back there. Okay. Uh, that's number one. Number two is you, um, you know, make sure that there is light behind them. Okay. Right? There are situations where when we're in a, a like, especially when it's like a conference room or something like that, there is no, there are no lights behind them. So what I'm doing is I'm constantly rotating, looking for that angle where maybe it's the DJ booth. I just need some light behind them. And if you're in a catering hall where they turn off all the lights when dancing starts, uh-uh-uh. Do not be a victim of circumstance. Control your own destiny. I will have my second shooter run over and tell them to lift the lights back up. Not full power, just something so I've got some color back behind them. That's what we're looking to do. You've got to control your own destiny. I like that we keep bringing it back to that. And thank you for that pause and giving perspective on, on customer service. Customer service. It yes. is frustrating. I think as photographers, as artists, we tend to personalize a lot of things. And it's not, you know, I, I think once you get your mind right and understand that you can't make everyone happy, you, you, you can sleep a little better at night. I, I'm trying to make everybody happy, but let, let me give you perspective. We do, we do uh, nine, uh, you know, 300 to 400 photo shoots a year. I would say 95% customer satisfaction is a good number. Wouldn't you? All right, if 95% customer satisfaction is a good number, it, that means I'm pissing off 5% of my clients every year. Well, at 400 photo shoots a year, right, that means I'm making 20 to 25 clients upset. That's a lot of clients to be upset at us. I don't want that many, but 95% customer satisfaction rating is a good rating. And so that's my perspective, guys, after being in business for a while. So take it to heart. Yeah, and put it in perspective. Yeah. Okay, so Saz and DG Photo 81 had both asked, do you jump right in and get that close while they're dancing? And what I'd like to know is, do you give them a few minutes to themselves in their dance before you start shooting? Or, you know, how much time do you give them to do their thing? Or are you shooting the whole time? I close? start wide. And because I'm starting wide, I'm further away. So I am giving them their time right up front. So the first lens I had was a 1635, and I'm back here photographing, okay? So I'm giving them this wide perspective, and then I'm coming in, okay, with a 50 millimeter and getting a little bit closer. But I'm also reading my client. Uh, if, if I get the sense that they don't want me around them, I stay away. Uh, and I'm using maybe a longer lens, or again, I just take wide shots. But I do need that mid-level shot in order to get what I need for the uh, reception, so, or for the, the album. So going back to the customer service, Lori Newby Photography, I thought was an interesting question. She asked, what other faux pas, such as the demanded meal on the contract, do you see photographers doing that lose professional respect by doing those things? Other faux pas, common faux pas. Yeah, anything, anything around the um, that even smells or, or, or you're right, sniffs of being a diva, uh, to me, those are mistakes you can make. I think if you understand that they're paying you for a job and your job is to perform, uh, this whole concept of like having a rider and and uh, you know any sort of rights that you're deserved, uh, that starts pushing you into this. I don't know, diva mode. And, th and that's not us, man. We try to be as low maintenance as humanly possible because when Taylor and myself got married, we didn't want somebody telling it, making all these demands on us. I'm paying you to perform a service. Can you imagine if you paid your plumber to come in and fix your toilet? And he was like, before I fix your toilet, I demand a hot meal uh, and I'd like to take a shower in your bathroom. I mean, right? You know, it's, it sounds ridiculous uh, because it is. And so we are performing a service. I don't feel like we're deserved anything except that paycheck. 
20 more minutes? Should we keep going? We're going to keep going. All now right. I've got, I think I've got a little treat for you. And so what I'm going to do is show you a setup I have here. You may want to explore this, you may not. So what this is, is this is now off-camera flash. And so what I've got up top here, these are rogue light modifiers. And so what this is, these things are super light, super thin, okay, they bend, okay, they're very easy to use, and they control light. This is my 600, so it's got the radio triggers built into it. So now I'm no longer fumbling with triggers and third-party adapters to get my flashes to fire. The triggers, the radio triggers are built in to these uh, Canon 600 speed lights. So this simply attaches here. This is by Rogue. Super easy, portable, right? Efficient. You know my, my philosophy there. This creates a bigger light source for me now. It's softening up that light as a light modifier. Um, what I've got here, this is a um, nano stand from Manfrotto. And this is model 001B. I can tell you they stopped making that model number. But if you look up Manfrotto nano stands, I think they're about 55, 60 bucks, and they collapse uh, to about 19 inches. So they are very, very portable. Now I've got two of these set up. So what I would do here typically is I would put one in each corner. And what this is going to do is allow me to roam the dance floor. And of course, it's hooked up to a uh, battery pack here. So I don't know if you can see that. Uh, the battery pack is helping recycle this. So I'm going to put this in each corner. Okay, I'm going to put one here. We're going to pivot it towards. Uh, let me bend that down, so just tilt it toward me. Keep coming, keep coming. All right, so we just want to bend that down a little bit. Right, that's what I like about it. We're going to put this in this corner. And what this is now doing is creating an off-camera light source for me. And can I get my 7200, please? Um, I've been using these for the last uh, probably five or six weeks as an alternate light source and I am in love with these things now because it really gives me some diversity. So on camera I've got a uh, speed light transmitter here uh, so I don't have to tie up one of my speed lights and this is uh, the ST uh, E3 RT right so this is their transmitter and it controls those flashes. The beautiful thing is if I want to overpower or underpower these flashes I can control them off my camera so I can go I don't, can, I get a, can I bring my camera up to this guy? Can you see the back of my camera? So the back of my camera here, you can see right there, that is my off-camera flash, and that allows me to control and go plus one, minus one on, ca on the flashes. So I'm able to control my off-camera flash right from here. I don't have to get anybody else involved. And when this becomes important, just go back to dancing. If you want to photograph with a 7200, let me get a test shot here. Okay, if you want to photograph, sorry guys, hang tight for me, with a 7200, your flash would have to work so hard to fire from your distance. Now I can actually be further away and rotate and not have to get in their face. So you guys asked me, would I get that close to my couple? If I'm on camera flash, I have to. If I'm off camera flash, I don't have to. So you guys keep, where well, we're playing music again. I love it. All right. So now I can come all the way back here. Go ahead, guys. Have fun. Dance for me. And I can really crush this background. And give each other a kiss for me. Love it, guys. And so that was being done with all off-camera flash. And if we can bring up image 646 to give you a sense of how we were lighting that with the 7200. And that took me no time at all to set up super light footprint, easy, easy to do. Questions? Yes? Can you show what you did on the back of your camera again? Yeah. So if you come to the back of your camera, I'll bring it over to you. And you hit that little cube info button. Okay. That brings up this entire menuing system. And almost the entire Canon system allows you to adjust flash exposure compensation. And now I can go plus one, minus one, and anywhere in between. Okay. All right? And let's do it for the folks at home. Right. So let's take a step. Just you two looking at me. Let's make this simple. Just put your arms around each other. We'll get super traditional. This is what everybody does on the dance floor. All right? So here we are using the flash at zero. 
Okay, stay there for me. Now I'm going to go and bump this up right from my camera to plus one. You can see it got brighter. Let's be a little bit more ridiculous. Let's go plus three. And I'm taking these shots. And all those, can you show those three frames for me, Mike? All those three frames are going to be up. And you can see the zero plus one plus three. I didn't have to go touch my flashes. I didn't have to do anything. I'm operating real time, looking at the back of my camera, and I'm making those adjustments. Yeah? Are the flashes set at? I'm sorry. They're set at. I don't think I understand. When you say what are they set at? The flashes on the stands, what are they set at? Are they on ETTL? They're all ETTL, yes. Electronic through the lens, right? The, the, the camera's making the adjustments for me based on the metering system in here. What I'm doing is I'm visually adjusting what I see, adding more light as I, as I need. And why is that important? Because what could be happening is they could be sitting over here. Why don't you guys go sit down on, on those chairs for me? Maybe toaster going on. Well, now they're further away. Maybe I need more power than the camera's giving me, right? So let's just say you two are sitting there and, and uh, people are toasting you. Well, now I'm going to sit here with this flash set up. And because I have it set up this way, I don't have to get on top of them, right? Oh, somebody said something funny. Let me get that picture, right? I don't want to come in there, okay? I can now stay here. <laughs> and I can photograph from here, right, and get that. Now, I'm looking at the back of my camera, and I think, wow, you know, maybe that needs a little bit more light. So now I'm going to adjust this and just go maybe plus two-thirds, and now that exposure looks a little bit better. And I did that without ever moving from my spot, and I can truly be here looking to pick off shots as needed. This is my new favorite lighting setup uh, for sure. Super easy to do using my techniques. Yeah. All right, we've got some questions on this from, yes. from the Internet. Uh, so a question from Rachel Z Rachel. Rochelle Ann's photo. Are you controlling the flash from inside the camera menu because of the transmitter, the flash, or the camera body? Which yes, is the yes <laughs> to all. Um, this is a Canon 1DX working with Canon 600s uh, and the transmitter, and that whole system is allowing me to control it from in camera. But the 5D does it, and a bunch of the other uh, flashes do it, talking to each other. Uh, so it absolutely can be done from the I'm not a Nikon guy. But I'm going to guess Nikon can handle that uh, as well. Hey, Tay Tay? Yes. It's right there on the tripod. Oh. Did you just call her Tay Tay? Yeah. That's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question. This might be a loaded question, but this is from uh, Maria Bonita and SCA Photography, who'd like to know how do you, uh, how do you know where you're going to put your lights on the dance floor? Um, I, oh, that is an interesting question. Um, not sure how to answer it. How do I know where I'm going to put my lights? I'm always, remember, I'm looking for that ambient light behind them, so I'm looking for wherever that action is going to occur. It's normally somewhere near the DJ booth. I'm usually putting it. I don't want to have that light in the middle of a dance floor. If I put that light in the middle of a dance floor, somebody is going to knock that over. So it's always going to be in a corner protected by something, and the D, on either side of the DJ booth is probably the best place to put it. So you don't have a, a certain thing about distance. It's just put it in the corner, make sure it's out of everybody's way. And the DJ booth is usually the best place to do that. Yeah, DJ booth is usually the best way to, to pull that off. Okay. So, um, I mean, you know, it's very difficult to say put it out of the way. Uh, it's all relative to whatever venue you're at. So if you're next to the DJ booth, you're usually in a safe place. Okay, so we're not thinking inverse square law. We're just thinking Yeah, we're yeah, you may, don't overcomplicate it, right? Okay. Inverse square, <laughs> light fall off ratios, blah, 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 blah. Oh, it's making me crazy. Okay. Give me a headache already. Okay. <laughs> So that's great because a, a, several people were asking about, aren't you worried? Don't, don't these things get knocked over? They will. If I just leave them sitting the way they are right now, they absolutely would. If you wanted to see a real world scenario, if we were in this room, where would this be? It, it wouldn't be here. In this scenario, I would have this here. So if I put this right here, that's not going to get knocked over because it's buried um, in a corner. And then I would just adjust this accordingly. So that would be fine in a corner like that. So uh, without a doubt, um, I'm being con conscious of what's in the room, and uh, I, I don't want to, like, knock things over, especially these. That's an expensive setup. So, uh, Cup K Photo would like to know, if you were near a wall, would you just reflect off the wall or the ceiling rather than use a modifier? Absolutely, all day long. If I were back here and right behind me was a wall, I absolutely would bounce off this wall into them. That would give amazing light. So, yes, that, that is a great question. When we're reflecting... Okay, I'm reflecting off the ceiling right now because that's all I have. But if I'm in a room, I'll reflect, I'll reflect off a reflector. 
I don't know if any of you have ever done that. I will have an assistant stand behind me, and I know I'm having a hard time painting this picture, but the assistant would stand behind me, not at a reception, by the way, I wouldn't do that, but if we were off doing creatives outside, I'd bounce that flash back behind me and create a bigger light source to light up my subject. Absolutely. Got to get, you got to get uh, your MacGyver on. We talked about that. Yeah. I love that. I just love that line. You got I will reflect off a reflector. Yes. <laughs> so, Sal, we have about 10 minutes before going to break. I got a special treat for everybody. Okay. All if right. you've ever wondered about long exposure, we are going to try and pull this off. Don't focus on the photograph. Can we block this door off again? Don't focus on the photograph itself. Focus on the technique. I'm teaching you a technique that you've probably heard about, read about, seen, uh, but I'm going to show you how easy this is to do. So I'm going to be on a tripod. Put that away. Okay, you've got to put a tripod here for this. And I'm going to get my camera here. And uh, Lynn, uh, Taylor, can I get a 2470 instead? What I'm looking to do, if you've ever seen those strobe lights, right? where you're creating a heart or they're saying I love you. I want to show you how easy it is to get this shot. And so here I'm just gonna, you definitely have to carry a uh, tripod with you. And this particular tripod is super easy to work with. It's very, very light. It's by uh, Obin. Again, this is from B&H. Uh, we travel with this all the time. Okay, and what I'm gonna do is I'm looking to get exposure of about five seconds. Okay, again, don't, this is not beautiful here. I would take them outside at night. We still have light here, so this makes this a little bit more challenging. So here's what I need you two to do. I want you kissing each other and holding still, so come on over here. Taylor, let's demonstrate for him what we're looking for. So what we're going to have you do is I want to make a heart, okay? And so you two are going to be here. You have to hold still for five seconds, kissing each other. And then what you're going to do is from here... Heart, come back. So each of you, you just screwed it up, just I by did. the way. I did. Um, each of you owns half the heart. So you're going to go down, back up. Make me the loop. You with me? Can you pull it off? We just kiss. We kiss, yes. Mm. Okay. What'd you say? Okay, then we're going to fire you as a bride and groom if you can't make it perfect. All right, get in there for me. Now, on the camera, just like the flash technique I taught you, taught you it's just about simplifying the process. So Lynn, get over there. Here's what I have to have happen. I know that I have to have the shutter speed. And, and just for the record, this is, we're going off script a little bit here. Okay, I know I have to have my shutter speed down to about five seconds. So I'm immediately going to go to ISO low. And I'm, gonna, uh, I'm going into aperture priority. And I'm going to probably spin it up to like F11. And by doing that, I immediately see by taking a reading that I'm at about 10 seconds. So let's go down to 6 3. 7 0, we're at uh, 8, 8 0, we're at 4 seconds. All right, well, we got to turn these on. There you go. You want practice? Let's see. Do it. Yeah, you're kissing each other. Okay, hold on. Oh, Chris, you're failing already. Semicircle. Go for it. Make your heart longer. Chris, you're, you're stinking at this. Lynn is kicking your butt. All right, so let's get the shot. Let me show you technique. You guys looking at each other. Hold on here. And all I care about at home is that you get the technique because I've shown pictures like this on my website, and everybody always wonders how we did it. How did we get the bride and groom to be still? Make them kiss. All right, here we go, guys. One, two, go. All right, you are way too slow. Oh, but that's pretty cool. Just show that, guys. Image number 654. Hopefully everybody likes it. I have no idea. So I think it's a pretty cool shot. Um, I'm not going to work that any longer. You get the gist of what I did. Uh, you can work this over and over with your bride and groom. It didn't take me 20 minutes to get the shot set up. It took me 10 seconds to get the shot set up. I'm looking to slow my shutter speed down to between 3 and 5 seconds. And then all I did was give them those little video lights. They could have had sparklers. They could have said, I heart you, a host of things they could do. So this is a painting with light technique. A lot of people don't talk about it, but hopefully I, I simplified it for you because it really is a neat way to end in the album. So questions, we can go to break. Did people like that? They think it sucked. They were like, 
No good, Sal. No, I don't. I, I really don't think that that's There's a little the delay for us. So. Yeah, there is a delay. You went through the <laughs> really fast. I did that fast. It, it, just because I knew we, we didn't have time. It's a little treat. It wasn't part of my initial program, but I wanted to show you guys how to do that because it is a great way to add that creative shot uh, for the end of the album. Okay, so there was a question from only NCSU. How do you do motion blur where the couple is in focus and the people around them are dancing around in semi-blur? Same that, concept. Same thing. Yeah, the couple has to be kissing. You're going to need a tripod. And then instead of the light being what's moving, it's the people moving uh, around them. Let's do it with our group. Let's go right here. Come on, girls. Come on in. Come on in. Pads down. Let's move. <laughs> All right, ring around the rosy. Yeah, come on. Ring around the rosy. No light. You can just hold your light. Hold on. I'm going to have you kiss each other. We've got... Go. Faster. Faster. And we all fall down. Yeah. I don't know what we're doing here, but it's not, it's not photography. The picture's still ta being taken. All right, let's see what we got. You almost went... You, you actually went too fast for it, but that's how you do it. And so hopefully that makes sense. It's the same technique. Uh, my shutter speed was too long. Uh, uh, the exposure was too long. And because of that, they were blurry. So it should probably still be around five seconds. And that's how you'll end up getting the shot. All right, super fun. Quick question. Is there any other time that you're using your tripod during the whole wedding day? No, the tripod is just something I have for shots like this where I want, like, uh, if I'm at a cool venue, I'll go out in the middle of the street set up like a 30 second exposure where cars are going by so all their headlights are streaking. It is this technique that I just showed you, super, super easy to do. And again, it adds so much, uh, so many dynamics to the album that your client will say, I've never seen anything like that before. And that is the motto uh, for our studio. We've got to impress them with some of these things. Okay, I have a very, very important question. This is from Chillbug who asks, if I buy this workshop, Will the Sincatas come back and give us more? Yes, deal. <laughs> I, I think we're already in the works. Uh, so far, you guys, I just got to be honest with you. I'm speaking for myself and Taylor. We have been absolutely humbled uh, by your response. All those notes you're writing on our walls and sending us in private messages, thank you. We love you from the bottom of our heart. Our goal is to help uh, raise the bar for our industry. We love teaching. I hope you get that from us. It's not a bunch of BS. We are passionate about this. So, yes, I promise. Uh, I will be back for sure. And when I come back, I want to hear about all the extra money you're making from implementing this course. Awesome. We, li we like to hear that. As CL Russ says, that's what I like to hear. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what some of the folks are saying um, in, their, in their thanks to you. And you can give your own thanks to uh, Sal and Taylor on our Facebook page. Jamie Hudson says, thanks, guys. You were really laying it all down. We really appreciate it. This stuff just isn't out there. Every second with you this week is golden. Thank awesome. you. I don't know if people know that Taylor's maiden name is golden. So yes. That's very apropos. Nikki Hastings says, <laughs> this is perfect timing with my third wedding this weekend. You guys are great. Thanks all the way from Tasmania. This Damn. is the beauty of Creative Live. We're educating Nikki Hastings, who is shooting her third wedding in Tasmania. I want to go to Tasmania. Can I second shoot for her? I bet she would say yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Susanna Vasquez says, half fill, says, just love, love, love ya. Steady hustling this week to scrounge up the capital to implement the Sal Sincata system by Bridal Show System. So working ho hard in order to be able to get this class. So awesome. Yes, awesome. Well, it's good to hear that you're coming back. And I, I feel like everyone needs to just take a moment to ask yourself, what is your biggest objection to being a success? Because honestly, if your objections are that you don't know how to shoot a wedding or that you don't know how to start a wedding business, those need to be crossed off your list after this workshop because that has been answered for you, right, there, Sal? There's absolutely no excuse. I, again, I took pride, Taylor took pride in making sure that we put this course together so that you could sit there, watch it once, watch it twice, or any area you're weak in and watch that segment over and over again uh, so that you can, whether it's flash photography or the business plan or anything like that, and it is truly a turnkey operation, so uh, there is absolutely no excuse. It is, and I'll just list off what all is included in this yes. workshop, just so everyone has a clear uh, understanding. You know what's included? The timeline. The <laughs> timeline. It's, it's on here. <laughs> Album selection worksheets, pricing guides, engagement order forms, engagement pricing sheets, post-wedding order forms, post-wedding pricing, business blueprint, timeline worksheets, wedding prep checklist, and all of Sal's keynotes for each day. 
This is a no-brainer. Purchase the course now while we're at break. It's $149. And we'll see you guys back here in 15, 20, 15 minutes. Welcome back from break, everyone. We are going to finish up day four here with Sal and Taylor Sincata's wedding boot camp. Um, we are going to give away a prize before we do that. The last prize for the day is a behind the shutter wedding kit. Sal, Sincata, will you talk a little bit about the behind the shutter wedding kit? Yeah, the wedding kit has, uh, we sold this when we were on tour. This has all our business forms, um, presets. So the Lightroom presets are in there, our textures are in there. Uh, our, our wedding album templates are in there, our engagement album templates are in there, our contracts, our pricing, and then a two-hour DVD of uh, pricing and packaging walkthrough of how to set your prices up. So this is all-inclusive. You get it on a thumb drive. And oh, so uh, awesome. whoever gets it's going to be love and life. Does the thumb drive say so on it? It is. It's branded. Of course, of course it, is. it is. You should know better. I do. I did. I did. <laughs> okay. And the winner, that's a $500 value, everyone, and the winner is Del Rose. Del Rose on Twitter is D. Lawrence Photo. And the quote was, you've got to focus on what matters and what sells. So, awesome quote. Thank you very much to Del, and thank you guys for the Behind the Shutter wedding kit. Yes, awesome. All right, and Sal, I just wanted to read off this message that you got personally um, on Facebook, because this really encapsulates what Creative Live is doing and why we are here. And it's so this is from Omar Mena, and Omar says, I almost closed my studio last week. I love what I do, but I just didn't think I had the sand to make it happen anymore. This course on Creative Live has changed everything for me. Not only will I stay strong, I will fly out, oh wait, sorry, I will stay strong and be the biggest studio in El Paso. I will fly out and make you and Taylor a genuine Mexican dinner funded by the new studio blueprint. From the bottom of my heart, thank you, Omar. And kudos to you, Omar. I, I mean, we all go through those times where we think we're gonna have to shut down and then get yeah. inspired Omar, again. Omar, man, you know, uh, God bless you, brother. Go get him, uh, put this stuff into practice, and that's what it's all about. So thank you for your message. That gives me, you know, the chills when yes. I read stuff like that. We were all reading that together and, uh, you know, that's why I do what I do, and I'm glad, you know, it drives me nuts you know, when people get all this information and they don't put it into practice. It's like, dude, this is what I'm teaching you for. I'm laying it all out, put it into practice, and I'm telling you it'll change your life. That's the key. You gotta use it. If you That's don't right. use it, you can't change your life. That's right, so. Well, let's, um, Thank you, Omar, I'm back over to you. Yeah, let's see, I wanna take a couple of questions, because I know we went to break, and I'm, I'm still loading in some images here. Um, so let's, uh, let's take a, a couple of questions. Okay. Um, I have a question here from Deb696, who says, Sal and Taylor talk about being innovative and introducing new ideas. Where do they get their inspiration? I love this workshop, Just Learning Photography, and this is from Debbie from PEI Canada. Debbie, I love the way you're thinking right now. That is an amazing question. Where do we get our inspiration from? Magazines, uh, television, and Hollywood. Uh, those are big influencers on me and that's where I'm constantly looking for some of my post-production techniques um, I'm looking for lighting techniques and uh, just ideas and concepts look at music videos uh, even though music videos are dying uh, seem to be dying today the ones that are out there are very very um, eclectic innovative things like that and that's what I use for my inspiration constantly 
looking for inspiration. But I can tell you who I don't typically look to for inspiration, other photographers. Uh, nothing against them, there's a lot of great artists there, but I'm looking to put my own spin uh, on my work versus copying somebody. Copying somebody doesn't in enhance your abilities as an artist. Uh, I think it stagnates it. So definitely look to different medium genres and, and you'll, that's where I get my inspiration from. Great question. Well, from inspirational to practical, a couple of people have asked this. Where do you and Taylor put your bags in case of theft during events? Yeah, well, first and foremost, we have insurance uh, on all our equipment. I think we covered that in day, on day one or the beginning of day two. We definitely have to have insurance. Uh, that's what, Our bag is never out of our sight. And so we will typically put our bag right by the DJ's booth. Um, and because I've talked to the G DJ and introduced myself, he's uh, very happy to just keep an eye on it. He's not watching my gear by any stretch of the imagination or in a, co a corner away from everything. So we will always have eyes on our bags. Very good question. Protect your gear and assume the worst because uh, everyone has a digital SLR, it seems like, these days. And I'm sure they'd love to get their sticky fingers on uh, <laughs> one of our $2,000 lenses. Okay, I have a question here from JJW and a guest in the chat room who both want to know, uh, what do you do when you have guest photographers that have pro DSLRs and, and they're using flash that's getting in the way of your shots when you're not using flash? How do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, the, the bottom line is their flash can't fire as quickly as your camera's firing. So, you know, as, as a photography group, we've got to stop worrying about what everybody else is doing around us. I, do, I spend very little time focused on any energy on what guests are doing, people with other cameras are doing. Look, I'm rocking a, a 1DX. I've got top of the line equipment. The last thing I need to be worrying about is what a guest is doing. Work around the guest. And so if your guest is stepping in front of you, I feel like that's on you, right? We've got to be a little more assertive. Now, you don't have to go crazy and, and, be, right, and start trying to dictate the entire event, but make yourself known, make yourself aware move around the dance floor, I'm not really big on being a fly on a wall. And so because I'm not trying to be a fly on a wall, the group knows, here's the photographer, he's in control. So uh, stop worrying about what everybody else is doing, man. Just let it go. Don't worry about, I think we were talking about this, Susan, on a break or something, where, you know, what do you do if you've got uh, people trying to take pictures over your shoulders or they're using, who cares, man? Let it go. Uh, worry about yourself, worry about your stuff, and make your photograph. And that's all you got to worry about. Screw everybody else. <laughs> Did you have a question about the, so for folks who may have missed this earlier, the SEMA video lights? Yes. Um, did you show us how to use them on the camera? Mm. I didn't. I failed them. I let them down. Yes. Okay. I apologize. Uh, we were thing. moving so quickly, we didn't do it. I know. I know. Um, it's the same concept, right? I mean, you're just putting it in the hot shoe on the camera. Uh, that's all it is. It's got a hot shoe adapter. You put it on the hot shoe and you walk around with it on your camera. Now that thing's not going to throw across the room. You do have to get relatively close with it. So just keep that in mind. But that is definitely another option. Uh, the reason I didn't really get to it is because this room has so much light in it. Yeah. Uh, there's no real uh, practical use for it. So I apologize for that. But just get, pick up that light and start experimenting with it. And what I love most about it is what you see is what you get. And we did do it for the engagement shoot, by the way. Mm -hmm. So for the engagement shoot, we did right. show, showcase that, that light in Thank use. Thank you. Okay, I have a question from Julia Wonderful Life, who says, are there any shots that new photographers should avoid? Any tacky shots that newbies tend to go for that experienced photographers are sick of? Uh, oh boy, I'm gonna get myself in trouble here. Uh, so the jumping shot, stop making people jump. We don't wanna jump. I am a man, I'm telling you, I don't wanna jump. Uh, if you have groomsmen who wanna jump, let them jump, that's fine, on their own. Uh, something else we've got to be aware of that I see newbies make, it's not necessarily a uh, shot or a pose per se, it's just a, a concept, if you will. Look, we all look at these magazines and our brides want these shots. What you've got to stop trying to do is make a, let's say, a plus size model, put her in a pose that a size zero or negative one model right, is in, right? You can't take a plus size bride and try and make her do things that are just not within her body type. And I see newbie photographers make this mistake all the time. You don't want to make a plus size bride sit on the ground, okay? She is gonna, she's not gonna look good. And I know that looks good because when, when I see these engagement pictures and people are laying in the park on a picnic and they're drinking wine and it's like this stylized engagement shoot, yeah, that looks great. But a plus size bride is not gonna be able to do that. So the biggest mistake I see photographers make when it comes to posing is not reading your client's body type. You've got to read your client's body type. 
and get to know them and pose them in a way that's comfortable. And if you want to, and the next question should logically be, how do you know when they're comfortable? Look at their face. They will tell you through their body language if they're comfortable or not. So keep that in mind. All right. Well, let's get going here. Uh, this segment's going to be somewhat short and sweet because this is the same day slideshow. And uh, if we can cut to the screen, this is the shot we were trying to produce uh, with our bride and groom. Don't focus on the background. Don't focus on anything else. Focus on the concept, right? We're in a spot where I wouldn't normally do this. I'd probably take them outside and do something like that. Uh, on the surface, here's our settings. It was at 3.2 um, seconds, F8, ISO 50. My goal here is to do whatever I have to do, right? And when we were sitting there the other night, girls, and we were qu I was quizzing you on your ISO, right, your shutter speed and your aperture, this is why. I knew exactly what I needed to do to get my shutter, my uh, exposure to about three to five seconds. And so that's what you need in order to get an exposure like this. Now, if I were doing it with my couple in, in, in a real world, I'd probably take five of these to get the right one. Because remember, they were doing it, but it was a little awkward. They didn't know what they were supposed to do. So I would take one shot. I would show the couple in the back of the camera so that they could do it again, right? So it's almost like there was a practice run. And you'll get one that is just perfect. And let's take this a step further. Imagine if you have the bride and groom kissing, they're making a heart. You have the maid of honor with one light just doing I, heart, and then the groom, uh, the best man is doing a you. And so not, that could be on their thank you cards. That could be the last spread in their album. And we do this all the time with our clients. It's a very unique thing to do. And girls, I'm curious, did you think this was complicated to pull off? No, everybody's shaking their head no, right? We did this immediately. Uh, between using off-camera lighting, on, you know, off-camera flash, on-camera flash, switching to the video lights. And so because if you, if you implement this, the technique I'm showing you, we can move from lighting technique to lighting technique without losing a whole bunch of time. So with that being said, what we've done here is we've loaded up all the small JPEGs. So remember, we're going to do a same-day slideshow of the uh, at the event now I'm not going to produce an actual slideshow for you I'm not going to bore you watching me for 30 minutes just select pictures but I get asked all the time how do we do the same day slideshow how do we move quickly what's the process what's the workflow well now I'm going to give it to you we shoot raw plus JPEG small JPEG files are going to be about 900 K to 1.1 meg somewhere in that range one memory card has all raw files Another memory card has all small JPEG, okay? If you're shooting a 5D, that's okay. You can still shoot small, uh, raw plus JPEG, except all those JPEGs are going to be on a multitude of cards. That's why I use one camera. Even though I have a multitude of uh, camera backups, I just want to grab one memory card when I get to the venue just with the small JPEGs and download them. So all I'm doing is downloading here all the small JPEGs. So that's what you're seeing here. So as soon as we get to the reception, during cocktail hour, I'm going to roll in, copy all those small JPEGs over, and while they're copying over, I may start taking detail shots in the room. There's no sense. I don't need to stand here, right, and watch water boil. Just let the images copy over, go shoot the room, go shoot details. As soon as they get imported, come back here, and what I'm doing, I'm only taking them off my camera, not even my second shooter's cameras, the camera. And what I'm doing here is now once they're all imported, I'm in, I go into develop mode, Okay, I'm using my presets because they are super efficient for this stuff. And so what I'm looking to do is I'm just using a simple yes-no system. P for pick, that's it. So I'm flipping through here, right? That is not an image we want to show. Uh, I'm flipping through here, looking for images really quickly because I want to tell the story of the day. So I'm going to hit P for pick, and I'm developing as I go. I don't want to come back in here. And remember, these are small JPEGs. I don't want to come back in here, pick all the images, then come back and edit them. So I'm trying to get it done as quickly as possible. Put in a little vignette. I might convert this to uh, an HDR black and white. Okay? And that's the way I'm going to make that look. I like the way that looks. That's all just from my presets. Next, next. So I want to tell the story of the day. And so I like that one, but I'm not going to pick it. This is one of the pictures I, picked, I took yesterday. Right? I'm going to pick that one and I'm going to edit that HDR black and white. That's one of my favorite presets. Okay? And this is what I'm looking to show at the slideshow. And I'm just going to keep flying through here. 
Okay, now I've got one just isolated of the ring, right? So I'm going to pick that. I'm going to crop it, right? So I will crop as well while this is going on. So I'll let you guys just kind of watch a little bit. And I really want to do some cool stuff here. And so again, I might go to just an HDR look, uh, give this a little vignette, right? And that might be it. Let's see what it looks like. I don't want to do black and white again. Ooh, I like that one. That's an old color uh, preset. So now I'm going to keep going here. You know, here's that picture Taylor took. And I knew when she took it, I wouldn't show this in the slideshow, but I knew when she took it, I was really seeing this, right, as a black, black and white or a heavy contrast uh, black and white. And so, you know, I'd have to mess with that to get it to look right. And remember, I am editing small JPEGs. So the edit will look different on a small JPEG than it will on a raw file, uh, for sure. Now we're back to, right, Chris getting ready here. Right, maybe I pick that. Throw a little vignette on that. And I'm keeping going, right? I'm going to fly through this stuff. And I'm looking for as much detail as I can. I want to slap an edit on it. And I'm, you're hit CMP for pick. Show me details. Right, there's her bridesmaids. Love that. And I'll flip between different presets to see what I'm liking. I want to give everything a little bit of a polish where I can. Okay, hands. All right, that's a fun shot. And these are the details that tell the story of the day. And this is, man, you will not believe how people feel when they're seeing images real time. And I'm going very quickly, so I apologize if you're not able to see everything at home, but I'm looking for details that just tell the story of the day. And I am a big fan of black and white. Okay, and uh, talk to me while I'm doing this. Ladies, what do you think? Have, have any of you ever done a same day slideshow? Are I've done it, but not so this level. <laughs> just, I just do the iPad. Yeah, I don't like doing it through the iPad. I want to hijack the event and start doing this. And let's talk for a second about what I'm doing when I display this. I'm building this on my laptop. I have a 60-inch projector uh, or screen, and the screen is from Epson. It's about $199. It's not very expensive. Uh, it's, and then I have a, um, an Epson projector very portable. We can take it with us even when we're on destination events. We've had this stuff with us. We put it out in front of the DJ booth. Two chair, we bring two chairs out onto the dance floor. We then get champagne for the bride and groom. The DJ gets on the mic and he announces, hey everybody, we're going to show a slideshow of pictures from today that our photographers uh, put together. Please feel free to gather around uh, and pull a chair up. And we'll have a hundred people out on the dance floor watching a slideshow of pictures that we took that day. You had a question, Kenna. My question would, was, um, I'm wondering if as you go through this, you have, you're, you're picking what you know you want, or if you're going to do a second run through. No, I'm picking what I know I'm going to use, because I don't have that kind of time. Right. I get through this in 20 right. minutes. And how many are you going for? Again? I'm tipping, oh, I'm aiming for about uh, 100 to 110 images, oh, okay. but I'm, you know, at this point, I'm, because we were doing this from a workshop perspective, right. I only have 600 images here. Right. By the time I normally get to this part of the day, I'm looking at about 1,200 to 1,800 images on my camera. Not only do I cull through all of them, and they're all edited in 20 minutes. That's how quickly I'm making decisions. I'm not going to sit here and obsess about where she had a better smile, about what, what the perfect composition was. I want to tell the story. There's no guest at that event that is going to be neurotic about these images. You know who's neurotic? We're neurotic because we're photographers. But I want to get, it's better to be fast and right. get something out there in 20 minutes than worry about all those subtleties. We'll figure those subtleties out when they get their final images. Yeah, Darlene. Now, I, I'm in between doing, being a PC and a Mac. Yeah. So I, you have to excuse me with this question. Yeah, I'm really sorry you're on a PC. I'm sorry I know, to hear that. I know. <laughs> but I'm in that transition period where I'm feeling like I need to make that transition. But I was curious on when you load them to your laptop, are they staying there or are you loading them again after the wedding? Help me understand if I do make that jump, are you loading I'm them loading. to your laptop and are they staying there and then you're taking them to the hard drive or are you moving them from your laptop to the hard drive for backup purposes? No, you got to understand all I'm moving are small JPEGs. Okay. 
the original raw files are on the, gotcha. uh, the original memory cards. These files, when I'm done, delete. Delete. That's it. They're gone. They're useless. They're small JPEGs. They are being produced for one reason, one reason only, the slideshow. Okay. After that, they are completely discarded. I could care less. Okay. Um, does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. So I think you just answered Adrian Farr's question from England, which is the images that you edit and show in the slideshow, you, do, you keep the same edits for the final product? No. Nope. Okay. It, it won't happen that way because the reason it won't happen that way is because it's, these are small JPEGs. So they'll never look the same no matter what I do. So I'm just willing to let that go. Uh, it's just something you got to let go of. This is for entertainment purposes only, you know, when, when I'm showing my clients. And that's my main goal. And it's for social media, by the way. Because these are now edited and produced, I can get home, and you guys can all see it if you follow me on Facebook. Make sure you're following us on Facebook. If I'm shooting a wedding on Saturday, by Sunday, there's 10 or 15 images posted from my blog. Do you know where those images came from? These JPEGs. I already selected my favorite 100. So now I can take those same images, produce a slideshow, and upload these to uh, Facebook, to my blog, that quickly. So that we are really, think about it, my bride's now down at the beach on her honeymoon, and she's watching, she's on my blog and watching it on her phone, watching the slideshow on her phone. Who else is doing that? And that's very, very powerful from a referral perspective. So now think about it. Everybody in her wedding is seeing, seeing some sort of imagery from her the next day. Let's pause here for a second. You might think that's not that important. Well, that is important because we talked to everybody's asking me questions like, what do you do with those guests who are leaning in and taking pictures with their iPhones? Guys, those guests who are taking pictures with their iPhones are posting them to Facebook. They're beating you to the punch. And so what I'm doing is I'm going, uh-uh, I'm going to beat you because by that night or the next morning, I've got all these pictures edited and posted, which look 10 times better than what came off anybody's iPhone. Does that make sense? And hit me with questions. I'm going to keep going and just trying to select through these. Well, I just want to say you, you had some, something really interesting go through my mind when you talked about the slideshow because I think photo as photographers, we're trying, we think of making a technical impact, but we're making an emotional, this is for emotional impact. Right. The technical stuff does not matter as much it, it as really, getting it there as quickly as you can. Yeah, it really doesn't, right? Uh, there's, there's no substitute for speed, you know, and I'm going back. That, that's the problem. I, I was a college athlete. And the one thing that uh, our, our, we were being hit over the head with continuously, speed, speed, speed. And I've brought that into my business. So I'm not, I'm not encouraging being sloppy. I'm not encouraging doing things the, the wrong way. But th the main goal of this is impact. And you know what's gonna, what makes that impact? Speed. So I just got the 10-minute cue, and I'm going to fly. So let me fly here and put my money where my mouth is. Okay, and just grab a few more here. This is how quickly I'm going through. Oh, I remember this shot. I thought that was cool. And I think I said at the time, I felt like this was going to make a great black and white. And when you know it, it does. And so what I want to do here is maybe give this a little bit more of a pano uh, crop. And you would be amazed. I kind of like that. We get the cross action there. You get it? The, the front, okay. <laughs> All right, so stuff like that. All right, now we're looking for just subtleties of the groom getting ready, and sometimes I'm editing them. Sometimes I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm putting uh, just simple color wash on them, right, things like that. And, I'm, and I don't want to put pictures where the groom looks bad. Like, look, Lynn, right, he's making a, he's making a funny face there. What, don't put that up on the slideshow, right? Think about your couple. Use common sense. Uh, especially if they're doing goofy things, they're trusting you to make them look good. Right? I will show the best man, uh, things like that. He's part of the event. And I want to make sure everything has a little bit of an edit. So let's get here to, we did some of the, uh, right, let's do this. And something like this, you know, I might come in, drop the saturation, and are we showing just the, the screen? Okay. I want to make sure everybody's seeing me because I know I'm moving quick through some of these, right? And I might just really give this a silhouette, uh, silhouetted look, um, right? Just for drama, right? And I'm making artistic decisions here. Make no mistake, this matters, right? Now this is where we were in at the church. So I might take a shot like this, rotate it. Somewhere, rotate left, okay? 
And then this is one that I want, I definitely want like an HDR uh, style edit on. And I'm seeing this, you know, you'd be surprised, man. People look at stuff like that and you'll see, they'll, I'll hear them whispering. They're like, where was that? And they're like, oh, that was the ceiling. And they love that. Guess where I'm gonna wanna use this, by the way, guys? Background in the album, right? So rather than putting um, the background in the album, uh, a black background, something like that, I'll fade this and just lay some images over it, okay? Just to add a little bit more drama. Remember, these are pieces that were part of their day. And I, for the sake of time, I'm going to cut through this. But I will show you one. Let me show you this. Let's get to the picture where the bride is coming down. Right? So here's that big picture. This would make it to the slideshow. Okay, so something like this would absolutely make it to the slideshow. Okay, I'd probably narrow this down and crop, make it a little more dramatic, right? Give it that pano feel. All right, so that might be something I would show if she were in the church coming down. And, of course, we'd see all the pews, everything lined up, adding a lot of drama to that shot. All right, if we go back to grid mode here, right, we would showcase one where maybe she was walking by and her dad's right next to her. We would showcase that. And then, of course, the, the shot that we would end with, and I know you guys didn't see some of these shots, these are the shots we were taking. And, yes, the, best, the, the groomsmen heads are cut off because this, they're, they're there for eye candy. All right, so I might cut in here. Right? I like the way that shot looks just like that. Right? But if I want to go and develop this, right, I can give it a little HDR look. I hope you, I don't know if you guys are liking that. I love that look, that gritty nature of that shot. Right? So you guys saw what that looked like. That was not an exciting spot we were photographing. But I'm sorry, I like that as a shot of my, of my groom. You may la not like it. I'm okay if you don't like it. My clients like it. This is very indicative of my style of shooting. I felt like we made, right, we took lemons and made some lemonade in a situation like that. So let me get back through here. And hit me with questions as I'm going through this, especially when it comes to um, so, the slideshow. So Cook Esquire asks, are you avoiding photos that you want to sell in the large prints or the album, the, like, say the signature? Yeah, yeah, that is a good question. You would think strategically I would probably do something like that, uh, but I won't. Um, I actually want to get them excited uh, about some of these images. So I might end the slideshow with an image like this. And this is from outside the part. This was for outside, so we are, I guess we're avoiding showing the audience because they're going to have to see how we did this in my eight-minute drill. But this was off-camera flash. Um, this is no editing whatsoever. And so I might right, do something like this to it, or uh, more than likely we'll do this, bring back a little color. Now that's just for, right, that's just for our purposes here. But I can tell you right now in post-production, uh, when I get this in, I'm going to show them this version at the uh, event, and they may like it, they may hate it, um, but remember, I had eight minutes to knock this off, but I can tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to remove those sneakers. We don't want sneakers uh, hanging in the background. I, I don't think that's exciting, but I do like the HDR look we got, and I'm going to remove right, this telephone wire from across the scene. It's very distracting. And so this image will get worked uh, for sure, but I'm going to end on a, uh, what I would call a dramatic shot because I want to get them excited uh, you know, for, to come in and see their pictures. I'm not going to end on a table setting uh, or anything like that. So I hope that makes sense. What I would do now is, um, let's make sure his eyes are open. What I would do now is I would get my slideshow ready. So let me just do something here. Let's see, I'm gonna go to black and white, cool. All right, so I would show something like this. Maybe I end with this, and what I would do, remember, I would give my client a mix of urban and a mix of park, and this has been predetermined with my client. So some of you out there might be looking and going, oh my God, are they on a graffiti wall? Well, yeah, some of my clients love that urban grittiness. They love the contrast, the juxtapose, if you will, between this urban gritty landscape and this beautiful bride and groom. But that's your style. Don't worry about what my style is. Understand the concepts I'm teaching you. 
give them diversity. So my clients like urban, which could be a brick wall. It doesn't have to be graffiti. Trust me, I was completely limited with what options I had outside the building. Um, or it could be park-like setting. We're going to give them options. What I'm then going to do is go back into grid mode within Lightroom, and I'm going to filter right, by what images that I have picked. Okay, once I get now here, there's only 22 images. Once I get there, within Lightroom, I hit Command A to select all. I go to Slideshow, and Lightroom has a built-in slideshow. And what's going to happen now is we're going to use its own slideshow module. We're going to scroll down here, and you can add an identity plate. Okay, so what we want, let's see here, sorry, we want an intro screen, and we want to change this. Right? We want it to say Chris and Lynn. Lynn, is it L-I-N? L-I-N-H. Definitely make sure you spell your bride and groom's name right. Um, and then I can hit OK. And not only that, I can actually scale this to be as big as I want. This is all within Lightroom. Okay? I can add an ending identity plate, an ending screen. And your ending screen should actually be your logo. And you can actually add, I don't know if you can see here, use graphical identity plate. So I can select this, and I don't have my logo on this machine, but select my logo. So it should be your logo uh, as the ending screen. And that's how that slideshow uh, will end. Now, you will come here. These are my settings. Pay attention to these. Slide duration. Slides four seconds, fades two seconds. And if I hit play, this will start building this slideshow and getting it ready. And then this bad boy is ready to go for all our guests at the wedding, get them on the dance floor, get everybody excited. Uh, and you can see quickly just a handful of these start playing through and it, people go crazy. And all we need now is some Buble, Sinatra, uh, and really telling the story of their day. And you will find that guests are blown away. They cannot process how you took these pictures, and now, an hour after you got to the reception, you're playing them. So, yes? Do you ever want to beat your head up against a wall on a DJ that picks incredibly horrible music or songs that don't listen to what you said? And yes, <laughs> yes. And what you want to do is um, do, you can either you can bring your iPod and create your own playlist to use, but you want to talk to the DJ. So remember when we got there and I said part of what we want to do is get to the DJ and talk to him. Well, one of the things we talked to him about is Buble Sinatra. We don't want the DJ playing Love and Marriage, Who Let the Dogs Out, <laughs> or any of those other ridiculous songs. It's got to match the tempo. So the other thing you can do is get an iPod Nano, put your own playlist in there, and he'll just hook it up and play it for you. So yeah. Ladies, how are we doing? That's the slideshow. Easy, painless, fast, efficient. I go through 12 to 1500 images using my presets and I get them fully edited. You saw how easy it is in less than 20, 25 minutes tops. Incredible. I'm speechless. We're absolutely speechless. Let's do it. Game on, man. Make a dent. Susan, make a dent. You're going to shoot weddings. I want you doing slideshows, girl. <laughs> it's really wow. impressive. Are you guys doing this, these right now? I just do it with an iPad. It's incredibly right. intimidating. It's incredibly intimidating. Yeah. But how do you feel now that you've seen this? That you've seen I want to do this now. <laughs> I pr I'm, look, I'm going to promise you one thing. If it's one thing I guarantee, because I've had people train with us and we show them how to do this, and they see the impact it has on the guests. Here's what you got to think about with the slideshow. If you, anybody out there, if you're having reservations about doing this and you think, no, my clients wouldn't want it, think about this. You have a captive audience. You have 250 people, 150 people watching your imagery. Not only are they seeing your imagery, they're seeing the impact your imagery had on your bride and groom. That is money. That, when that starts happening, that is unbelievable. That will change your business, I promise you. I will say that I, the, when, one wedding I've been to where there was a slideshow, it was the second most emotional moment of the entire wedding after the, them kissing or saying their vows. Yeah, we've, we've gotten, I Huge mean, impact. standing ovations, hugs, brides crying, moms crying. And now they, they can't wait to come to our studio two weeks later 
to see all these images. So it just, it just builds the momentum, builds the anticipation. And to me, this is an amazing customer service piece. My clients absolutely love that we do this. And I gotta be honest, for the life of me, I have no idea. We've been doing this for three and a half years, this slideshow. My competitors in St. Louis still don't do it, and I cannot process why. Yes, it's a little bit of extra work. It's a little intimidating, but I promise you, it will change your business. So cool. Well, there are, we have a lot of questions about this, but I think that we will save them till tomorrow. I know. We're running out of time. We, we have run out of time, but tomorrow, tell us what we're doing tomorrow, and maybe that can help them understand why they can ask their questions. Yeah, tomorrow, tomorrow, I think we bring everything together, right? It's, again, this course was built to be a blueprint for your business. So to me, if you're serious about being a wedding photographer, this is it. I don't know what else you could ask for in being a wedding photographer. I'm giving you everything I got. Tomorrow is the day it all comes together. We sit down. We're going to go through post-production of these images. We're going to talk about what Taylor and I do next before the client comes in. What happens next when we get home? Well, how are we handling social media? We're going to talk about search engine optimization tomorrow. I'm going to show you a little bit more post-production. On the engagement side, I didn't get to do too much post-production. Tomorrow, I'm going to show you a little bit more of my editing techniques using different tools. We're going to do a post-wedding sale and then some album designs as well because we are known for albums. So how do we design and use our albums? So tomorrow, game time. Full package, I wasn't, I wasn't going easy on you Full on the package. last day. Yeah, you're leaving with your head spinning tomorrow. <laughs> All right, everyone. We are going to give a couple shout-outs before we close for the day. Thank you so much to Soto Park. This is the amazing building that we're in right now, and they've given us an incredible deal to be here. We just want to really thank them. If you have a moment, please go to their Twitter page or their Facebook page and thank them for thank them for us. That would be awesome. And then another shout out to our decorator, Kaleo Kenzer. Thank Kaleo you. Rocket, man. Kaleo's Kaleo awesome. He made magic in here. He does. He makes magic. So thank you to both of you guys. All right, so folks, you said it on the first day, and we'll say it again. This will work. There are no excuses. Don't don't tell Sal that it's not going to work. Yeah, you don't want to have a conversation with me telling me why it won't work. Yeah. <laughs> so again, tomorrow's the day. Uh, t it's $149 to purchase and invest in your business for the rest of your life. This is it's just our heads are spinning. We're nodding our heads. Go purchase the class, and we will see you tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific time. So have a great night and enjoy the rewatch as well. See you then.